Arch of Triumph. Eric Maria Remark. Copyright Copyright 1945 by Eric Maria Remark. 1. The woman veered toward Ravik. She walked quickly, but with a peculiar stagger. Ravik first noticed her when she was almost beside him. He saw a pale face, high cheekbones and wide-set eyes. The face was rigid and mask-like, it looked hollowed out, and her eyes in the light from the street lamps had an expression of such glassy emptiness that they caught his attention. The woman passed so close she almost touched him. He reached out and seized her arm with one hand, the next moment she tottered and would have fallen, if he had not supported her. He held her arm tight. Where are you going? He asked after a moment. The woman stared at him. Let me go. She whispered. Ravik did not answer. He still held her arm tight. Let me go. The woman barely moved her lips. Ravik had the impression that she did not see him at all. She was looking through him, somewhere into the empty night. He was only something that had stopped her and toward which she spoke. Let me go. Ravik saw at once she was no whore. Neither was she drunk. He did not hold her arm so tight now. She could have freed herself easily, but it did not occur to her. Ravik waited a while. Where can you really want to go at night, alone at this time in Paris? He quietly asked once more and released her arm. The woman remained silent. But she did not walk on. Once stopped, she seemed unable to move again. Ravik leaned against the railing of the bridge. He could feel the damp porous stone under his hands. Perhaps down there? He motioned with his head backward and down at the Seine, which moved restlessly toward the shadows of the Pont de Luma in a grey and gradually fading glimmer. The woman did not answer. Too early, Ravik said. Too early and much too cold in November. He took out a package of cigarettes and fumbled in his pockets for matches. He saw there were only two left in the little box and he bent down cautiously in order to shelter the flame with his hands against the soft breeze from the river. Give me a cigarette, too, the woman said in an almost toneless voice. Ravik straightened up and held the package toward her. Algerian. Black tobacco of the Foreign Legion. Probably it's too strong for you. I have nothing else with me. The woman shook her head and took a cigarette. Ravik held the burning match for her. She smoked hastily, inhaling deeply. Ravik threw the match over the railing. It fell through the dark like a little shooting star and went out only when it reached the water. A taxi drove slowly across the bridge. The driver stopped. He looked toward them and waited for a moment, then he stepped on the accelerator and drove along the wet dark gleaming Avenue George V. Ravik felt suddenly tired. He had been working all day and had not been able to sleep. And so he had gone out again to drink. But now, unexpectedly, in the wet coolness of the late night, tiredness fell over him like a sack. He looked at the woman. What had made him stop her? Something was wrong with her, that much was clear. But what did it matter to him? He had already seen plenty of women with whom something was wrong particularly at night, particularly in Paris, and it made no difference to him now and all he wanted was a few hours sleep. Go home, he said. What are you doing on the streets at this hour? You'll only get into trouble. He turned up the collar of his coat and was about to walk away. The woman looked at him as though she did not understand. Home? She repeated. Ravik shrugged his shoulders. Home? back to your apartment, to your hotel, call it what you like, somewhere. You don't want to be picked up by the police. To the hotel. My God. The woman said. Ravik paused. Once more someone who does not know where to go, he thought. He could have foreseen it. It was always the same. At night they did not know where to go and the next morning they were gone before you were awake. Then they knew where to go. The old cheap desperation that came with the dark and left with it. He threw his cigarette away. As if he himself did not know it and know it to the point of weariness. Come, let's go somewhere and have a drink, he said. 
it was the simplest solution. Afterwards he could pay and leave and she could decide what to do. The woman made an uncertain movement and stumbled. Ravik caught hold of her arm. Tired? he asked. I don't know. I guess so. Too tired to sleep? She nodded. That can happen. Come along, I'll hold on to you. They walked up the avenue Marceau. Ravik felt the woman leaning on him. She did not lean as if she were tired, she leaned as if she were about to fall and had to support herself. They crossed the avenue Pierre Eard Serbi. Behind the intersection of the Rue de Chalet the street opened up and, floating and dark in the distance, the mass of the Arc de Triomphe emerged out of the rainy sky. Ravik pointed to the narrow lighted entrance of a cellar drinking place. In here, we'll still be able to get something. It was a bistro frequented by drivers. A few cab drivers and two whores were sitting inside. The drivers were playing cards. The whores were drinking absinthe. With a quick glance they took stock of the woman. Then they turned indifferently away. The older one yawned audibly, the other began lackadaisically making up her face. In the background a busboy, with the face of a weary rat, sprinkled sawdust around and began to sweep the floor. Ravik and the woman sat down at a table near the entrance. It was more convenient, he could then leave more easily. He did not remove his coat. What do you want to drink? he asked. I don't know. Anything at all. Two Calvados, Ravik said to the waiter, who was in vest and rolled up shirt sleeves, and a package of Chesterfields. Haven't any, the waiter announced. Only French. Well then, a pack of Lauren's green. We don't have green neither. Only blue. Ravik looked at the waiter's arm, on which was tattooed a naked woman walking on clouds. The waiter, following his glance, clenched his fist and made his muscles jump. The woman on the clouds wiggled her belly lasciviously. All right, Blue, Ravik said. The waiter grinned. Maybe we still have one green left. He shuffled off. Ravik's eyes followed him. Red slippers on his feet, he said, and a nauch girl on his arm. He must have served in the Turkish Navy. The woman put her hands on the table. She did it as if she never wanted to lift them again. Her hands had been well cared for but that meant nothing. Still they were not too well cared for. Ravik saw that the nail of the right middle finger was broken, it seemed to have been torn off without having been filed. In some places the polish was chipped. The waiter brought the glasses and a package of cigarettes. Lauren's green. Found one after all. I thought you would. Were you in the navy? No. Circus. Better still. Ravik handed a glass to the woman. Here, drink this. It's the best thing at this hour. Or would you like coffee? No. Drink it all at once. The woman nodded and emptied the glass. Ravik studied her. She had a colorless face, almost without expression. The mouth was full but pale, the contours appeared blurred. Only the hair was very beautiful, of a lustrous natural blonde. She wore a basque beret and under her raincoat a blue tailored suit. The suit had been made by a good tailor, but the green stone in the ring on her hand was much too big to be real. Do you want another? Ravik asked. She nodded. He beckoned the waiter. Two more Calvados. But bigger glasses. Bigger glasses? More in them, too? Yes. That would be two double Calvados. You've guessed it. Ravik decided to finish his drink quickly and leave. He was bored and very tired. Generally he was patient with such incidents, he had more than forty years of eventful living behind him. But he was only too well acquainted with situations like this. He had lived in Paris for a number of years and not been able to sleep much at night, then one saw a lot on the way. The waiter brought the drinks. Ravik took the penetrating and aromatic smelling apple brandy and placed it carefully in front of the woman. Drink this too. It doesn't help much, but it warms you up. And whatever's the matter, don't take it too hard. 
there's nothing that remains serious for long. The woman looked at him. She did not drink. It's true, Ravik said. Particularly at night. Night exaggerates. The woman still stared at him. You don't have to comfort me, she said. All the better. Ravik looked around for the waiter. He had had enough. He knew this type. Probably Russian, he thought. The minute they sit down somewhere, while they're still wet, they become arrogant. Are you Russian? he asked. No. Ravik paid and rose to say goodbye. At the same moment the woman got up, too. She did it silently and naturally. Ravik looked at her uncertainly. All right, he thought then, I can do it just as well outside. It had begun to rain. Ravik stopped in front of the door. Which way are you going? He was determined to take the opposite direction. I don't know. Somewhere. But, where do you live? The woman made a quick movement. I can't go there. No, no. I can't do that. Not there. Suddenly her eyes were full of a wild fear. She has quarreled, Ravik thought, has had some sort of row and has run away. By tomorrow noon she will have thought it over and will go back. Don't you know anyone to whom you could go? An acquaintance? You could call them up from the bistro. No. There's nobody. But you must go somewhere. Haven't you any money for a room? I have. Then go to a hotel. There are lots of them in the side streets. The woman did not answer. You must go somewhere, Ravik said impatiently. You can't stay in the streets in this rain. The woman drew her raincoat tighter around her. You are right, she said as though she had suddenly come to a decision. You are quite right. Thanks. Don't trouble about me any more. I'll find a place all right. Thank you. With one hand she pulled the collar of her coat together. Thank you for everything. She glanced up at Ravik with an expression of misery, and tried unsuccessfully to smile. Then she walked away through the misty rain unhesitatingly and with soundless steps. Ravik stood still for a moment. Damn it! He grumbled, surprised and irresolute. He did not know how it happened or what it was, the hopeless smile, or the look, or the empty street or the night, he knew only that he could not let this woman go alone through the mist, this woman who suddenly looked like a lost child. He followed her. Come with me, he said gruffly. We'll find something for you. They reached the Ito Isle. The square lay before them in a drizzling grayness, huge and unbounded. The mist was thicker now and one could no longer see the streets that branched off. There was only the broad square with the scattered dim moons of the street lamps and with the monumental stone arch which receded into the mist as though it would prop up the melancholy sky and protect beneath itself the faint lonely flame on the tomb of the unknown soldier, which looked like the last grave of mankind in the midst of night and loneliness. They walked across the square. Ravik walked fast. He was too tired to think. Beside him he heard the soft, patering steps of the woman following him silently, with head bent, hands hidden in the pockets of her coat, a small alien flame of life, and suddenly in the late loneliness of the square, strangely she seemed to belong to him for a moment although he did not know anything about her, or just for that reason. She was a stranger to him, as he felt a stranger everywhere, and, in an odd fashion, this seemed to bring her closer to him than many words and the grinding habit of time. Ravik lived in a small hotel in a side street off the Avenue Wagram behind the Play State Attorneys. It was a rather dilapidated house with just one new touch, the sign above the entrance, bearing the inscription, Hotel International. He rang the bell. Is there a vacant room? He asked the boy who opened the door. The boy stared at him sleepily. The concierge is not here, he mumbled finally. I see that. I asked you if there was a vacant room. The boy shrugged his shoulders helplessly. He saw that Travik had a woman with him, but he could not understand why he wanted another room. According to his experience this was not why women were brought in. Madam is asleep. She'd fire me if I woke her up, he said. 
he scratched himself vigorously. All right. Then we'll have to see for ourselves. Ravik tipped the boy, took his key, and walked upstairs, followed by the woman. Before he unlocked his door, he examined the door next to it. There were no shoes in front of it. He knocked twice. Nobody answered. He certainly tried the knob. The door was locked. This room was empty yesterday, he muttered. We'll try it from the other side. The landlady has probably locked it for fear the bedbugs will get away. He unlocked his room. Sit down for a minute. He pointed to a red horsehair sofa. I'll be back right away. He opened a large window leading to a narrow iron balcony and climbed over the connecting trellis to the adjacent balcony, where he tried the door. It too was locked. He came back resignedly. It's no use. I can't get you another room here. The woman sat in the corner of the sofa. May I sit here for a moment? Ravik looked at her closely. Her face was crumpled with fatigue. She seemed hardly able to get up again. You may stay here, he said. Just for a moment. You can sleep here. That's the easiest thing. The woman did not seem to hear him. Slowly, almost automatically she moved her head. You should have left me on the street. Now, I think I won't be able. I don't think so either. You may stay here and sleep. That's the best thing for you to do. We'll see what tomorrow will bring. The woman looked at him. I don't want. My God, Ravik said. You won't disturb me at all. It's not the first time someone has stayed here overnight because he had nowhere else to go. This is a hotel for refugees. Something like this happens almost every day. You can take the bed, I'll sleep on the sofa. I'm used to it. No, no, I'll just stay where I am. If I may only sit here, that's all. All right, just as you like. Ravik took off his coat and hung it on a hook. Then he took a blanket and a cushion from his bed and moved a chair close to the sofa. He fetched a bathrobe from the bathroom and hung it over the chair. Here, he said, this is what I can give you. If you like, you can have pajamas too. You'll find some in the drawer over there. I won't trouble about you any more. You may use the bathroom now. I've got to do something in here. The woman shook her head. Ravik stood in front of her. But we'll take off your coat, he said. It's pretty wet. And let me have your hat too. She gave him both. He put the cushion in the corner of the sofa. That's for your head. Here is a chair so that you won't fall off when you go to sleep. He moved it closer to the sofa. And now your shoes. Soaked through, of course. A good way to catch cold. He took off her shoes, got a pair of short woolen socks out of the drawer and slipped them over her feet. Now, that's better. During critical times have an eye for comfort. That's an old soldier's maxim. Thanks, the woman said. Thanks. Ravik went into the bathroom and turned on the tap. The water gushed into the basin. He undid his tie and stared absent-mindedly at himself in the mirror. Challenging eyes in deep shadowed sockets, a narrow face, dead tired, only the eyes giving it life, lips too soft for the furrow running from the nose to the mouth, and above the right eye, disappearing into the hair, a long jagged scar. The telephone bell cut into his thoughts. Damn it! For an instant he had forgotten everything. There were such moments of complete oblivion. And there was still the woman sitting in the other room. I'm coming! He called. Frightened? He lifted the receiver. What? Yes. All right. Yes, naturally, immediately, yes, it will do, yes. Where? All right. I'll be there at once. Hot strong coffee, yes. He carefully put the receiver down and for a few seconds remained seated on the arm of the sofa. I've got to go, he said, right now. The woman rose immediately. She swayed a little and leaned on the chair. No, no, for a moment Travick was touched by this obedient readiness. You can stay here. 
go to sleep. I will be gone for an hour or two, I don't know exactly how long. Do stay here. He got into his coat. He had a passing thought. And at once forgot it. The woman would not steal. She was not the type. He knew it too well. And there wasn't much she could steal. He was already at the door when the woman asked, Can't I go with you? Impossible. Stay here. Take whatever you need. The bed, if you want. There's cognac over there. Go to sleep. He turned away. Leave the light on, the woman said suddenly and quickly. Ravik took his hand from the knob. Afraid? He asked. She nodded. He pointed to the key. Lock the door behind me. But don't leave the key in the lock. There's another key downstairs with which I can get in. She shook her head. It's not that. But please leave the light on. I see. Ravik looked at her sharply. I wasn't going to turn it off anyway. Leave it on. I know that feeling. I've gone through such times, too. At the corner of the Rue des Acacias he got a taxi. Drive to Rue Lauriston. Fast. The driver made a U-turn and drove into the Avenue Carnot and then into the Avenue de la Forge. As he crossed the Avenue de la Grande Armée a small two-seater raced toward them from the right. The two cars would have collided, had not the street been wet and smooth. But when the two-seater's brake took hold it skidded into the middle of the street just past the radiator of the taxi. The light car whirled like a carousing. It was a small Renault driven by a man wearing glasses and a black bowler hat. At every turn one saw his white indignant face for a moment. Then the car came to a stop facing the arc at the end of the street as though facing the huge gates to Hades, a small green insect out of which a pallid fist rose menacingly toward the night sky. The cab driver turned around. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yes, Ravik said. But with such a hat. Why does anyone with such a hat have to drive so fast at night? It was his right of way. He was on the main road. Why are you cursing? Of course he was right. That's just why I am cursing. What would you have done if he had been wrong? I would have cursed just the same. You seem to make life easy for yourself. I wouldn't have cursed like that, the driver explained and turned into the avenue Fock. Not so surprised, you understand? No. Drive slower at intersections. That's what I was going to do. That damn oil on the street. But what makes you ask me if you don't want to listen to an answer? Because I'm tired, Ravik replied impatiently. Because it's night. Also, if you like, because we are sparks in an unknown wind. Drive on. That's something else. The driver touched his cap with a certain respect. That I understand. Listen, Ravik said with suspicion. Are you Russian? No. But I read a lot while waiting for customers. I'm out of luck with Russians today, Ravik thought. He leaned his head back. Coffee, he thought. Very hot black coffee. Let's hope they have plenty of it. My hands have to be damned steady. If they aren't, Weber will have to give me a shot. But I'll be all right. He pulled the window down and slowly and deeply breathed in the moist air. 2. The small operating room was lighted bright as day. It looked like a very hygienic slaughterhouse. Pails with blood-drenched cotton stood here and there, bandages and tampons lay scattered, and the red was a loud and solemn protest against all the white. Weber was sitting at an enameled steel table in the ante-room, making notes, a nurse was boiling the instruments, the water bubbled, the light seemed to hum and only the body on the table lay quite independent, nothing any longer mattered to it. Ravik let the liquid soap run over his hands and began to Washington he did it with a furious sullenness as if he wished to rub off his skin. Damn! he muttered. Damned confounded crap! The nurse looked at him with disgust. Weber glanced up. Calm down, Nurse Eugenie. All surgeons swear. Particularly if something has gone wrong you should be used to it. 
The nurse threw a handful of instruments into the boiling water. Professor Perrier never swore, she explained in an offended tone. Professor Perrier was a brain specialist. A most subtle mechanic, Eugenie. We work in the abdomen. That's something else. Weber closed his notebook and got up. You did your best, Ravik. But after all one can't win against quacks. Oh yes, sometimes you can. Ravik dried his hands and lit a cigarette. The nurse opened the window in silent disapproval. Bravo, Eugenie, Weber praised her. Always according to rules. I have responsibilities. I don't want to be blown up. That's nice, Eugenie. And reassuring. Some have none. And some don't want to have any. That's men for you, Ravik. Weber laughed. We'd better disappear. Eugenie is always aggressive in the morning. Anyway there's nothing to be done here. Ravik turned around. He looked at the dutiful nurse. She returned his look fearlessly. The steel-rimmed glasses made her bleak face somehow untouchable. She was a human being like himself, but to him she appeared more alien than a tree. Pardon me, he said, you are right, nurse. Under the white light on the table lay what a few hours before had been hope, breath, pain, and quivering life. Now it was only an insensible cadaver, and the human automaton called Nurse Eugenie, with responsibilities and respect for herself, proud of never having taken a false step, covered it up and rolled it away. These are the ones who live forever, Ravik thought, life does not love them, these souls of wood, therefore it forgets them and lets them live on and on. So long, nurse, Weber said. Take a good sleep today. Goodbye, Dr. Weber. Thank you, doctor. Goodbye, Ravik said. Excuse my swearing. Good morning, Eugenie replied icily. Weber smiled. A character of cast iron. Dash. Outside a grey day was dawning. Garbage trucks rattled through the streets. Weber turned up his collar. Nasty weather. Can I give you a lift, Ravik? No, thanks, I'd rather walk. In this weather? I can drop you. It's not out of my way. Ravik shook his head. Thank you, Weber. Weber gave him an appraising look. Strange that you still get worked up when someone dies under the knife. Haven't you been at it for the last fifteen years? You should be used to it by now. Yes, I am. And I'm not worked up. Weber stood before Avik, broad and heavy. His big round face shone like a Normandy apple. His black, trimmed moustache, wet with rain, glittered. The Buick standing at the curb also glittered. Presently Weber would drive home comfortably in it, to a rose-colored doll's house in the suburbs with a neat glittering woman in it and two neat glittering children and a neat glittering life. How could one explain to him something of that breathless tension when the knife began the first cut and the narrow red trace followed the light pressure, when the body, under clips and forceps, opened up like a multiple curtain, when organs which had never seen the light were laid bare? when one followed a track like a hunter in a jungle and suddenly faced the huge wild beast, death, in destroyed tissues, in lumps, in tumors, in scissures, and the fight began, the silent, mad fight during which one could use no other weapon than a thin blade and a needle and a steady hand, how could one explain what it meant when then all at once a dark shadow rushed through the blinding white of stark concentration, a majestic derision that seemed to render the knife dull the needle brittle, and the hand heavy, and when this invisible, enigmatic pulsing, life, then ebbed away under one's powerless hands, collapsed, drawn into this ghostly vortex which one could never reach or hold, and when a face that had a moment ago breathed and borne a name turned into a rigid, nameless mask, this senseless, rebellious helplessness, how could one explain it, and what was there to explain? Ravik lit another cigarette. Twenty-one years old, he said. With his handkerchief Weber wiped the shiny drops from his moustache. You worked marvelously, Ravik. I couldn't have done it. That you couldn't save what a quack had botched up, 
is something that does not concern you. Where would we be if we thought otherwise? Yes, Ravik said. Where would we be? Weber put his handkerchief back. After all you have gone through, you should be damned tough by now. Ravik looked at him with a trace of irony. One is never tough. But one can get used to a lot of things. That's what I mean. Yes, and to some things never. But that is difficult to realize. Let's take for granted that it was the coffee. Maybe it actually was the coffee that made me so edgy. And we confuse it with excitement. The coffee was good, wasn't it? Very good. I know how to make coffee. I had an idea you'd need it, that's why I made it myself. It was different from the black water Eugenie usually produces, wasn't it? No comparison. You're a master at making coffee. Weber stepped into his car. He trod on the starter and leaned out of the window. Couldn't I drop you? You must be tired. Like a seal, Ravik thought absent mindedly. He is like a healthy seal. But what does that mean? Why does it occur to me? Why always these double thoughts? I'm no longer tired, he said. The coffee woke me up. Sleep well, Weber? Weber laughed. His teeth glistened beneath his black moustache. I won't go to bed now. I'll work in my garden. I'll plant tulips and daffodils. Tulips and daffodils, Ravik thought. In neat, separate beds with neat gravel paths between. Tulips and daffodils, the peach colored, golden storm of spring. So long, Weber, he said. You will take care of the rest, won't you? Naturally. I'll call you up in the evening. Sorry the fee will be low. Not even worth mentioning. The girl was poor and, as it seems, had no relatives. We'll see about that. Ravik dismissed it with a gesture. She gave a hundred francs to Eugenie. Apparently that was all she had. That will be twenty-five francs for you. Never mind, Ravik said impatiently. So long, Weber? So long? Till tomorrow morning at eight. Ravik walked slowly along the Rue Lauriston. Had it been summer, he would have sat down on a bench in the boys in the morning sun and, with vacant mind, would have stared into the water and the young woods, until the tension left him. Then he would have driven to the hotel and gone to bed. He entered a bistro at the corner of the Rue Boise ear. A few workers and truck drivers stood at the bar. They drank hot, black coffee, dipping brioches into it. Ravik watched them for a time. This was ordinary, simple life, a life to seize hold of, to work with, tiredness in the evening, eating, a woman, and a heavy dreamless sleep. Akish, he said. The dying girl had worn a cheap narrow chain of imitation gold around her right ankle, one of those little follies that are possible only when one is young, sentimental, and without taste. A chain with a little plate and an inscription, to jewers Charles, riveted around her ankle so that one could not take it off, a chain that told a story of Sundays in the woods near the Seine, of being in love and of ignorant youth, of a small jeweler somewhere in Nilly, of nights in September in an attic, and then suddenly the staying away, the waiting, the fear, to jewers Charles who never showed up again, then the girlfriend who knew an address, the midwife somewhere, a table covered with oil cloth, piercing pain and blood, blood, a bewildered old woman's face, arms pushing you quickly into a cab to be rid of you, days of misery and of hiding, and finally the ride to the hospital, the last hundred francs crumpled in the hot moist hand, too late. The radio began to blare. A tango, to which a nasal voice sang idiotic words. Ravik caught himself performing the whole operation over again. He checked every move. Maybe, some hours earlier there might have been a chance. Weber had had him called. He had not been in the hotel. So the girl had to die because he had been loafing on the Pont d'Ulma. Weber could not perform such operations himself. The idiocy of chance. The foot with the golden chain, limp, turned inward. Come into my boat, the moon is shining, the crooner quavered in falsetto.
Ravik paid and left. Outside he stopped a taxi. Drive to the Osiris. The Osiris was a large middle class brothel with a huge bar in Egyptian style. We're just closing, the doorman said. There is no one inside. No one? Only Madame Roland. The ladies have all gone. All right. The doorman ill humoredly stamped on the pavement with his galoshes. Why don't you keep the taxi? It won't be easy to get another one later. We're closed. You said that once before. I'll get another taxi all right. Ravik put a package of cigarettes into the doorman's breast pocket and walked through the small door past the cloakroom into the big room. The bar was empty, it gave the usual impression of the remains of a bourgeois symposium, pools of spilled wine, a couple of overturned chairs, butts on the floor, and the smell of tobacco, sweet perfume, and flesh. Roland, Ravik said. She stood in front of a table on which was a pile of pink silk underwear. Ravik, she said without surprise. Late. What do you want, a girl or something to drink? Or both? Vodka. The polish. Roland brought the bottle and a glass. Help yourself. I still have to sort and list the laundry. The laundry wagon will be here any minute. If one doesn't keep track of everything that gang will steal like a flock of magpies. The drivers, you understand. As presents for their girls. Ravik nodded. Turn the music on, Roland. Loud. All right. Roland put the plug in. The sound of drums and brass went thundering through the high empty room like a storm. Too loud, Ravik. No. Too loud? What was too loud? Only the quiet. The quiet in which one burst as though in a vacuum. All through. Roland came to Ravik's table. She had a buxom figure, a clear face, and calm black eyes. The black Puritan dress she wore characterized her as the gouvernante, it distinguished her from the almost naked whores. Have a drink with me, Roland. All right. Ravik fetched a glass from the bar and poured. Roland pulled the bottle back when her glass was half filled. Enough. I won't drink more. Half filled glasses are disgusting. Leave what you don't drink. Why? That would be wasteful. Ravik glanced up. He saw the reliable intelligent face and smiled. Waste. The old French fear. Why save? You are not saved from anything. This is business. That's something else. Ravik laughed. Let's drink a toast to it. What would the world be without business ethics? A pack of criminals, idealists, and sluggards. You need a girl, Roland said. I can call up Kiki. She is very good. Twenty-one years old. So. Twenty-one years too. That's not for me today. Ravik refilled his glass. What do you actually think of, Roland, before you fall asleep? Mostly of nothing. I am too tired. And when you aren't tired? Of tours? Why? An aunt of mine owns a house with a shop there. I hold two mortgages on it. When she dies, she is seventy-six, I'll get the house. Then I'll make a cafe out of the shop. Light wallpaper with flower designs, a band, three men, piano, violin, cello, in the rear a bar. Small and fine. The house is situated in a good district. I think I'll be able to furnish it for 9,500 francs, even with curtains and lamps. Then I'll put aside another 5,000 for the first few months. And naturally I'll have the rent from the first and second floors. That's what I think about. Were you born in Tours? Yes. But no one knows where I've been since. And if the business prospers. No one will bother about it either. Money covers everything. Not everything. But a lot. Ravik felt the heaviness behind his eyes that slowed down his voice. I think I have had enough, he said and took a few bills out of his pocket. Will you marry in tours, Roland? Not right away. But in a few years. I have a friend there. Do you go there occasionally? 
Really? He writes sometimes. To another address of course. He's married, but his wife is in the hospital. Tuberculosis. One or two more years at the most, the doctors say. Then he'll be free. Ravik got up. God bless you, Roland. You have sound common sense. She smiled appreciatively. She believed he was right. Her clear face showed not a trace of tiredness. It was fresh as if she had just got up from sleep. She knew what she wanted. Life held no secrets for her. Outside it had become bright day. The rain had stopped. The pissoyers stood like armor turrets at the street corners. The doorman had disappeared, the night was wiped out, the day had begun, and a bursting crowd thronged the entrances to the subway, as if they were holes into which they flung themselves as sacrifice to some dark deity. The woman started up from the sofa. She did not cry out, she just started up with a low suppressed sound, propped herself on her elbows, and stiffened. Quiet, quiet, Ravik said. It's me. The man who brought you here a few hours ago. The woman breathed again. Ravik saw her only indistinctly, the glow of the electric bulbs blended with the morning creeping through the windows in a yellowish, pale, sticky light. I think we can turn these off now, he said and turned the switch. He felt again the soft hammers of drunkenness behind his forehead. Do you want breakfast? he asked. He had forgotten the woman and then when he got his key he had believed she had left. He would have liked to be rid of her. He had drunk enough, the backdrop of his consciousness had shifted, the clanging chain of time had burst asunder, and memories and dreams stood around him, strong and fearless. He wanted to be alone. Do you want some coffee? he asked. It's the only thing that's any good here. The woman shook her head. He looked more closely at her. What's the matter? Has anybody been here? No. But something must be the matter. You stare at me as if I were a ghost. The woman moved her lips. The smell, she said. Smell? Ravik repeated uncomprehendingly. Vodka hardly smells, neither does Kiyashur Cognac. And cigarettes you smoke yourself. What's there about that to be scared of? I don't mean that. What is it then, for God's sake? It is the same, the same smell. Heavens, it must be ether, said Ravik, suddenly understanding. Is it ether? She nodded. Have you ever been operated on? No, it is. Ravik did not listen further. He opened the window. It will be gone in a minute. Smoke a cigarette meanwhile. He went into the bathroom and turned on the faucets. He saw his face in the mirror. A few hours ago he had stood here in the same way. In the interim a human being had died. It did not matter. Thousands of people died every moment. There were statistics about it. It did not matter. For the one individual, however, it meant everything and was more important than the still revolving world. He sat down on the edge of the tub and took off his shoes. That always stayed the same. Objects and their silent compulsion. The triviality, the stale habit in all the delusive lights of passing experience. The flowering sure of the heart by the waters of love, but whatever one was, poet, demigod, or idiot, every few hours one was called down from his heavens to urinate. One could not escape it. The irony of nature. The romantic rainbow over gland reflexes and bowel movements the organs of ecstasy at the same time diabolically arranged for excretion. Ravik flung his shoes into a corner. Detestable habit of undressing. Not even this could one escape. Only one who lived alone understood it. There was a sort of damnable resignation, of yielding in it. He had often slept in his clothes to get away from it, but it was only a postponement. One could not escape it. He turned on the shower. The cool water streamed over his skin. He drew a deep breath and dried himself. The comfort of small things. Water, breath, evening rain. They, too, were things that only one who lived alone could understand. Grateful skin. 
more freely circling blood in the dark channels. To lie down in a meadow. Birches. Summer clouds. The sky of youth. What has become of the adventures of the heart? Killed by the dark adventures of existence. He returned to the room. The woman was crouching in a corner of the sofa, the blanket drawn high about her. Are you cold? he asked. She shook her head. Scared. She nodded. Of me? No. Of the outside? Yes. Ravik closed the window. Thank you, she said. He looked at the nape of her neck in front of him. Shoulders. Something that breathed. A fragment of strange life, but life. Warmth. No stiffening body. What could one give another but a little warmth? And what was more? The woman moved. She trembled. She looked at Ravik. He felt the wave receding. A deep coolness came without heaviness. The tension was over. Space opened before him. It was as though he had returned after a night on another planet. Suddenly everything was simple. The morning, the woman, there was nothing more to think. Come, he said. She stared at him. Come, he said impatiently. 3. He woke up with the feeling that he was being watched. The woman was sitting on the sofa. But she was not looking at him, she was looking out of the window. He had expected to find her gone. He was annoyed that she was still there. He could not stand people around him in the morning. He thought of trying to fall asleep again, but it was disturbing to know that the woman might be watching him. He made up his mind to get rid of her at once. If she was waiting for money, it was simple. It would be easy in any case. He sat up. Have you been up long? The woman started and looked at him. I couldn't sleep any longer. I am sorry if I woke you. You did not wake me. She got up. I wanted to leave. I don't know what kept me sitting here. Wait. I'll soon be ready. You'll have breakfast. The famous coffee of the hotel. We both will have enough time for that. He rose and rang the bell. Then he went into the bathroom. He noticed that she had used it, but everything was neatly arranged and in place, even the used bath towels. While brushing his teeth he heard the chambermaid come in with the breakfast. He hurried. Did it embarrass you? He asked when he came out of the bathroom. What? Because the girl saw you. I didn't think of that. No. Nor was she surprised. The woman looked at the tray. It was breakfast for two persons although Ravik had not said anything. Of course not. This is Paris. Here, drink your coffee. Have you a headache? No. Well, I have. But it will be gone in an hour. Here, a brioche. I can't eat. Of course you can. You only imagine you can't. Try something. She took the brioche. Then she put it back again. I really can't. Then drink your coffee and have a cigarette. That's a soldier's breakfast. Yes. Raviquette. Aren't you hungry yet? He asked after a while. No. The woman put out her cigarette. I think, she said and stopped. What do you think? Ravik asked without interest. I should be going now. Do you know your way? This is near the Avenue Wagram. No. Where do you live? In the Hotel Verdun. It's a few minutes from here. I can direct you outside. Anyway, I'll have to take you past the porter. Yes, but it's not that. She was silent again. Money, Ravik thought. I can easily help you out, if you are hard up. He took his wallet out of his pocket. Don't. What's that for? The woman said brusquely. Nothing. Ravik put the wallet back. Excuse me, she rose. You were, I have to thank you, it would have been, the night, alone, I wouldn't have known. Ravik remembered what had happened. It would have been ridiculous if the woman had made any claim on him but he had not expected her to thank him, and it was far more disturbing. I really would not have known. The woman said. 
She was still standing before him, undecided. Why doesn't she go? He thought. But now you know? He said just to say something. No. She looked at him frankly. I do not know yet. I only know that I must do something. I know that I cannot escape. That's a lot. Ravik took his coat. I'll take you down now. It's not necessary. Only tell me, she hesitated, searching for words. Perhaps you know, what must be done, if. If, Ravik said after a while. If someone dies, the woman blurted and suddenly collapsed. She wept. She did not sob, she merely wept, almost soundlessly. Ravik waited until she was calmer. Has someone died? She nodded. Last night? She nodded again. Did you kill him? The woman stared at him. What? What did you say? Did you do it? When you ask me what to do you must tell me. He died. The woman cried. He died. Suddenly he was. She covered her face. Was he sick? Ravik asked. Yes. Did you have a doctor? Yes, but he did not want to go to the hospital. Did you have the doctor yesterday? No. Earlier. Three days ago. He had, he ranted against the doctor and refused to see him again. Didn't you call another doctor afterwards? We didn't know any. We have only been here three weeks. This one, the waiter got us this one, and he did not want him any more, he said, he thought he would be better off without him. What was the matter with him? I don't know. The doctor said pneumonia, but he didn't believe him. He said all doctors are crooks, and he was really feeling better yesterday. Then suddenly. Why didn't you take him to the hospital? He did not want to go. He said, he, I would betray him when he was away, he, you don't know him, there was nothing to be done. Is he still at the hotel? Yes. Did you tell the owner of the hotel what had happened? No. Suddenly when he grew silent, and everything was so silent, and his eyes, I couldn't bear it and ran away. Ravik thought about the night. For a moment he was embarrassed. But it had happened and it was unimportant, to him and to the woman. Particularly to the woman. This night nothing really had mattered to her and only one thing was important, that she go through it. Life consisted of more than sentimental similes. The night Levine had heard that his wife was dead he had spent in a brothel. The whores had saved him, a priest could not have helped him through it. Whoever understood this, understood it. There was no explanation for it but responsibilities went along with it. He took his coat. Come. I'll go with you. Was it your husband? No, the woman said. The patron of the Hotel Verton was fat. He hadn't a single hair on his skull, but to make up for it he had a dyed black moustache and bushy black eyebrows. He was standing in the lobby, behind him a waiter, a chambermaid, and a cashier with a flat bosom. It was evident that he already knew everything. He burst into abuse as soon as he saw the woman enter. His face paled, he waved his fat little hands in the air, and he sputtered with rage, indignation and, as Ravik saw, relief. When he came to police, aliens, suspicion, and prison, Ravik interrupted him. Do you come from Provence? he asked. The patron stopped short. No. What do you mean? he asked in surprise. Nothing, Ravik replied. I only wanted to interrupt you. An utterly senseless question is the best way. You would have gone on talking for another hour. Who are you, sir? What do you want? That's the first intelligent sentence you've said up to now. The hotel keeper calmed down. Who are you? he asked more quietly careful not to insult an influential man under any circumstances. I'm the doctor, Ravik replied. The patron saw that there was no danger here. There is no need of a doctor now, he burst out anew. This is a case for the police. He stared at Ravik and the woman. He expected fear, protest, 
and entreaties. That's a good idea. Why aren't they already here? You've known for several hours that the man is dead. The patron did not answer. I'll tell you why. Ravik took one step forward. You don't want a scandal because of your guests. Many people would move out if they knew about such things. But the police must come, that's the law. It's up to you to hush it up. But that wasn't what bothered you. You were afraid the mess would be left in your lap. You needn't have been. Besides you were worried about your bill. It will be paid. And now am I want to see the corpse. Then I'll take care of everything else. He walked past the hotel keeper. What is the room number? He asked the woman. Fourteen. You don't have to come with me. I can do it alone. No. I don't want to stay here. It would be better for you not to see any more. No, I will not stay here. All right. Just as you like. It was a front room with a low ceiling. A few chambermaids, porters, and waiters were crowded around the door. Ravik pushed them aside. There were two beds in the room, in the one next to the wall, the body of the man was lying. He lay the yellow and stiff, with curled black hair, in red silk pajamas. His hands were folded, a small cheap wooden Madonna on whose face were traces of lipstick stood on the table beside him. Ravik picked it up, on its back was stamp made in Germany. Ravik examined the face of the dead man, there was no rouge on his lips nor did he seem to have been that type. The eyes were half open, one more than the other, which gave the body an expression of indifference, as if it had grown stiff in eternal boredom. Ravik bent over the corpse. He took stock of the bottles on the table near the bed and examined the body. No trace of violence. He drew himself up. Do you know the name of the doctor who was here? He asked the woman. No. He looked at her. She was very pale. First of all you sit down over there. On that chair in the corner. And stay there. Is the waiter who called the doctor for you here? His eyes skimmed over the faces at the door. There was the same expression on each of them, horror and greed. Francois was on this floor, said the charwoman, who was holding a broom like a spear in her hand. Where is Francois? A waiter pushed his way through the crowd. What was the name of the doctor who was here? Bonnet. Charles Bonnet. Do you know his telephone number? The waiter fumbled for it in his pockets. Parsi 2743. Good. Ravik saw the face of the patron emerging from the crowd. Let's close the door first. Or do you want the people from the street to come in, too? No. Get out. Get out. Why do you stand around here stealing my time for which you get paid? The patron chased the employees out of the room and closed the door. Ravik took the receiver from the hook. He called Weber and talked to him for a short while. Then he called the Parsi number. Bonnet was in his consultation room. He confirmed what the woman had said. The man has died, Ravik said. Could you come over and make out the death certificate? That man threw me out in the most insulting manner. He can't very well insult you now. He didn't pay my fee. Instead he called me an avaricious quack. Would you come so that your bill can be paid? I could send someone. You'd better come yourself. Otherwise you will never get your money. I'll come, Bonnet said after some hesitation. But I won't sign anything before I'm paid. It amounts to three hundred francs. All right. Three hundred. You'll get it. Ravik hung up. I'm sorry you had to listen to this, he said to the woman. But there was no alternative. We need the man. The woman already had some money in her hand. It doesn't matter, she replied. Such things are not new to me. Here is the money. There is no hurry about that. He'll be here right away. Then you can give it to him. Couldn't you yourself sign the death certificate? The woman asked. No. Ravik said. We need a French physician for that. It is best to have the one who treated him. 
When the door closed behind Bonnet the room became suddenly quiet. Much quieter than if just one man had left the room. The noise of cars on the streets sounded somehow tinny, as though bounced against a wall of heavy air through which it could penetrate only with difficulty. After the confusion of the past hours the presence of the dead man was now there for the first time. His powerful silence filled the cheap small room and it did not matter that he wore bright red silk pajamas, he reigned even as a dead clown might train, because he no longer moved. What lived, moved, and what moved could have power, grace, and absurdity, but never the strange majesty of that which will never move again, but only decay. What was completed alone possessed it, and man reached completion only in death, and for a short while. You were not married to him, were you? Ravik asked. No. Why? The law. His estate. The police will want to make a list, of what belonged to you and, to him. You must keep what belongs to you. What is his, will be retained by the police. For his relatives should they show up. Had he any? Not in France. You had been living with him, hadn't you? The woman did not answer. For a long time? For two years. Ravik looked around. Haven't you any suitcases? I have, they were over there against the wall, last night. I see, the patron. Ravik opened the door. The charwoman with the broom started back. Mother, he said, for your age you are much too inquisitive. Get me the patron. The charwoman was about to protest. You're right. Ravik interrupted her. At your age one has nothing but inquisitiveness left. Nevertheless, get me the patron. The old woman mumbled something and disappeared, pushing the broom before her. I'm sorry, Ravik said, but it can't be helped. It may seem vulgar, yet we'd better do it right now. It's simpler, even though you may not understand it at the moment. I do, the woman said. Ravik looked at her. You understand? Yes. The hotel keeper entered, a paper in his hand. He did not knock at the door. Where are the suitcases? Ravik asked. First the bill. Here. You've got to pay the bill first. First the suitcases. No one has as yet refused to pay your bill. The room is still rented and next time knock at the door before you enter. Let me have the bill and get us the suitcases. The man gave him a furious look. You'll get your money all right, Ravik said. The patron left. He slammed the door. Have you any money in the suitcases? Ravik asked the woman. I, no, I don't think so. Do you know where there might be any money? In his suit? Or wasn't there any? He had money in his wallet. Where is it? Under, the woman hesitated. He kept it under his pillow most of the time. Ravik got up. He carefully lifted the pillow on which the head of the dead man rested and drew forth a black leather wallet. He gave it to the woman. Take out the money and everything that is important to you. Quickly. There is no time left for sentimentality. You've got to live. What other purpose could it serve? to Mulder at police headquarters? He looked out the window for a minute. A truck driver was having a row with the driver of a grocer's wagon drawn by two horses. He was berating him with the full superiority conferred by a heavy motor. Ravik turned around again. Ready? Yes. Give the wallet back to me. He pushed it under the pillow. He noticed that it was thinner than it had been. Put the things into your bag he said. She did it obediently. Ravik picked up the bill and perused it. Have you already paid a bill here? I don't know. I think so. This is a bill for two weeks. Did he pay? Ravik hesitated. It struck him as strange to speak of the dead man as Mr. Rasinski. Were the bills always paid promptly? Yes, always. He often said that, in our situation it is important always to pay promptly when you have to. That scoundrel of a patron. Have you any idea where the last bill might be? No. 
I only know that he kept all his papers in the small suitcase. There was a knock at the door. Ravik could not help smiling. The porter brought in the suitcases. The patron came in after him. Are these all? Ravik asked the woman. Yes. Naturally these are all, the hotel keeper growled. What did you expect? Ravik picked up the smaller suitcase. Have you got a key to this? No? Where can the keys be? In his suit. In the wardrobe. Ravik opened the wardrobe. It was empty. Well? He asked the patron. The patron turned to the porter. Well? He spat. The suit is outside, stammered the porter. Why? To be brushed and cleaned. He does not need that any more, Ravik said. Bring it in at once, you damned thief, the patron yelled. The porter gave him a funny look, winked, and left. He returned immediately with the suit. Ravik shook the jacket, then the trousers. There was a clinking sound. Ravik hesitated a moment. Strange, going through the pockets of a dead man's trousers. As if the suit had died with him. And strange to feel that way. A suit was just a suit. He took the keys out of the pocket and opened the suitcase. On top lay a canvas folder. Is this it? He asked the woman. She nodded. Ravik found the bill at once. The bill was receipted. He showed it to the patron. You have overcharged for a whole week. What of it? He shouted. And the trouble. The mess. The excitement. All that is nothing? My gallbladder is acting up again, that ought to be included, too. You yourself said that my guests might leave. The damage is much greater. And the bed? The room that must be fumigated? The bedclothes that are filthy? The bedclothes are on the bill. Also a dinner for twenty-five francs that he was supposed to have eaten last night. Did you eat anything last night? He asked the woman. No. But couldn't I just pay for it? It is, I'd like to get it over with quickly. To get it over with quickly, Ravik thought. We know that feeling. And then, the silence and the dead man. The thud of silence. Better so, even if it is ugly. He picked up a pencil from the table and began to figure. Then he handed the bill to the patron. Do you agree? The latter glanced at the final figure. Do you think I am crazy? Do you agree? Ravik repeated. Who are you anyway? Why are you meddling? I am a brother, Ravik said. Do you agree? Plus 10% for service and taxes. Otherwise not. All right. Ravik added on the figures. You'll have to pay 292 francs, he said to the woman. She took 300 franc notes out of her bag and gave them to the patron, who grabbed them and turned to go. The room must be vacated by 6 o'clock. Otherwise it will count as another day. We get 8 francs change, Ravik said. And the concierge? That will settle ourselves. Sullenly the patron counted out 8 francs on the table. Sales at rangers, he muttered and left the room. The pride of some French hotel keepers consists in their hatred of foreigners from whom they make their living. Ravik noticed the tip conscious porter hovering at the door. Here. The porter looked first at the bill. Merci, monsieur, he announced then and left. Now we still have the police to deal with and then he can be taken away, Ravik said, looking toward the woman. She was sitting quietly in the corner among the suitcases, in the slowly gathering dusk. When one is dead, one becomes very important, when one is alive, nobody cares. He looked at the woman again. Would you like to go downstairs? There must be a writing room downstairs. She shook her head. I'll go with you. A friend of mine will come to settle the matter with the police. Dr. Weber. We may wait for him downstairs. No, I'd like to stay here. There's nothing to do. Why do you want to stay here? I don't know. He won't be here much longer. And I often, he wasn't happy with me. 
I was often away. Now I will stay. She spoke calmly, without sentimentality. He won't know that now, Ravik said. It isn't that. All right. Then we'll have a drink here. You need it. Ravik did not wait for an answer. He rang the bell. Surprisingly the waiter appeared promptly. Bring us two large cognacs. In here? Yes. Where else? Very well, sir. The waiter brought two glasses and a bottle of Corvoisia. He stared toward the corner where the bed glimmered whitely in the dusk. Shall I turn on the light? He asked. No. But you can leave the bottle here. The waiter put the tray on the table and departed as quickly as he could. Ravik took the bottle and filled the glasses. Drink this, it will do you good. He expected the woman would refuse and he would have to persuade her but she emptied the glass without hesitation. Is there anything else of value in the suitcases that aren't yours? No. Something you would like to keep? That could be useful to you. Why don't you take a look? No. There is nothing in them. I know. Not even in the small suitcase. Maybe. I don't know what he kept in it. Ravik picked up the suitcase and put it on the small table near the window. A few bottles, some underwear, a few notebooks, a box of watercolors, brushes, a book, in a compartment of the canvas folder two banknotes wrapped in tissue paper. He held them up to the light. Here is a hundred dollars, he said. Take it. You can live on this for a while. We'll put the suitcase with your belongings. It could just as well have been yours. Thank you, the woman said. Possibly you find all this disgusting. But it has to be done. It is important to you. It will give you a little time. I don't find it disgusting. Only I couldn't have done it myself. Ravik filled the glasses again. Have another drink. She emptied the glass slowly. Do you feel better now? He asked. She looked at him. Neither better nor worse. Nothing. The dusk enveloped her. Sometimes the red reflections of the neon lights flickered across her face and hands. I can't think at all, she said, as long as he is here. The two ambulance men turned back the blanket and put the stretcher down near the bed. Then they lifted the body. They did it quickly and in a businesslike manner. Ravik stood close to the woman to be at hand in case she fainted. Before the men covered the body. He bent down and took the small wooden Madonna from the night table. I think that belongs to you, he said. Don't you want to keep it? No. He gave it to her. She did not take it. He opened the smaller suitcase and put it in. The ambulance men covered the corpse with a cloth. Then they lifted the stretcher. The door was too narrow and the corridor outside was not very wide. They tried to get it through but it was impossible. The stretcher hit against the wall. We must take him off, said the older man. We can't turn the corner this way. He looked at Ravik. Come, Ravik said to the woman. We'll wait downstairs. She shook her head. All right, he said to the man. Do what you think necessary. Both men lifted the body, holding it by the feet and shoulders, and put it on the floor. Ravik wanted to say something. He watched the woman. She did not move. He kept silent. The men carried the stretcher into the hall. Then they came back into the dusk and carried the body out into the dimly lit corridor. Ravik followed them. They had to lift the stretcher very high in order to go down the stairs. Their faces swelled and became red and wet with perspiration under the weight, and the dead body swung heavily above them. Ravik's eyes followed them until they reached the foot of the stairs. Then he went back. The woman was standing near the window, looking out. The car was parked on the street. The men pushed the stretcher into it like bakers pushing bread into the oven. Then they climbed up on their seats, the motor roared as if someone were crying out from underground, and the car shot around the corner in a sharp curve. The woman turned around. You should have left before, Ravik said. Why did you have to see the end of it? I could not. 
I could not leave before him. Don't you understand that? Yes. Come. Have another drink. No. Vebo had turned on the light when the ambulance and police came. The room seemed bigger now that the body was gone. Bigger and strangely dead, as though the body had gone out and death alone was left. Do you want to stay here in the hotel? I imagine not. No. Do you have any friends here? No, no one. Do you know a hotel where you'd like to live? No. There is a small hotel in the neighborhood, similar to this one. Clean and decent. The Hotel de Milan. We might find something for you there. Couldn't I go to the hotel where? To your hotel? The International? Yes. I, there is, I know it by now somehow, it is better than one entirely unknown. The International is not the right hotel for women, Ravik said. That would be the finishing touch, he thought. In the same hotel. I am not a nurse. And besides, maybe she thinks I already have some sort of responsibility. That could be. I can't advise you to go there, he said in a harsher voice than he intended. It is always overcrowded. With refugees? Stay at the Hotel de Milan. If you don't like it there, you may move wherever you like. The woman looked at him. He felt she knew what he was thinking and he was embarrassed. But it was better to be embarrassed for an instant and to be left alone later. Good, the woman said. You are right. Ravik ordered the suitcases carried down to a taxi. The Hotel de Milan was only a few minutes ride. He rented a room and went upstairs with the woman. It was a room on the second floor, with wallpaper of rose garlands, a bed, a wardrobe, and a table with two chairs. Is this all right? He asked. Yes. Very good. Ravik eyed the wallpaper. It was terrible. At least it seems to be clean in here, he said. Bright and clean. Yes. The suitcases were brought upstairs. Now you have everything here. Yes, thanks. Many thanks. She sat down on the bed. Her face was pale and expressionless. You should go to bed. Do you think you will be able to sleep? I'll try. He took an aluminium tube out of his pocket and shook a few tablets out of it. Here is something to make you sleep. With water. Do you want to take it now? No, later. All right. I'll go now. I'll look you up one of these days. Try to sleep as soon as possible. Here is the address of the funeral parlor in case something comes up. But don't go there. Think of yourself. I'll come around. Ravik hesitated a moment. What's your name? He asked. Mud. Joan Mud. Joan Mud. All right. I'll remember it. He knew he would not remember it and he would not look her up. But because he knew it he wished to keep up appearances. I'd better write it down, he said and took a prescription pad out of his vest pocket. Here, write it yourself. That's simpler. She took the pad and wrote down her name. He looked at it, tore the sheet off, and stuck it in a side pocket of his coat. Go to bed right away, he said. Tomorrow everything will seem different. It sounds stupid and trite, but it is true, all you need now is sleep and a little time. A certain amount of time that you have to get through. Do you know that? Yes, I know. Take the tablets and sleep well. Yes, thank you. Thanks for everything. I don't know what I would have done without you. I really don't know. She offered her hand. It was cool to the touch and she had a firm clasp. Good, he thought. There is some determination here already. Ravik stepped into the street. He inhaled the moist, soft wind. Automobiles, people, a few early whores already at the corners, brasseries, bistros, the smell of tobacco, aperitifs, and gasoline, quick, fluctuating life. How sweet it could taste in passing. He looked up at the hotel front. A few lighted windows. Behind one of them the woman was sitting now and staring straight ahead. 
he took the slip with her name out of his pocket, tore it up, and threw it away. Forget. What a word, he thought. Full of horror, comfort, and apparitions. Who could live without forgetting? But who could forget enough? The ashes of memory that ground one's heart. Only when one had nothing more to live for, was one free. He went to the place to let a while. A great crowd filled the square. Searchlights had been placed behind the Arc de Triomphe. They illuminated the tomb of the unknown soldier. A huge blue white red flag waved in the wind in front of it. It was the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the 1918 armistice. The sky was overcast and the beam of the searchlights threw the shadow of the flag against the floating clouds, dull and blurred and torn. It looked like a ragged flag which gradually melted into the slowly darkening sky. Somewhere a military band was playing. It sounded weak and thin. There was no singing. The crowd stood silent. Armistice, an old woman said at Travick's side. I lost my husband in the last war. Now it's my son's turn. Armistice. Who knows what next year will bring. 4. The fever chart over the bed was new and clean. Only the name was on it. Lucine Martinet. Butts Chamont. Rue Clavel. The girl's face on the pillow was grey. She had been operated on the night before. Ravik carefully listened to her heart. Then he straightened up. Better, he said. The blood transfusion worked a minor miracle. If she lasts one more day she has a chance. Fine, Weber said. Congratulations. It didn't look as if she had. A pulse of 140 and a blood pressure of 80, caffeine, caramine, that was damn close. Ravik shrugged his shoulders. That's nothing to be congratulated for. She came earlier than the other girl. The one with the gold chain around her ankle. That was all. He covered the girl up. This is the second case within a week. If it goes on you'll have a hospital for mishandled abortions from the butts Chamont. Wasn't the other girl from there, too? Vepa nodded. Yes. And from the Rue Clavel. They probably knew each other and went to the same midwife. She even came about the same time in the evening as the other girl. It's a good thing I was able to get hold of you at the hotel. I was afraid you wouldn't be in. Ravik looked at him. When one lives in a hotel one usually isn't in at night, Weber? Hotel rooms in November aren't particularly cheerful. I can imagine that. But then why do you go on living in a hotel? It's a comfortable and impersonal way of living. One's alone and one isn't alone. Is that what you want? Yes. You could have all that in another way too. If you'd rent a small apartment, it would be just the same. Maybe. Ravik bent over the girl again. Don't you think so, too, Eugenie? Weber asked. The nurse glanced up. Mr. Ravik will never do it, she said coldly. Dr. Ravik, Eugenie, Weber corrected. I've told you a hundred times. He was chief surgeon in a great hospital in Germany. Far more important than I am. Here, the nurse began and straightened her glasses. Weber quickly stopped her. All right. All right. We know all that. This country doesn't recognize foreign degrees. Idiotic at that. But what makes you so sure he won't take an apartment? Mr. Ravik is a lost man. He will never build a home for himself. What? Weber asked in astonishment. What's that you are saying? There is no longer anything sacred to Mr. Ravik. That's the reason. Bravo, Ravik said from the girl's bedside. I have never heard anything like it. Weber stared at Eugenie. Why don't you ask him yourself, Dr. Weber? Ravik smiled. You hit the mark, Eugenie. But when there is no longer anything sacred to one, everything again becomes sacred in a more human way. One reveres the spark of life that pulses even in an earthworm and that forces it from time to time up to the light of day. That's not meant to be a comparison. You can't insult me. You have no faith. Eugenie energetically smoothed her white coat over her breast. 
Thank God, I have my faith. Ravik straightened up. Faith can easily make one fanatical. That's why all religions have cost so much blood. He grinned. Tolerance is the daughter of doubt, Eugenie. That explains why you, with all your faith, are so much more aggressive toward me than I, lost infidel, am toward you. Weber guffawed. The you are, Eugenie. Don't answer. You'll get in even deeper. My dignity as a woman. Fine. Weber interrupted. Stick to that. That's always good. I've got to leave now. I've still some things to do in the office. Come, Ravik. Good morning, Eugenie. Good morning, Dr. Weber. Good morning, Nurse Eugenie, Ravik said. Good morning, Eugenie replied with an effort and only after Weber had turned around to look at her. Weber's office was crowded with Empire furniture, white and gold and fragile. Photographs of his house and garden hung on the wall above his desk. A modern broad chaise long stood against the wall. Weber slept on it when he stayed overnight. The private hospital belonged to him. What would you like to drink, Ravik? Cognac or Dubonit? Coffee, if there is any left. Of course. Weber placed the coffee pot on the desk and put the plug in. Then he turned to Ravik. Can you substitute for me in the Osiris this afternoon? Of course. You don't mind? Not in the least. I've no other plans. Fine. Then I won't have to drive in again just to go there. I can work in my garden. I'd have asked Fauchin but he is on his vacation. Nonsense, Ravik said. I've done it often enough. That's right. Nevertheless. Nevertheless no longer exists nowadays. Not for me. Yes. It's idiotic enough that you are not permitted to work here officially and have to hide out as a ghost surgeon. But Weber? That's an old story now. It is happening to all physicians who fled from Germany. Just the same. It's ridiculous. You performed Urant's most difficult operations and he makes a name for himself. Better than if he did them himself. Weber laughed. I'm a fine one to talk. You do mine too. But after all, I am a gynecologist and not a specialist in surgery. The coffee pot began to hum. Weber turned it off. He took cups out of a closet and poured the coffee. One thing I really don't understand, Ravik, he said. Why do you go on living in that depressing hole, the International? Why don't you rent one of those nice new apartments in the neighborhood of the boys? You could buy some furniture anywhere cheap. Then at least you'd know what's your own. Yes, Ravik said. Then I would know what was my own. See. Why don't you do it? Ravik took a gulp of his coffee. It was bitter and very strong. Weber, he said, you are a magnificent example of the convenient thinking of our time. In one breath you are sorry because I work illegally here, and at the same time you ask me why I don't rent a nice apartment. What's one got to do with the other? Ravik smiled patiently. If I take an apartment I must be registered with the police. I would need a passport and a visa for that. That's right. I hadn't thought of that. And in hotels you don't need any? The two? But, thank God, there are a few hotels in Paris that don't take registration too seriously. Ravik poured a few drops of cognac into his coffee. One of them is the International. That's why I live there. I don't know how the landlady arranges it. But she must have good connections. Either the police really don't know about it or they are bribed. At any rate I have lived there for quite a long time undisturbed. Weber leaned back. Ravik. He said. I didn't know that. I only thought you weren't permitted to work here. That's a hell of a situation. It's paradise. Compared with a German concentration camp. And the police? If they do come some day? If they catch us we get a few weeks imprisonment and are deported across the border. Mostly into Switzerland. In case of a second offense we get six months in prison. What? Six months, Ravik said. 
Weber stared at him. But that's impossible. That's inhuman. That's what I thought, too. Until I experienced it. How do you mean experienced? Has that ever happened to you? Not once. Three times. Just as to hundreds of others as well. In the beginning, when I knew nothing about it and counted on so called humaneness. After that, I went to Spain, where I didn't need any passport, and got a second lesson in applied humaneness. From German and Italian flyers. Then later, when I returned to France, I, of course, knew the ins and outs of it. Weber got up. But for heaven's sake, he figured it out. Then you have been imprisoned over a year for nothing. Not as long as that. Only two months. How is that? Didn't you say in the case of a second offense it was six months? Ravik smiled. There are no second offenses when one is experienced. One is deported under one name and simply returns under another. If possible, at another point on the frontier. That's how we avoid it. Since we have no papers it can only be proven if someone recognizes us personally. That very rarely happens. Ravik is my third name. I've used it for almost two years. Nothing has happened in that time. It seems to have brought me luck. I'm beginning to like it more every day. By now I've almost forgotten my real name. Weber shook his head. And all this simply because you are not a Nazi. Naturally. Nazis have first class papers. And all the visas they want. Nice world we live in. And the government doesn't do a thing. There are several million men out of work for whom the government has to care first. Besides it's not only in France. The same thing is happening everywhere. Ravik got up. Adieu, Weber. I'll look in on the girl again in two hours. And once more at night. Weber followed him to the door. Listen, Ravik, he said. Why don't you come out to our house sometime? For dinner. Certainly. Ravik knew he would not go. Sometime soon. Adieu, Weber. Adieu, Ravik. And do come, really? Ravik went into the nearest bistro. He sat by a window so that he could look out upon the street. He loved that, to sit without thinking and watch the people passing by. Paris was the city where one could best spend one's time doing nothing. The waiter wiped the table and waited. A perno, Ravik said. With water, sir? No. Ravik deliberated. Don't bring me a perno. There was something he had to wash away. A bitter taste. For that the sweet anus wasn't sharp enough. Bring me a galvados, he said to the waiter. A double galvados. Very well, sir. It was Weber's invitation. That tinge of pity in it. To grant someone an evening with a family. The French rarely invite foreigners to their homes, they prefer to take them to restaurants. He had not yet been to Weber's. It was well meant but hard to bear. One could defend oneself against insults, not against pity. He took a gulp of the apple brandy. Why did he have to explain to Weber his reasons for living in the international? It wasn't necessary. Weber had known all he need know. He knew that Ravik was not permitted to operate. That was enough. That he worked with him nevertheless, was his affair. In this way he made money and could arrange for operations he did not dare perform himself. No one knew about it, only he and the nurse, and she kept quiet. It was the same with Durant. Whenever he had an operation to perform he stayed with the patient until he went under the anesthetic. Then Ravik came and performed the operation for which Durand was too old and incompetent. When the patient awoke later on, there was Durand, the proud surgeon, at his bedside. Ravik saw only the covered patient, he knew only the narrow iodine-stained area of the body bared for the operation. He very often did not know even on whom he operated. Durand gave him the diagnosis and he began to cut. Durand paid Ravik about one-tenth of what he received for an operation. Ravik didn't mind. It was better than not operating at all. With Weber he worked on a more friendly basis. Weber paid him a quarter of the proceeds. 
that was fair. Ravik looked through the window. And what besides? There wasn't much else left. But he was alive, that was enough. At a time when everything was tottering he had no wish to build up something that was bound shortly to fall into ruins. It was better to drift than to waste energy, that was the one thing that was irreplaceable. To survive meant everything, until somewhere a goal again became visible. The less energy that took, the better, then one would have it afterwards. The ant-like attempt to build up a bourgeois life again and again in a century that was falling to pieces, he had seen that ruin many. It was touching, ridiculous, and heroic at the same time, and useless. It made one weary. An avalanche couldn't be stopped once it had started to move, whoever tried, fell beneath it. Better to wait and later to dig out the victims. On long marches one had to travel light. Also when one was fleeing. Ravik looked at his watch. It was time to look at Lucine Martinet. And then go to the Osiris. The whores in the Osiris were waiting. Although they were examined regularly by an official physician. The madam was not content with that. She could not afford to have anyone contract a disease in her place, for that reason she had made an arrangement with Febba to have the girls privately re-examined each Thursday. Sometimes Ravik substituted for him. The madam had furnished and equipped a place on the first floor as an examination room. She was proud of the fact that for more than a year none of her customers had caught anything in her establishment but in spite of all the girl's precautions 17 cases of venereal disease had been caused by customers. Roland, the gouvernante, brought Ravik a bottle of brandy and a glass. I think mother has got something, she said. All right. I'll examine her carefully. I haven't let her work since yesterday. Naturally, she denies it. All right, Roland. The girls came in in their slips, one after the other. Ravik knew almost all of them, only two were new. You don't have to examine me, doctor, said Leonie, a red-haired Gascon. Why not? No clients the whole week. What does madam say to that? Nothing. I made them order a lot of champagne. Seven, eight bottles a night. Three businessmen from Toulouse. Married. All three of them would have liked to but none of them dared because of the others. Each was afraid if he came with me the others would talk about it at home. That's why they drank, each thought he would outlast the others. Leonie laughed and scratched herself lazily. The one who didn't pass out wasn't able to stand up. All right. Nevertheless, I've got to examine you. It's all right with me. Have you a cigarette, doctor? Yes, here. Ravik took a swab and colored it. Then he pushed the glass slide under the microscope. You know what I don't understand? Leonie said, watching him. What? That you still feel like sleeping with a woman when you do these things. I don't understand it either. You're all right. Now who's next? Martha. Martha was pale, slender, and blonde. She had the face of a Botticelli angel but she spoke the argo of the Rublondel. There is nothing wrong with me, doctor. That's fine. Let's have a look at you. But there is really nothing wrong. All the better. Suddenly Roland was standing in the room. She looked at Martha. The girl stopped talking. She looked at Ravik apprehensively. He examined her thoroughly. But it is nothing, doctor. You know how careful I am. Ravik did not reply. The girl continued to talk, hesitated and began again. Ravik swabbed a second time and examined it. You are sick, Martha, he said. What? She jumped up. That can't be true. It is true. She looked at him. Then she broke out suddenly, a flood of curses and maledictions. That swine. That damned swine. I didn't trust him anyway. The slippery trickster. He said he was a student and he ought to know, a medical student, that scoundrel. Why didn't you take care? I did, but it went so quickly, and he said that he, as a student. Ravik nodded. The old story, 
a medical student who had treated himself. After two weeks he had considered himself cured without making a test. How long will it take, doctor? Six weeks. Ravik knew it would take longer. Six weeks. Six weeks without any income. Hospital? Do I have to go to the hospital? We'll see about that. Maybe we can treat you at home later, if you promise. I'll promise anything. Anything. Only not the hospital. You've got to go at first. There's no other way. The girl stared at Ravik. All prostitutes feared the hospital. The supervision was very strict there. But there was nothing else to do. Left at home she would furtively go out after a few days, in spite of all promises, and look for men in order to make money and infect them. The madam will pay the expenses, Ravik said. But I, I, six weeks without any income. And I have just bought a silver fox on installments. Then the installment will be due and everything will be gone. She cried. Come, Martha, Roland said. You won't take me back. I know. Martha sobbed louder. You won't take me back. You never do it. Then I'll be on the streets. And all because of that slippery dog. We'll take you back. You were good business. Our clients like you. Really? Martha looked up. Of course. And now come. Martha left with Roland. Ravik looked after her. Martha would not come back. Madame was much too careful. Her next stage was perhaps the cheap brothels in the Rue Blondel. Then the street. Then cocaine, the hospital, peddling flowers or cigarettes. Or, if she were lucky, some pimp who would beat and exploit her and later throw her out. Dash. The dining room of the Hotel International was in the basement. The lodgers called it the catacombs. During the day a dim light came through several large, thick, opalescent glass panes which faced on the courtyard. In the winter it had to be lighted all day long. The room was at once a writing room, a smoking room, an auditorium, an assembly room, and a refuge for those emigrants who had no papers, when there was a police inspection they could escape through the yard into a garage and from there to the next street. Ravik sat with the doorman of the Scheherazade nightclub, Boris Morosau, in a section of the catacombs that the landlady called the palm room, on a spindly leg table a solitary miserable palm languished there in a majolly capot. Morosau was a refugee from the first war and had lived in Paris for the last fifteen years. He was one of the few Russians who did not claim to have served in the Tsar's guard and who did not speak of his aristocratic family. They were sitting and playing chess. The catacombs were empty except for one table at which a few people were sitting and drinking and talking in loud voices, breaking into a toast every few minutes. Morosau looked around angrily. Can you explain to me, Ravik, why there is such a rumpus here tonight? Why don't these refugees go to bed? Ravik smiled. The refugees in that corner don't concern me, Boris. That is the fascist section of the hotel. Spain. Spain? Weren't you there, too? Yes, but on the other side. Moreover as a doctor. These are Spanish monarchists with fascist trimmings. The remnants of them? The others have gone back a long time ago. These haven't quite been able to make up their minds yet. Franco was not Gentile enough for them. The Moors who butchered Spaniards naturally did not disturb them. Morosa placed his chessmen. Then they probably are celebrating the massacre at Guernica. Or the victory of Italian and German machine guns over the miners in Estremadura. Never before have I seen those fellows here. They have been here for years. You didn't see them because you never eat here. Do you eat here? No. Morosa grinned. All right, he said. Let's skip my next question and your answer, which certainly would be insulting. For all I care, they could have been born here in this hole. If they would only lower their voices. Here, the good old queen's gambit. Ravik moved the pawn opposite. They made the first moves quickly. Then Morosau began to brood. There is a variant by Alekhine. 
Ravik saw that one of the Spaniards was coming over. He was a man with close set eyes and he stopped by their table. Morosau looked at him ill humoredly. The Spaniard did not stand quite straight. Gentlemen, he said politely, Colonel Gomez requests you to drink a glass of wine with him. Sir, Morosau replied with equal politeness, we are just playing a game of chess for the championship of the 17th Arondissement. We express our grateful thanks, but we can't come. The Spaniard did not move a muscle. He turned to Ravik formally as if he were at the court of Philip II. You rendered a friendly service to Colonel Gomez some time ago. He would like to have a drink with you in token of appreciation before his departure. My partner, Ravik replied with the same formality, has just explained to you that we must play this game today. Give my thanks to Colonel Gomez. I am very sorry. The Spaniard bowed and went back. Morosa chuckled. Just like the Russians in the first years. Stuck to their titles and manners as if they were life preservers. What friendly service did you render to this hot and tot? Once I prescribed a laxative for him. The Latin people have a high regard for good digestion. Morosa winked to traffic. The old weakness of democracy. A fascist in the same situation would have prescribed arsenic for a democrat. The Spaniard returned. My name is Navarro, first lieutenant, he declared with the heavy earnestness of a man who has drunk too much and does not know it. I am the aide de camp of Colonel Gomez. The Colonel is leaving Paris tonight. He is going to Spain to join the glorious army of Generalissimo Franco. That's why he would like to drink with you to Spain's freedom and to Spain's army. Lieutenant Navarro, Ravik said briefly, I'm not a Spaniard. We know that. You are a German. Navarro showed the shadow of a conspiratorial smile. That's just the reason for Colonel Gomez's wish. Germany and Spain are friends. Ravik looked at Morosau. The irony of the situation was marked. Morosau kept from smiling. Lieutenant Navarro, he said, I regret that I must insist on finishing this game with Dr. Ravik. The results must be cabled to New York and Calcutta tonight. Sir, Navarro replied coldly, we expected you to decline. Russia is Spain's enemy. The invitation was directed to Dr. Ravik only. We had to invite you too since you were with him. Morosau placed a knight he had won on his huge flat hand and looked at Travik. Don't you think there has been enough of this buffoonery? Yes. Ravik turned around. I think the simplest thing is that you go back, young man. You have needlessly insulted Colonel Morosau, who is an enemy of the Soviets. He bent over the chessboard without waiting for an answer. Navarro stood undecided for a moment. Then he left. I don't know whether you noticed that I have just promoted you to the rank of Colonel, Boris, Ravik said. As far as I know you were a miserable Lieutenant Colonel. But it seemed unbearable to me that you shouldn't have the same military rank as this Gomez. Don't talk so much, old boy. I've just messed up Alekhine's variant because of these interruptions. That bishop seems to be lost. Morosau looked up. My God. Here comes another one. Another aide de camp. What a people. It is Colonel Gomez himself. Ravik leaned back comfortably. This will be a discussion between two colonels. Short one, my son. The colonel was even more formal than Navarro. He apologized to Morosau because of his aide de camp error. The apology was accepted. Now Gomez invited them to drink together to Franco as a sign of reconciliation since all obstacles had been removed. This time Ravik refused. But sir, as a German and an ally, the colonel was obviously confused. Colonel Gomez, said Ravik, who was gradually becoming impatient, leave the situation as it is. Drink to whomever you like and I'll play chess. The colonel tried to puzzle it out. Then you are a. You'd better make no statements, Morosau interrupted him briefly. It would only lead to conflict. Gomez became more and more confused. 
but you as a white Russian and an officer of the Tsar must be against. We don't have to be anything at all. We are old fashioned creatures. We have different political opinions and, nevertheless, don't break each other's skulls. Finally, it seemed to dawn upon Gomez. He stiffened. I see, he declared sharply. Decadent democratic. My friend, Morosau said, suddenly becoming dangerous, get out. You should have got out years ago. To Spain. To fight. Germans and Italians fought for you there instead. And you. He got up. Gomez took one step back. He stared at Morosau, disconcerted. Then he abruptly turned around and went back to his table. Morosau sat down again. He sighed and rang for the waitress. Bring us two double Galvados, Clarisse. Clarisse nodded and disappeared. Stout, soldierly souls. Ravik laughed. A simple mind and a complicated conception of honor make life very difficult when one is drunk, Boris. That I see. Here comes the next one already. Who is it this time? Frankie himself? It was Navarro. He stopped two steps away from the table and addressed Morosau. Colonel Gomez regrets to be unable to present his challenge. He is leaving Paris tonight. Besides, his mission is too important to risk difficulties with the police. He turned toward Dravik. Colonel Gomez still owes you the fee for a consultation. He threw a folded five franc bill on the table and was about to turn away. One moment, Morosau said. Clarisse was just then at his side with a tray. He took a glass of Calvados, briefly contemplated it, shook his head, and put it back. Then he took one of the water glasses from the tray and negligently tossed it in Navarro's face. That's to sober you up, he declared calmly. Remember in the future that one doesn't throw money. And now get away from here, you medieval idiot. Navarro stood still in astonishment. He dried his face. The other Spaniards approached. There were four of them. Morosau got up slowly. He was more than a head taller than the Spaniards. Ravik remained sitting. He looked at Gomez. Don't make yourself ridiculous, you comic opera characters, he said. None of you is sober. Within a few minutes you'll be lying here with broken bones. Even if you were sober you would stand no chance. He got up seized Navarro by the elbows, lifted him, and put him down so near to Gomez that Gomez had to step aside. And now leave us alone. We did not ask you to annoy us. He took the five franc bill from the table and put it on the tray. That's for you, Clarisse. From these gentlemen here. The first time I ever got anything from them, Clarisse declared. Thanks. Gomez said something in Spanish. The five turned around and went back to their table. It's a pity, Morosau said. I'd have liked to beat up those fellows. Sorry that it can't be done because of you, you illegal foundling. Don't you sometimes regret that you can't do it? Not with those. There are others I'd like to get hold of. A few words in Spanish became audible from the table in the corner. The five rose. A threefold viva resounded. The glasses were set down clinking. There was the sound of one breaking. Then the martial group filed out of the room. I almost threw this good Galvados in his face. Morosa took the glass and emptied it. And that's the sort that governs Europe now. Were we two such fools once? Yes, Ravik said. They played for an hour. Then Morosa looked up. There is Charles, he said. He seems to be looking for you. The boy from the concierge's box was coming toward them. He held a little package in his hand. This was left for you, he said to Ravik. For me? Ravik examined the package. It was small and wrapped in white tissue paper, tied with a string. There was no address on it. I'm not expecting any packages. It must be a mistake. Who brought it? A woman, a lady. The boy stammered. A woman or a lady? Morosau asked. Just, just in between. Morosau grinned. Pretty sharp. There's no name on it. 
Did she say it was for me? Not just like that. Not your name. She said it was for the doctor who lives here. And, you know the lady. Did she say that? No, the boy blurted. But the other night she was with you. From time to time ladies do come in with me, Ravik said. But you should know that the first virtue of a hotel employee is discretion. Indiscretion is only for cavaliers of the great world. Go ahead and open the package, Ravik, Morosau said. Even if it isn't for you. We've done worse in our deplorable lives. Ravik laughed and opened it. He unwrapped a small object. It was the wooden Madonna he had seen in the room of the woman. He tried to remember, what was her name question mark Madeline, mad, he had forgotten it. A name something like that. He examined the tissue paper, there was no slip in it. All right, he said to the boy. It's for me. He placed the Madonna on the table. It looked strange among the chessmen. A Russian? Morosau asked. No. I thought so, too, at first. Ravik noticed that the red of the lipstick had been washed off. What on earth shall I do with it? Put it anywhere. Many things can be put just anywhere. There's plenty of room for everything in this world. Only not for human beings. They will have buried the man meanwhile. Is she the one? Yes. Did you ever bother to see her again? No. Strange, Morosau said, we always think we've helped and yet we stop just when it's hardest for the other. I'm no charitable institution, Boris. And I have seen worse than that and done nothing. Why should it be harder for her now? Because now she's alone. Up to now the man was there even though he was dead. He was above the earth. Now he's below it, gone, not here anymore. This Morosau pointed at the Madonna, is not thanks. It is a cry for help. I slept with her. Without knowing what had happened. I want to forget that. Nonsense. It is the least important thing in the world as long as there is no love in it. I knew a woman who said it was easier to sleep with a man than to call him by his first name. Morosau leaned forward. His large bald head reflected the light. I will tell you something, Ravik, we ought to be friendly to people if we can and as long as we possibly can because we're still going to commit a few so-called crimes in our lives. At least I will. And probably you too. Yes. Morosau put his arm around the pot containing the meager palm. It trembled slightly. We all feed on one another. Such occasional little sparks of kindliness, that's something one shouldn't allow to be taken away. It strengthens one for a difficult life. All right, I'll go to see her tomorrow. Fine, Morosau said. That's what I meant. And now stop talking so much. Who has white? Five. The patron recognized Dravik immediately. The lady is in her room, he said. Can you call her and say that I am downstairs? Her room has no telephone yet. I am sure you may go up. What is the number? 27. I don't remember her name. What is it? The patron showed no surprise. Mud. Joan Mud, he added. I don't think it is her real name. Probably a stage name. Why stage name? She registered as an actress. It sounds like it, doesn't it? I don't know. I knew an actor who called himself Gustav Schmidt. In reality his name was Alexander Maria Count of Zambona. Gustav Schmidt was his stage name. Didn't sound like one, did it? The patron would not concede defeat. Nowadays so many things happen, he declared philosophically. So much doesn't actually happen. When you study history you'll find that we are living in a relatively calm era. Thanks, it's enough for me. For me too. But one has to find consolation wherever one can. Number 27, you said. Yes, sir. Ravik knocked. No one answered. He knocked once more and heard an indistinct voice. When he opened the door he saw the woman. She was sitting on the bed, which stood against the partition wall. 
She was dressed and wore the blue tailored suit in which Ravik had first seen her. She would have looked less forlorn had she been lying somewhere, negligently attired in a dressing gown. But this way, dressed by no one and nothing, out of mere habit which now had no meaning, there was something about her that touched Travick's heart. He was familiar with it, he had seen hundreds of people sitting this way, refugees driven helplessly into foreign countries. A little island of uncertain existence, that was how they sat, not knowing where to go and only habit kept them alive. He closed the door behind him. I hope I'm not disturbing you, he said and at once felt how meaningless the words were. What was there that could still disturb this woman? There was nothing that could disturb her. He put his hat on a chair. Were you able to settle everything? He asked. Yes. There wasn't much. No trouble? No. Ravik sat down in the only armchair in the room. The springs squeaked and he could feel that one was broken. Did you intend to go out? He asked. Yes. Some time later. Nowhere in particular, just to go. What else can one do? Nothing. That's right, for a few days. Don't you know anyone in Paris? No. No one? The woman raised her head with a tired movement. No one, except you, the patron, the waiter, and the chambermaid. She smiled faintly. That's not many, is it? No. Did Mr. Ravik try to remember the name of the dead man? He had forgotten it. No, the woman said. Razinsky had friends here, but I've never seen them. He fell ill as soon as we arrived. Ravik had not intended to stay long. Now, seeing the woman sitting that way, he changed his mind. Have you had dinner already? He asked. No. I am not hungry. Have you eaten anything at all today? Yes. This noon. It's easier during the day. In the evening. Ravik looked around. The small bare room smelled of cheerlessness and November. It's time you get out of here, he said. Come. We'll go and have something to eat. He expected the woman to object. She seemed so indifferent that nothing could arouse her. But she stood up at once and reached for her raincoat. That won't do, he said. The coat is too thin. Haven't you a warmer one? It is cold outside. It was raining before. It is still raining. But it is cold. Can't you put something on underneath? Another coat or at least a sweater? I have a sweater. She went toward the larger suitcase. Ravik noted that she had hardly unpacked anything. She got a black sweater out of the suitcase, took her jacket off, and pulled on the sweater. She had beautiful straight shoulders. Then she took the basque beret and put on her jacket and coat. Is this better? Much better. They went down the stairs. The patron was no longer there. In his stead the concierge sat beside the keyboard. He was sorting letters and smelled of garlic. A spotted cat sat motionless beside him and watched him. Do you still have the feeling that you can't eat anything? Ravik asked outside. I don't know. Not much, I think. Ravik hailed a taxi. Well, then we'll drive to the Bell Aurore. One doesn't have to eat a full dinner there. The Bell Aurore was not crowded. It was already too late for that. They found a table in the small upstairs room with the low ceiling. Besides them, there was only one couple, sitting by the window and eating cheese, and a solitary thin man, with a mountain of oysters in front of him. The waiter came and eyed the checked tablecloth critically. Then he decided to change it. Two vodkas, Ravik ordered. Cold. We'll drink something and eat hors d'oeuvre, he said to the woman. I think that's best for you. This restaurant is famous for its hors d'oeuvre. There's hardly anything else here. Anyhow you seldom get to eat anything else. There are dozens of them, warm and cold, and they're all very good. We'll try them. The waiter brought the vodka and got his pad ready. A carafe of Van Rose, Ravik said. Have you Anju? Anju, open, Rose. 
Very well, sir. Fine. A large carafe in ice. And the hors d'oeuvre. The waiter left. At the door he almost collided with a woman in a red feathered hat, who was rushing up the stairs. She pushed him aside and approached the thin man with the oysters. Albert, she said. You swine. S.H. S.H. Albert gestured and turned around. Don't S.H. S.H. me. The woman put her wet umbrella across the table and sat down determinedly. Albert did not seem to be surprised. Cheery, he said and began to whisper. Ravik smiled and lifted his glass. We'll drink this straight down. Salute. Salute, Joan Mud said and drank. The hors d'oeuvre were rolled in on a small wagon. What would you like? Ravik looked at the woman. I think it will be simplest if I fill a plate for you. He piled a plate full and handed it to her. It won't matter if you don't like any of it. There are more wagons to come. This is just the beginning. He filled a plate for himself and began to eat, not concerning himself further about her. Suddenly he felt very hungry. When he looked up after a while he saw that she too was eating. He shelled a Langstein and held it out to her. Try this. It's better than Langst. And now the pate maison. With a crust of white bread. So, that's not bad at all. And a little of the wine with it light, dry, and cool. You are going to a lot of trouble for me, Joan Mudd said. Yes, like a head waiter. Ravik laughed. No. But you are going to a lot of trouble for me. I don't like to eat alone. That's all there is to it. Just like you. I'm not a good companion. You are, Ravik replied. For dining, you are. For dining you are a first-rate companion. I can't bear garrulous people. Or those with loud voices. He looked across the room toward Albert. The red-feathered hat was just explaining to him very audibly why he was such a swine, at the same time rhythmically rapping on the table with her umbrella. Albert was listening and did not seem impressed. Joan Mud smiled briefly. Neither can I. Here comes the next wagon with supplies. Would you like to have something at once or do you want a cigarette first? A cigarette first? All right. Today I have different cigarettes, not those with black tobacco. He gave her a light. She leaned back and inhaled the smoke deeply. Then she looked straight at him. It is good to sit this way, she said and for a moment it seemed to him that she was going to cry. They drank coffee in the Kalaisi. The large room facing the Champs Elysees was overcrowded, but they secured a table downstairs in the bar. The upper part of the walls was glass behind which parrots and cockatoos hovered and multicolored tropical birds soared to and fro. Have you thought about what you are going to do? Ravik asked. No, not yet. Did you have anything definite in mind when you came here? The woman hesitated. No, nothing in particular. I'm not asking out of curiosity. I know that. You think I should do something. That's what I want, too. I say so to myself every day. But then. The landlord told me you were an actress. I didn't ask him. He told me when I asked for your name. Had you forgotten it? Ravik glanced up. She looked at him calmly. Yes, he said. I left the slip of paper in my hotel and couldn't recall it at the moment. Do you know it now? Yes. Joan Mudd. I'm not a good actress, the woman said. I only played small parts. Nothing at all in the last few years. Also I don't speak French well enough. What do you speak then? Italian. I was brought up in Italy and some English and Romanian. My father was Romanian. He is dead. My mother is British, she is still living in Italy, I don't know where. Ravik only half listened. He was bored and he no longer knew what to talk about. Have you done anything else? He asked, just for the sake of asking. Besides those small parts you played? Only what went with them. Some dancing and singing. 
Ravik looked at her doubtfully. She didn't seem suited for that. There was something pale and vague about her and she was not attractive. That may be easy to try here, he said. For that you need not speak perfectly. No. But first I have to find something. It is difficult if one doesn't know anyone. Morosau, Ravik suddenly thought. The Shaherazada. Naturally. Morosau ought to know about such things. The idea revived him. Morosau had dragged him into this dull evening, now the woman could be passed on to him and Boris would have a chance to show what he could do. Do you know Russian? he asked. A little. A few songs. Gypsy songs. They are similar to Romanian ones. Why? I know someone who knows about these things. Maybe he can help you. I'll give you his address. I don't think there's much point to it. Agents are the same everywhere. Recommendations are of little help. Ravik realized she thought he wanted to get rid of her in the easiest way. Since that was so, he protested. The man I mean is not an agent. He is the doorman of the Shahrazada. That's a Russian nightclub on Montmartre. Doorman? Joan Mud lifted her head. That is something else, she said. Doormen are much better informed than agents. That may be something. Do you know him well? Ravik looked at her in surprise. Suddenly she had spoken like a professional. He is a friend of mine, he said. His name is Boris Morosau and he has been with the Shuherazada for the last ten years. There's always a pretty big show. They change the numbers frequently. He's on good terms with the manager. If there's no spot for you in the Shahrazada, he will be sure to know of something else. Will you try it? Yes. When? It would be best around nine o'clock in the evening. He's not busy then and he will have time for you. I'll tell him about it. Ravik looked forward to seeing Morosau's face. Suddenly he felt better. The slight burden of responsibility he had still felt had disappeared. He had done what he could and now it was up to her. Are you tired? He asked. Joan Mud looked straight into his eyes. I'm not tired, she said. But I know that it is no pleasure to sit here with me. You came out of pity and I thank you for it. You took me out of my room and you spoke to me. That means a great deal to me, since I've hardly spoken to anyone for days. Now I'll go. You have done more than enough for me. What would have become of me otherwise? My God, Ravik thought, now she is starting that. He looked uncomfortably at the glass wall before him. A fat dove was trying to ravish a cockatoo. The cockatoo was so bored that she did not even shake him off. She merely went on eating and ignored him. It was not pity. What else? The dove gave it up. He hopped down from the broad back of the cockatoo and began to clean his feathers. The cockatoo indifferently lifted her tail and defecated. We'll both drink a cognac now, Ravik said. That's the best answer. But believe me I'm not really such a philanthropist. There are many evenings when I sit around by myself. Do you consider that particularly interesting? No, but I'm a bad partner. That's worse. I've given up looking for partners. Here's your cognac. Salute. Salute. Ravik put his glass down. So. And now we'll leave this menagerie. You wouldn't like to go back to your hotel, would you? Joan Mud shook her head. All right. Then let's go somewhere else. Let's go to the Shaherazada. We'll have a drink there, we both seem to need it and at the same time you can find out what's going on there. It was almost three o'clock in the morning. They stood in front of the Hotel de Milan. Have you had enough to drink? Ravik asked. Joan Mud hesitated. I thought I had enough when I was there, in the Shaherazada. But now here, looking at this door, it wasn't enough. Something can be done about that. Maybe we can still get something here in the hotel. Otherwise we'll go to some bar and buy a bottle. Come. She looked at him. Then she looked at the door. Very well, she said with determination. 
Yet she continued to stand there. To go up there, she said, in that empty room. I'll go with you. And we'll take a bottle with us. The doorman woke up. Have you anything to drink? Ravik asked. Champagne cocktail. The doorman asked immediately, business like, but still yawning. Thank you. Something stronger. Cognac, a bottle. Corvoisia, martel, Hennessy, biscuit tubo, chi? Corvoisia. Very well, sir. I'll take the cork out and bring the bottle up. They walked upstairs. Have you got your key? Ravik asked the woman. The room is not locked. Your money and your papers might be stolen if you don't lock it. That could happen even if I locked it. That's true with these keys. Although it isn't quite as easy then. Maybe. But I don't want to come in alone from outside and take a key and open a door in order to enter an empty room, that's as if I were opening a tomb. It is enough already to have to enter this room, in which nothing awaits one but a few suitcases. Nothing awaits us anywhere, Ravik said. We always have to bring everything with us. That may be. But there is at least sometimes a merciful illusion. Here there's nothing. Joan Mud flung her basque beret and coat on the bed and looked at Ravik. Her eyes were light and large in her pale face and as though fixed in a furious desperation. She stood thus for a moment. Then she began to walk in the small room back and forth, with long strides, hands in the pockets of her jacket, resiliently swinging her body when she turned. Ravik watched her attentively. Suddenly she had strength and a cat-like grace, and the room seemed much too narrow for her. There was a knock. The doorman brought in the cognac. Would the lady and gentleman care to eat something? He asked. Cold chicken, a sandwich. That would be a waste of time, brother. Ravik paid and shoved him out of the room. Then he poured two glasses full. Here. It is simple and barbaric, but the more primitive the better in difficult situations. Refinement is something for quiet times. Drink this. And then? Then you will drink another. I have tried that. It didn't help. It is not good to be drunk when one is alone. Things just become sharper. One only has to be drunk enough. Then it works. Ravik sat on a narrow wobbly chaise long which stood by the wall opposite the bed. He hadn't seen it before. Was this here when you moved in? He asked. She shook her head. I had it put there. I didn't like to sleep in the bed. It seemed so pointless. A bed and to have to undress and all that. What for? Mornings and in the daytime it was somehow possible. But nights. You must have something to do. Ravik lit a cigarette. It's too bad we didn't meet Morosau in the Scheherazade. I didn't know that today was his day off. Do go there tomorrow night. About nine o'clock. I'm sure he'll find something for you. Even if it's work in the kitchen then at least you would be busy at night. That's what you want, isn't it? Yes. Joan Mud stopped walking. She drank her glass of cognac and sat down on the bed. I've walked about, outside, every night. As long as one walks everything is easier. Only when one sits down and the ceiling falls on one's head. Didn't anything ever happen to you on the street? Nothing stolen? No. I probably don't look as if I had anything one could steal. She held her empty glass out to Ravik. And as for the other, I waited for it often enough. At least to have someone speak to me. To be something more than mere nothing, mere walking. That at least eyes would look at one, eyes and not just stones. That one would not run around like an outcast. Like someone on a strange planet. She threw her hair back and took the glass that Ravik handed her. I don't know why I'm talking about it, she said. I don't want to. Maybe it is because I was silent all those days. Maybe because today for the first time, she interrupted herself. Don't listen to me. I'm drinking, Ravik said. Say whatever you want. It is night. 
No one hears you. I am listening to myself. Everything will be forgotten by tomorrow. He leaned back. Somewhere in the house there was the sound of rushing water. The radiator rattled and the rain knocked with soft fingers at the window. When one comes back and switches off the light, and the darkness falls on one like chloroform on a wad of cotton, and one turns on the light again and stares and stares. I must be drunk already, Ravik thought. Earlier than usual today. Or it may be the faint light. Or both. This is not the same insignificant, faded woman any longer. This is someone else. Suddenly there are eyes. There is a face. Something is looking at me. It must be the shadows. The soft fire behind my forehead that is illuminating her. The first glow of drunkenness. He did not listen to what Joan had said. He knew about all that and no longer wanted to know about it. To be alone, the eternal refrain of life. It wasn't better or worse than anything else. One talked too much about it. One was always and never alone. A violin, suddenly, somewhere out of a twilight, in a garden on the hills around Budapest. The heavy scent of chestnuts. The wind. And dreams crouched on one's shoulders like young owls, their eyes becoming lighter in the dusk. A night that never became night. The hour when all women were beautiful. He looked up. Thank you. Joan Mudd said. Why? Because you've let me talk without listening. It helped me. I needed it. Ravik nodded. He noticed that her glass was empty again. All right, he said. I'll leave the bottle here for you. He got up. A room. A woman. Nothing else. A pale face in which there was no longer any radiance. Do you really want to go? Joan Mudd asked. She looked around as if someone were hidden in the room. Here is Morosau's address. His name, so that you won't forget it. Tomorrow night at nine. Ravik wrote it on a prescription pad. Then he tore the sheet off and put it on the suitcase. Joan Mud had got up. She reached for her coat and beret. Ravik looked at her. You needn't see me down. I don't mean to do that. I just don't want to stay here. Not now. I want to walk around somewhere. But you'll have to come back again later anyhow. The same thing all over again. Why don't you stay here? Now that you've already overcome it. It will be morning soon. When I come back it will be morning. Then it will be easier. Ravik went to the window. It was still raining. Streamers, wet and grey, drifted with the wind around the yellow halos of the street lamp. Come, he said, we'll have another drink and then you'll go to bed. This is no weather for walking. He picked up the bottle. Suddenly Joan Mudd was close at his side. Don't leave me here, she said quickly and urgently, and he felt her breath. Don't leave me here alone, tonight. I don't know why, but not tonight. Tomorrow I'll have courage but tonight I can't be alone, I'm weary and weak and spent. I have no strength left, you shouldn't have taken me out, not tonight, I can't be alone now. Ravik carefully put the bottle on the table and loosened her hands from his arm. Child, he said, we have to get used to everything sometime. He glanced at the chaise long. I could sleep on that. There is no point in going anywhere else now. I need a few hours sleep. I have to operate at nine in the morning. I could sleep here just as well as at my own place. It wouldn't be my first night watch. Would that do? She nodded. She was still standing close beside him. I must be out by 7.30. Damn early. It will wake you up. That doesn't matter. I'll get up and make breakfast for you, everything. Nothing of the sort, Ravik said. I'll have my breakfast in some cafe like a sensible working man coffee with rum and croissants. I can do everything else in the hospital. It will delight me to ask Eugenie for a bath. All right, let's stay here. Two lost souls in November. You take the bed. If you like I can go down and stay with the old doorman till you're ready. No, Joan Mudd said. I won't run away. 
besides we'll need some things. Pillows, blankets, and such. I can ring for him. I can do that myself. Ravik looked for the button. It's better if a man does it. The doorman came quickly. He had another bottle of cognac in his hand. You overrators, Ravik said. Many thanks. We belong to the post-war generation. A blanket, a pillow, and some sheets. I've got to sleep here. Too cold and too much rain outside. I had a bad case of pneumonia and it's only two days since I left bed. Could you arrange that? Naturally, sir. I thought something of the sort myself. All right. Ravik lit a cigarette. I'll go out into the hall. I'll look at the shoes in front of the doors. That's an old hobby of mine. I won't run away, he said, noticing Joan Mud's expression. I'm not Joseph of Egypt. I'll not leave my coat behind. The doorman returned with the things. He stopped abruptly when he saw Ravik standing in the hall. Then his face brightened. It's not often one sees anything like that, he said. I rarely do it myself. Only on birthdays and Christmas. Let me have those things. I'll take them inside. What's that? A hot water bottle. Because of your pneumonia. Excellent. But I keep my lungs warm with cognac. Ravik pulled a few bills out of his pocket. I'm sure you have no pajamas, sir. I could get you a pair. Thanks, brother. Ravik looked at the old man. They'd certainly be too small for me. On the contrary, they would fit you. They are perfectly new. Confidentially, an American once gave them to me as a gift. He had received them from a lady. I don't wear such things. I wear night shirts. They are perfectly new, sir. All right, bring them up. Let's have a look at them. Ravik waited in the hall. Three pairs of shoes stood before the doors. A pair of high boots with stretchable elastic sides. Thunderous snores emerged from the room behind. The others were a pair of brown men's shoes and a pair of high buttoned patent leather shoes. They both stood in front of one door and seemed strangely forlorn although they were together. The doorman brought the pajamas. They were marvelous pajamas. Blue artificial silk with gold stars on them. Ravik contemplated them for a while, speechless. He understood the American. Magnificent, aren't they? The doorman asked proudly. The pajamas were new. They were still in the box of the Grand's Magazines du Louvre where they had been bought. It's a pity, Ravik said. I'd like to have seen the lady who chose them. You may have them for tonight. You don't have to buy them, sir. How much do I owe you? Whatever you think. Ravik drew his hand from his pocket. This is too much, sir, the doorman said. Aren't you a Frenchman? I am. From Saint Nazaire. Then you've been spoiled by the Americans. Besides, nothing is too much for those pajamas. I'm glad you like them. Good night, sir. I'll call on the lady for them tomorrow. I'll return them myself tomorrow morning. Wake me at 7.30. But not quietly. I'll hear you. Good night. Look at that, Ravik said to Joan Mudd, showing her the pajamas. A costume for Santa Claus. This doorman is a magician. I'll even put the things on. It takes both courage and unselfconsciousness to be ridiculous. He arranged the blankets on the chaise long. It didn't matter to him whether he slept in his hotel or here. In the hall he had seen a passable bathroom and had got a new toothbrush from the doorman. All the other things didn't matter. The woman was somehow like a patient. He filled a tumbler with cognac and set it at the bedside with one of the small glasses the doorman had brought. I think that will be enough for you, he said. It's simpler this way. I won't need to get up and refill it. I'll take the bottle and the other glass over here with me. I don't need the small glass. I can drink from the other. That's even better. Ravik arranged himself on the chaise long. He was glad the woman wasn't fussing about whether he was comfortable. She had what she wanted.
Thank God, she wasn't displaying any superfluous housewifely qualities. He filled his glass and put the bottle on the floor. Salute. Salute. Joan Mudd said. And thanks. That's all right. I wasn't in the mood for walking in the rain anyway. Is it still raining? Yes. The gentle knocking penetrated the quiet on the outside, as though something wanted to come in, grey, cheerless, and formless, something that was sadder than sadness, a remote anonymous memory, an endless wave drifting in toward them and trying to take back and bury what it had once washed up on an island and forgotten, a little bit of humankind and light and thought. A good night for drinking. Yes, and a bad night for being alone. Ravik remained silent for a while. We have to get used to it, he said then. All that held things together before is now destroyed. Today we have fallen apart like a necklace of glass beads whose string is broken. Nothing is solid anymore. He refilled his glass. As a boy I slept in a meadow one night. It was summer and the sky was very clear. Before I fell asleep I saw Orion on the horizon, standing above the woods. Then I woke up in the middle of the night, and suddenly Orion was standing high above me. I have never forgotten that. I had learned that the earth is a planet and rotates, but I had learned it as one learns something from books and does not quite realize. But now, for the first time I felt that it really was like that. I felt that the earth was silently flying through the immensities of space. I felt it so strongly that I almost believed I had to hold on to something in order not to be hurled off. Probably it happened because, emerging from a deep sleep and bereft for a moment of memory and habit, I looked into the huge, displaced sky. Suddenly the earth was no longer firm, and since then it has never become wholly firm again. He emptied his glass. It makes some things more difficult and others easier. He looked at Joan Mudd. I don't know how far you've gone. When you are tired enough, just don't answer any more. Not yet. Soon. There's a spot somewhere that is still awake. Awake and cold. Ravik put the bottle down on the floor beside him. From the warmth of the room a brown tiredness trickled slowly into him. The shadows came. The flapping of wings. A strange room, night, and outside like remote drums the monotonous beating of the rain, a hut and a little light on the verge of chaos, a small fire in a meaningless wilderness, an unknown face toward which one spoke. Have you ever felt that, too? he asked. She remained silent a while. Yes. Not exactly. Differently. When for days I had not spoken to anyone and walked for nights, and there were people everywhere who belonged somewhere, who were going somewhere, who were at home somewhere. Only I wasn't. Then everything slowly became unreal, as if I were drowned and walking through a strange city underwater. Outside someone came up the stairs. Keys jingled and a door clicked shut. Immediately afterwards water gushed from a faucet. Why do you stay in Paris if you don't know anyone? Ravik asked. He felt that he was getting very sleepy. I don't know. Where else shall I go? Haven't you any place to go back to? No. One cannot go back. The wind chased a shower of drops across the window. Why did you come to Paris? Ravik asked. Joan Mud did not answer. He thought she had already fallen asleep. Razzinski and I came to Paris because we wanted to separate, she said then. Ravik heard it without surprise. There were hours when nothing surprised one. In the room opposite, the man who had just come in began to vomit. They heard his muffled gasps through the door. Then why were you so desperate? Ravik asked. Because he was dead. Dead. Suddenly he was no more. Never to be called back again. Dead. No chance to make things right. Don't you understand? Joan Mud sat up in bed and stared at Ravik. Yes, he said and thought, it is not true. Not because he was dead. Because he left you before you could leave him. Because he left you alone before you were ready. I, I should have been different to him, I was. 
Forget it. Regret is the most useless thing in the world. One cannot recall anything. And one cannot rectify anything. Otherwise we would all be saints. Life did not intend to make us perfect. Whoever is perfect belongs in the museum. Joan Mud did not answer. Ravik watched her drink and lie back on her pillow. There was still something, but he was too tired to think about it. Besides, it made no difference to him. He wanted to sleep. Tomorrow he had to operate. All this no longer concerned him. He put the empty glass on the floor next to the bottle. Strange where one sometimes gets oneself, he thought. 6. Lucine Martinet was sitting by the window when Rava came in. How does it feel, he asked, to be out of bed for the first time? The girl looked at him and then out at the grey afternoon and back at Ravik. Not very good weather today, he said. It is, she replied. For me it is. Why? Because I don't have to go out. She sat crouched in her chair, a cheap cotton kimono with poppies on it drawn around her shoulders, a slender insignificant being with poor teeth, but to Ravik she was for the moment more beautiful than Helen of Troy. She was a piece of life he had rescued with his own hands. It was nothing to be particularly proud of, one he had lost shortly before, the next he might lose, two, and in the end one lost all of them and oneself too. But this girl, for the moment, was saved. It's no fun to drag around hats in weather like this, Lucine said. Did you deliver hats? Yes. For Madame Lanvert. That shop in the Avenue Matignon. We had to work until five. Then I had to deliver hat boxes to the customers. Now it is 5.30. By this time I would be on my way. She looked out of the window. Too bad it isn't raining harder. It was better yesterday. It poured. Now someone else has to go through it. Ravik sat down opposite her on a seat by the window. Strange, he thought. One always expects people to be unreservedly happy after escaping death. They hardly ever are. Nor is this one. A minor miracle happened to her and the only thing that interests her about it is that she doesn't have to walk through the rain. How did you happen to come to just this hospital, Lucin? He asked. She looked at him warily. Someone told me about it. Who? An acquaintance. What acquaintance? The girl hesitated. An acquaintance who was here, too. I brought her here. Up to the door. That's why I knew about it. When was that? A week before I came. Was it the one who died during the operation? Yes. And nevertheless you came here? Yes, Lucine said indifferently. Why not? Ravik did not say what he had intended to say. He looked into the small cold face that had once been soft and that life had so quickly made hard. Did you go to the same midwife, too? he asked. Lucine did not answer. Or to the same doctor? You needn't be afraid of telling me. After all I don't know who it was. Mary went the first. A week earlier. Ten days earlier. And you went the later in spite of the fact that you knew what had happened to her? Lucine raised her shoulders. What could I do? I had to risk it. I didn't know of anyone else. A child, what would I do with a child? She looked out of the window again. On a balcony opposite stood a man in suspenders, holding an umbrella. How much longer will I have to stay here, doctor? About one week. One week more? That's not long. Why? It costs and costs. Maybe we can make it a day or two less. Do you think I can pay it off in installments? I haven't enough money. It is expensive, thirty francs a day. Who told you that? The nurse. Which one? Eugenie of course. Yes. She said the operation and the bandages would cost extra. Is that very expensive? You have paid for the operation. The nurse said it hadn't been nearly enough. The nurse doesn't know much about that, Lucine. You'd better ask Dr. Weber later. 
I'd like to know soon. Why? Then I can plan the length of time I'll have to work to pay it off. Lucine looked at her hands. Her fingers were thin and pricked. I've another month's rent to pay, she said. When I came here, it was the 13th. I should have given notice on the 15th. Now I shall have to pay for another month. For nothing. Haven't you got anyone to help you? Lucine glanced up. Suddenly her face seemed ten years older. You know about that yourself, doctor. He was just angry. He didn't know I was so ignorant. Otherwise he wouldn't have had anything to do with me. Ravik nodded. Things like this weren't new to him. Lucine, he said, we could try to get something from the woman who did the abortion. It was her fault. All you need do is to give us her name. The girl straightened up quickly. Suddenly she was all resistance. Police? No. Then I'd get mixed up in it myself. Without police. We would only threaten. She laughed bitterly. You won't get anything from her that way. She is made of iron. I had to pay her 300 francs. And for that, she smoothed her kimono. Some people just haven't any luck, she said without resignation as if she spoke of someone else and not of herself. On the contrary, Ravik replied. You had a lot of luck. He saw Eugenie in the operating room. She was polishing nickel-plated instruments. It was one of her hobbies. She was so absorbed in her work that she did not hear him coming. Eugenie, he said. She turned around, startled. Oh you! Do you always have to frighten people? I don't think I have that much personality. But you shouldn't frighten the patients with your stories about fees and costs. Eugenie drew herself up, the polishing rags in her hand. Naturally that whore had to blab right away. Eugenie, Ravik said, there are more whores among women who have never slept with a man than among those who make their difficult living that way. Not to mention the married ones. Besides, the girl wasn't blabbing. You just spoiled the day for her. That's all. What of it? Sensitive and leading that sort of life. You walking moral catechism, Ravik thought. You disgusting model of conscious virtue, what do you know of the forlornness of this little milliner who courageously went to the same midwife who had ruined her friend, and to the same hospital in which the other had died? and who has nothing to say except, what else could I have done? And, how can I pay for it? You should marry, Eugenie, he said. A widower with children. Or the owner of a funeral parlor. Mr. Ravik, the nurse replied with dignity, will you kindly not concern yourself with my private affairs? Otherwise I'll have to complain to Dr. Weber. You do that anyway all day long. Ravik was pleased to see two red spots appear over her cheekbones. Why are pious people so rarely loyal, Eugenie? Cynics have the best character, idealists are the least bearable. Doesn't that make you think? Thank God, no. That's what I thought. I am going now to the children of sin. To the Osiris. Just in case Dr. Weber should need me. I hardly think Dr. Weber will need you. Virginity does not quite bestow clairvoyance. He might need me. I'll be there until about five. Then at my hotel. Nice hotel, that den of Jews. Ravik turned around. Eugenie, all refugees are not Jews. Not even all Jews are Jews. And many of whom you wouldn't believe it are Jews. I even knew a Jewish Negro once. He was a terribly lonely man. The only thing he loved was Chinese food. That's how life is. The nurse did not answer. She was polishing a nickel plate that was completely spotless. Ravik was sitting in the bistro on the Rue Boise ear, staring through the rainy windows when he saw the man. It was like a blow in the solar plexus. In the first moment he felt only the shock without realizing what it was, but in the next second he had pushed the table aside jumped from his seat, and thrust himself ruthlessly toward the door through the crowded place. Someone caught him by the arm and held on to him. 
He turned around. What? He asked uncomprehendingly. What? It was the waiter. You did not pay, sir. What question mark oh yes, I'll be back. He pulled his arm free. The waiter flushed. We don't allow that here. You have to. Here. Ravik pulled a bill out of his pocket, flung it at the waiter, and thrust the door open. He pushed past a group of people and ran around the corner to the right, along the Rue Boise ear. Someone yelled behind him. He recollected himself, stopped running, and walked on as quickly as he could without being conspicuous. It is impossible, he thought, it is absolutely impossible, I must be mad, it is impossible. The face, that face, it must be a resemblance, some kind of damned devilish resemblance, an idiotic trick played by my nerves, it cannot be in Paris, that face, it is in Germany, it is in Berlin, the window was swept by rain, one couldn't see through it clearly, I must have been mistaken, certainly. He pushed himself through the crowd letting out from a movie, hastily, searching every face he passed, he peered beneath hats, he met irritated and astonished looks, he went on, on, other faces, other hats, grey, black, blue, he passed them, he turned back, he stared at them. He stopped at the intersection of the Avenue Kleber. He suddenly remembered, a woman, a woman with a poodle, and immediately behind her he had seen that man. He had long since passed the woman with the poodle. Quickly he walked back. Seeing the woman with the dog from a distance, he stopped at the curb. He clenched his fists in his pockets, and he painstakingly watched every passerby. The poodle stopped at a lamppost, sniffed, and lifted its hind leg with infinite deliberation. Then he ceremoniously scratched the pavement and ran on. Ravik suddenly felt his neck wet with perspiration. He waited another few minutes, the face did not appear. He looked into the parked cars. No one was in them. He turned back again and walked quickly to the subway at the Avenue Kleber. He ran down into the entrance, bought a ticket, and walked along the platform. There were a good many people there. Before he got through searching, a train thundered in, stopped, and disappeared in the tunnel. The platform was empty. Slowly he walked back to the bistro. He sat down at the table at which he had been sitting. The glass half full of Calvados was still there. It seemed strange that it was still standing there. The waiter shuffled toward Dravik. Excuse me, sir, I didn't know. Never mind. Ravik said. Bring me another Calvados. Another? The waiter looked at the half-filled glass on the table. Don't you want to drink that first? No. Bring me another. The waiter lifted the glass and smelled it. Isn't it good? It's all right, only I want another. Very well, sir. I was mistaken, Ravik thought. This rain-swept window, partly blurred, how could anything be positively recognized? He stared through the window. He stared attentively, like a hunter lying in wait, he watched every person passing by, but, at the same time, grey and sharp, a moving picture flashed shadow-like across it, a shred of memory. Berlin. A summer evening in 1933. The house of the Gestapo. Blood, a bare room without windows, the sharp light of naked electric bulbs, a red-stained table with binding straps the night-tortured clarity of his brain that had been startled out of unconsciousness a dozen times by being half-choked in a pail of water, his kidneys so beaten they no longer ached, the distorted, helpless face of Sybil before him, a couple of torturers in uniform holding her, and a smiling face and a voice explaining in a friendly way what would happen to Sybil if a confession were not forthcoming, Sybil who three days later was reported to have been found hanged, the waiter appeared and put the glass on the table. This is another brand, sir. Didier from Kn, older. All right. Thanks. Ravik emptied his glass. He got a package of cigarettes out of his pocket, took one out and lit it. His hands were not yet steady. He flung the match on the floor and ordered another Calvados. That face, 
that smiling face which he thought he had just seen again, he must have been mistaken. It was impossible that Hake was in Paris. Impossible. He shook off the memories. It was senseless to drive oneself mad about it as long as one couldn't do anything. The time for that would come when everything back the collapsed and one could return. Till then. He called the waiter and paid. But he could not help searching every face on the streets. Dash. He was sitting with Morosau in the catacombs. Do you think it was he? Morosau asked. No. But he looked it. A cursed sort of resemblance. Or my memory is no longer to be trusted. Bad luck that you were in the bistro. Yes. Morosau remained silent a while. Makes one damn jumpy, doesn't it? He said then. No. Why? Because one doesn't know. I know. Morosau did not reply. Ghosts, Ravik said. I thought I'd be over that by now. One never is. I went through the same thing. Especially at the beginning. During the first five or six years. I'm still waiting for three of them who are in Russia. There were seven. Four have died. Two of them were shot by their own party. I've been waiting now for more than twenty years. Since 1917. One of the three who is still alive must be seventy by now. The other two, about forty or fifty. They're the ones I still hope I'll get. They are for my father. Ravik looked at Boris. He was over sixty, but a giant. You will get them, he said. Yes. Morosau opened and closed his big hands. That's what I'm waiting for. That's why I live more carefully. I don't drink so often now. It may take some time yet. And I've got to be strong. I don't want to shoot or knife them. Neither do I. They sat for a while. Shall we play a game of chess? Morosau asked. Yes. But I don't see any board free. There, the professor is through playing. He played with Levy. As usual he won. Ravik went for the board and the chessman. You've played a long time, professor, he said. The whole afternoon. The old man nodded. It distracts you. Chess is more perfect than any game of cards. At cards you have good luck or bad luck. It isn't sufficiently diverting. Chess is a world in itself. While one is playing, it takes the place of the outside world. He raised his inflamed eyes. Which is not so perfect. Levy, his partner, suddenly bleated. Then he was silent, turned around, frightened, and followed the professor. They played two games. Then Morosau got up. I've got to go. To open doors for the cream of humankind. Why don't you drop in any more at the Scheherazade? I don't know. Just chance. How about tomorrow night? I can't tomorrow. I am having dinner at Maxim's. Morosau grinned. For an illegal refugee you have a lot of nerve to hang out in the most elegant places in Paris. They are the only ones where you are entirely safe, you secure owner of an Anson passport. One who behaves like a refugee is soon caught. You still should remember that much. All right. With whom are you going then? With the German ambassador as another protection? With Kate Higstroem? Morosau whistled. Kate Higstroem, he said. Is she back? She is arriving tomorrow morning. From Vienna. Fine. Then I'll be seeing you later in the Scheherazade anyway. Maybe not. Morosau dismissed the thought. Impossible. The Scheherazade is Kate Higstroem's headquarters when she is in Paris. You know that as well as I do. This time it's different. She'll be going into the hospital. To be operated on one of the next few days. That's just why she will come. You don't understand women. Morosau narrowed his eyes. Or don't you want her to come? Why not? It just occurs to me that you haven't been with us since you sent us that woman. Joan Mud. Seems to be not just chance. Nonsense. I don't even know that she is still with you. 
Could you use her? Yes. First she was in the chorus. Now she has a short solo number. Two or three songs. Has she got adjusted meanwhile? Naturally. Why not? She was damned desperate. Poor devil. What? Morosau asked. I said poor devil. Morosau smiled. Ravik, he replied in a fatherly manner with a face in which suddenly there were steps, space, knowledge, and all the experience in the world. Don't talk nonsense. That woman is quite a bitch. What? Ravik asked. A bitch? No prostitute. A bitch? If you were a Russian you would understand. Ravik shook his head. Then she must have changed a lot. So long, Boris. God bless your eyes. 7. When do I have to be at the hospital, Ravik? Kate Higstrom asked. Tomorrow night. We'll operate the day after. She stood before him, slim, boyish, self assured, pretty, and no longer quite young. This time I'm afraid, she said. I don't know why. But I'm afraid. You needn't be. It is a routine matter. Ravik had removed her appendix two years before. At that time they had taken a liking to each other and since then had been friends. Sometimes she disappeared for months and then one day she would suddenly return. She was something like a mascot to him. Her appendectomy was the first operation he had performed in Paris. She had brought him a luck. Since that time he had continued to work and had had no further difficulties with the police. She went over to the window and looked out. There lay the courtyard of the Hotel Lancaster. A huge old chestnut tree stretched its naked arms upward toward the wet sky. This rain, she said. I left Vienna and it was raining. I awoke in Lyric and it was raining. And now here, she pushed the curtains back. I don't know what's the matter with me. I think I'm growing old. One always thinks that when one isn't. I should be different. I was divorced two weeks ago. I should be gay. But I am tired. Everything repeats itself, Ravik. Why? Nothing repeats itself. We repeat ourselves, that's all. She smiled and sat down on a sofa that stood beside the artificial fireplace. It's good to be back, she said. Vienna has become a military barracks. Disconsolate. The Germans have trampled it down. And with them the Austrians. The Austrians too, Ravik. I thought that would be a contradiction of nature, an Austrian Nazi. But I've seen them. That is not surprising, Kate. Power is the most contagious disease. Yes. And the most deforming. That's why I asked for a divorce. This charming idler whom I married two years ago suddenly became a shouting stormtroop leader who made old Professor Bernstein wash the streets while he stood by and laughed. Bernstein who, a year ago, had cured him of an inflammation of the kidneys. Pretending that the fee had been too high. Kate Higstrom drew in her lips. The fee which I'd paid, not he. Be glad you are rid of him. He asked 250,000 shillings for the divorce. Cheap, Ravik said. Anything you can settle with money is cheap. He got nothing. Kate Higstrom raised her oval face, which was flawlessly cut like a gem. I told him what I thought about him, his party, and his leader, and that from now on I would say this publicly. He threatened me with the Gestapo and the concentration camp. I laughed at him. I am still an American and under the protection of the embassy. Nothing would happen to me, but to him because he was married to me. She laughed. He had not thought of that. He made no trouble from then on. Embassy, defense, protection, Ravik thought. That was like something from another life. I wonder that Bernstein is still able to practice, he said. He no longer can. He examined me secretly when I had the first hemorrhage. Thank God, I can't have a child. A child by a Nazi, she shuddered. Ravik rose. I must go now. You will be examined once more by Weber in the afternoon. Just for form's sake? I know. Nevertheless, 
I am afraid this time. But, Kate, it isn't the first time. It's simpler than the removal of your appendix. Ravik took her lightly around her shoulder. You were my first operation here. That's like one's first love. I'll take good care of you. Yes, she said and looked at him. All right then. Adieu, Kate. I'll call for you at eight tonight. Adieu, Ravik. I'm going now to buy an evening dress at Main Botcher. I must get rid of this tiredness. And the feeling of being caught in a spider web. That Vienna, she said with a bitter smile. The city of dreams. Ravik went down in the elevator and walked through the hall past the bar. A few Americans were sitting there. In the center a huge bunch of red gladioli stood on a table. In the gray diffused light suddenly they had the pale color of old blood and only when he came closer did he notice that they were perfectly fresh. It was merely the light from outside that made them appear so. He looked at them for some time. There was much commotion on the second floor of the international. A number of rooms stood open, the maids and the valet were running to and fro, and the proprietress was directing all this from the corridor. Ravik came down the stairs. What's going on here? he asked. The proprietress was a buxom woman with a huge bosom and a too small head with short black curls. The Spaniards have left, she said. I know. But why are you tidying up the rooms so late in the night? We need them tomorrow morning. New German refugees? No, Spanish. Spanish? Ravik asked for a moment not understanding what she meant. How is that? Haven't they just left? The landlady looked at him with her bright black eyes and smiled. It was a smile of simplest understanding and simplest irony. The others are coming back, she said. Which others? The opposition. But that's always so. She called a few words to the girl who was doing the cleaning. We are an old hotel she said then with a certain pride. Our guests like to return to us. They wait for their old rooms. Naturally a number of them have been killed meanwhile. But the others have waited in Biarritz and St. Jean de Luz until rooms were vacant. Ravik looked at the landlady, astonished. When were they here before? he asked. But Mr. Ravik. She was surprised that he did not understand right away. Of course during that time when Primo de Rivera was dictator in Spain. They had to escape then and they lived here. When Spain became republican they went back and the monarchists and fascists came here. Now the latter have gone back and the republicans are returning. Those that are still left. A merry-go-round. Yes, indeed, Ravik said. A merry-go-round. The landlady looked into one of the rooms. A colored print of the former King Alfonso hung over the bed. Take that down, Jeanne, she called. The girl brought the picture. Here. Put it over here. The landlady leaned the picture against the wall to her right and walked on. In the next room hung a picture of Generalissimo Franco. This one too. Put it with the others. Why didn't these Gomez people take their pictures with them? Ravik asked. Refugees rarely take pictures with them when they go back, the landlady declared. Pictures are a comfort in a foreign land. When one returns one no longer needs them. Also the frames are too inconvenient to travel with and the glass breaks easily. Pictures are almost always left in hotels. She put two other portraits of the fat generalissimo, one of Alfonso, and a smaller one of Quippo de Lana with the others in the corridor. The holy pictures can be left inside, she decided when she discovered a Madonna in glaring colors. Saints are neutral. Not always, Ravik said. In difficult periods God always has a chance. I have even seen atheists praying here. With an energetic movement the landlady adjusted her left breast. Haven't you ever prayed when the water was up to your neck? Naturally. But I'm not an atheist. I am only a reluctant believer. The valet came up the stairs. He carried a pile of pictures across the corridor. Are you going to redecorate? Ravik asked. Of course. 
one must have much tact in the hotel business. That's what really gives a house a good reputation. Particularly with our kind of customers who, I can actually say, are very sensitive about these things. One hardly expects someone to enjoy a room in which his archenemy looks down on him proudly in bright colors and sometimes even out of a gold frame. Am I not right? 100%. The landlady turned toward the valet. Put these pictures here, Adolf. No, you'd better put them in the light against the wall, one next to the other, so that we can see them. The man growled and bent down to prepare the exhibition. What will you hang in the now? Ravik asked, interested. Deer and landscapes and eruptions of Vesuvius and the like? Only if there aren't enough. Otherwise I'll put back the old pictures. Which old ones? Those from before. Those the gentlemen left here when they took over the government. Here they are. She pointed at the left wall of the corridor. The valet had set up the new pictures in a row opposite those which had been taken out of the rooms. There were two of Marx, three of Lenin with the half of one pasted over with paper, a picture of Trotsky, and a few black and white prints of Negrin and other Republican leaders of Spain, in smaller frames. They were less conspicuous and none of them was so resplendent with color and decorations and emblems as the pompous row of Alfonso's, Primos, and Franco's which stood opposite them on the right. It was a strange sight, those two rows of opposed philosophies silently staring at each other in the dimly lit corridor and between them the French landlady with the tact, experience, and the ironic wisdom of her ace. I saved these things at that time, she said, when those gentlemen checked out. Governments don't last long these days. You see I was right, now they come in handy. One has to be far-sighted in the hotel business. She gave orders where to hang the pictures. She sent back the picture of Trotsky. She was not sure about him. Ravik examined the print of Lenin with the half pasted over. He scratched off part of the paper along the line of Lenin's head, and from under the piece of paper emerged another head, Trotsky's, smiling at Lenin. Very likely a follower of Stalin had pasted it over. Here. Ravik said. Another hidden Trotsky. From the good old days of friendship and fraternity. The landlady took the picture. We can throw this one away. It is completely valueless. One half of it persistently insults the other half. She gave it to the valet. Keep the frame, Adolf. It is good oak wood. What will you do with the rest? Ravik asked. With the Alfonsos and Francos? they'll go into the cellar. You can never tell whether or not you will need them again one day. Your cellar must be a wonderful place. A contemporary mausoleum. Have you still other pictures there? Oh naturally, we have other Russian ones, a few simpler pictures of Lenin in cardboard frames, as a last resource, and then those of the last Tsar. From Russians who died here. A wonderful original in oil and in a heavy gold frame from a man who committed suicide. Then there are the Italian pictures. Two Garibaldis, three kings, and a somewhat damaged newspaper cut of Mussolini from the days when he was a socialist in Zurich. Certainly that thing has only curiosity value. No one would like to have it hung up. Have you German pictures too? Still a few of Marx, they are the most common, one lass all. One Bebel, then a group picture with Ebert, Sidman, Noski, and many others. In that picture Nosk had been smeared with ink. The gentleman told me that he became a Nazi. That's right. You may hang it with the socialistic Mussolini. You have none from the opposite side in Germany, eh? We have. We have one Hindenburg, one Kaiser Wilhelm, one Bismarck, and the landlady smiled even one of Hitler in a raincoat. It's a pretty complete collection. What? Ravik said. Hitler? Where did you get him? From a homosexual. He came in 1934 and Rome and the others were killed there. He was full of fear and prayed a lot. Later a rich Argentinian took him along. His first name was Putzi. Do you want to see the picture? 
It is in the cellar. Not now. Not in the cellar. I'd rather see it when all the rooms in the hotel are filled with the same sort of pictures. The landlady looked sharply at him for a moment. Ah so, she said then. You mean when they come as refugees? Boris Morosa was standing in front of the Scheherazade in his uniform with the gold braid and he opened the door of the taxi. Ravik stepped out. Morosa smiled. I thought you weren't coming. I didn't intend to. I forced him, Boris. Kate Higstrom embraced Morosa. Thank God, I am back again with you. You have a Russian soul, Kata. Heaven knows why you had to be born in Boston. Come, Ravik. Morosa thrust the entrance door open. Men is great in his intentions, but weak in carrying them out. Therein lie our misery and our charm. The Scheherazade was decorated like a Caucasian tent. The waiters were Russians in red Circassian uniforms. The orchestra was composed of Russian and Romanian gypsies. People sat at small tables which stood by a banquet that ran along the wall. The tables had plate glass tops illuminated from below. The place was dim and quite crowded. What would you like to drink, Kate? Ravik asked. Vodka. And have the gypsies play. I've had enough of the Vienna Woods played in March time. She slipped her feet out of her shoes and lifted them onto the banquet. Now I'm not tired anymore, Ravik, she said. A few hours of Paris have already changed me. But I still feel as if I had escaped from a concentration camp. Can you imagine that? He looked at her. Approximately, he replied. The Circassian brought a small bottle of vodka and glasses. Ravik filled them and handed one to Kate Hegstroem. She drained the glass quickly and thirstily and put it back. Then she looked around. A moth-eaten hole, she said and smiled. But at night it becomes a cave of refuge and of dreams. She leaned back. The soft light from under the glass top of the table illumined her face. Why, Ravik? Everything becomes more colorful at night. Nothing appears difficult then, you think you are able to do anything, and what one cannot achieve is made up for by dreams. Why? He smiled. We have our dreams because without them we could not bear the truth. The orchestra began to tune their instruments. A few empty fifths and a few runs on a violin fluttered through the room. You don't look like a man who would deceive himself with dreams, Kate Higstrom said. You can deceive yourself with truth too. That's an even more dangerous dream. The orchestra started to play. In the beginning there were the cymbals only. The soft muted hammers plucked a melody out of the darkness, low, almost inaudible, threw it high into a soft glissando and passed it hesitantly onto the violins. The gypsy approached their table slowly across the dance floor. He stood there, smiling the violin at his shoulder, with bold eyes and an ardently greedy face. Without his violin he might have been a cattle dealer, with it he was a messenger of the steps, of spacious evenings, of horizons, and of all that never becomes reality. Kate Higstrom felt the melody like fountain water in April on her skin. Suddenly she was full of echoes, but there was no one who called her. Scattered voices murmured, vague shreds of memory fluttered, Sometimes there was a shimmering like brocade, but they all whirled away and there was no one who called her. No one called. The gypsy bowed. From under the table Ravik slipped a bill into his hand. Kate Higstrom moved in her corner. Have you ever been happy, Ravik? Often. I don't mean that. I mean really happy, breathlessly, unthinkingly, with everything you have. Ravik looked into the agitated small face before him that knew only one interpretation of happiness, the most vacillating of all, love, and none of the others. Often, Kate, he said and meant something quite different and knew it was not that either. You don't want to understand me. Or to talk about it. Who is that now singing with the orchestra? I don't know. I haven't been here for a long time. You can't see the woman from here. She is not with the gypsies. She must be sitting somewhere at a table. 
then very likely it's a guest. That happens often here. A strange voice, Kate Higstrom said. At once, sad and rebellious. That's the songs. Or I am it. Suddenly. Do you understand what she is singing? A Vaslov Bill, I love you. It's a song by Pushkin. Do you know Russian? Only as much as Morosow has taught me. Mostly curses. Russian is an excellent language for curses. You don't like to talk about yourself, do you? I don't even like to think about myself. She sat a while. Sometimes I think the old life has gone, she said then. The freeness from care, the expectation, all that was before. Ravik smiled. It's never gone, Kate. Life is much too great a thing to be gone before we stop breathing. She did not listen to what he said. There is a fear often, she said. A sudden unexplainable fear. As if the world outside may suddenly have collapsed when we leave here. Do you know that, too? Yes, Kate. Everyone knows that. It is a European disease. For the last twenty years. She fell silent. But that is no longer Russian, she said then and listened to the music. No. That is Italian. Santa Lucia Lantana. The spotlight moved from the violinist to the table beside the orchestra. Now Ravik saw the woman who was singing. It was Joan Mudd. She was sitting alone, with one elbow resting on the table, looking straight ahead as if she were in thought and no one else there beside her. Her face was very pale in the white light. It no longer had anything of the flat, blurred look that he knew. Suddenly it was of an exciting forlorn beauty and he remembered having seen it once, fleetingly, like that, the night in her room, but then he had thought it was the soft deception of drunkenness and also it had faded away immediately thereafter and disappeared. Now it was there, wholly, and even more. What's the matter, Ravik? Kate Higstrom asked. He turned around. Nothing. I know that song. A Neapolitan heart ringer. Memories? No. I have no memories. He said it more vehemently than he had intended. Kate Higstrom looked at him. Sometimes I really wish I knew what is the matter with you, Ravik. He made a defensive motion. Nothing more than with anyone else. Today the world is full of involuntary adventures. Every refugee hotel is crowded with them. And everyone's story would have been a sensation for Alexander Dumas or Victor Hugo, now we begin to yawn even before he starts to tell it. Here is another vodka for you, Kate. Nowadays the greatest adventure is a simple life. The orchestra began to play a blues. They played dance music rather badly. A few guests started dancing. Joan Mud rose and walked toward the exit. She walked as if the place were empty. Ravik suddenly recalled what Morosow had said about her. She passed quite close to Ravik's table. It seemed to him that she saw him, but her eyes at once swept on indifferently beyond him, and she left the room. Do you know that woman? asked Kate Higstrom, who had been watching him. No. 8. Do you see that, Weber? Ravik asked. Here, and here, and here. They were bent over the clamped open incision. Yes. These small nodules here, and here, that's not a swelling nor is it an adhesion. No. Ravik straightened up. Cancer, he said. A clear, unmistakable case of cancer. This is the damnedest operation I've performed in years. The speculum doesn't show anything, the pelvic examination an insignificant softness at one side only a slight swelling, the possibility of a cyst or of a fibroma, nothing of importance, but we have to make an abdominal approach, so we cut and suddenly find a carcinoma. Weber looked at him. What do you want to do? We can make a frozen section. To get a microscopic report. Is Boyson still in the laboratory? Certainly. Weber gave an order to the infirmier to call up the laboratory. She went out quickly on noiseless rubber soles. We should go on cutting, Ravik said. Do a hysterectomy. 
there's no point in doing anything else. The damnedest part of it is that she doesn't know. How's the pulse? He asked the anesthetist. Regular. 90. Blood pressure? 120. All right. Ravik looked at Kate Egstrom's body which, head low, lay on the operating table in the Trendelenburg position. She should know beforehand. She should give her consent. We simply can't just go ahead like this. Or can we? Not according to the law. On the other hand, we have already begun. That we had to do. We could not do the abortion without an abdominal approach. This is quite another operation. To remove the uterus is different from an abortion. I believe she trusts you, Ravik. I don't know. Maybe. But would she agree? He adjusted the rubber apron under the white coat with his elbow. Nevertheless, first I could try to explore further. Then we can still decide whether to do the hysterectomy. Knife, Eugenie. He lengthened the incision to the navel and clamped the smaller blood vessels. Then he stopped the larger ones with double knots, took another knife, and cut through the yellow fascia. He fixed the muscles underneath with the back of the knife, then he pulled up the peritoneum, opened and clipped it. The retractor. The assistant nurse held it ready. She threw the weighted chain between Kate Higstrom's legs and hooked on the bladder plate. Dressings. He pressed in the damp warm dressing, laid open the abdominal cavity and carefully applied the grasping forceps. Then he glanced up. Look here, Weber, and here, the broad ligament. This thick hard mass. Impossible to apply the cocker forceps. It has gone too far. Weber stared at the spot which Ravik pointed out. Look at that, Ravik said. We cannot clamp the arteries. Brittle. It's spreading here too. Hopeless. He carefully snipped off a small piece. Is Boyson in the laboratory? Yes, the infirmier said. I have telephoned. He is waiting. All right. Have this sent to him. We can wait for the report. It won't take more than ten minutes. Tell him to telephone, Weber said. Immediately. We'll suspend the operation. Ravik straightened up. How is the pulse? 95. Blood pressure? 115. All right. Weber, we don't need to decide whether to operate with or without consent. There's nothing more we can do. Weber nodded. We'll have to sew her up, Ravik said. Remove the fetus. That's all. Sew her up and say nothing. He stood there for a moment and looked at the open body beneath the white sheets. The piercing light made the sheets appear even whiter, like new fallen snow, under which yawned the red crater of the gaping wound. Kate Higstrom, 34 years old, capricious, slender, damned, filled with the will to live sentenced to death by this nebulous invisible touch that was destroying her tissues. He bent over the body again. We still have to. The child. A groping life, blind, still grew in this disintegrating body. Doomed with it. Still feeding, sucking, eager, only a drive toward growth, something that would one day want to play in gardens, that would want to become somebody, an engineer, a priest, a soldier, a murderer, a human being, something that would want to live, to suffer, to be happy and to go to pieces, the instrument carefully slid along the invisible wall, found the resistance, broke it cautiously, removed it, ended it, ended the unconscious struggles, ended the unbreathed breath, the unlived joyousness, lamentations, growth, nothing now but a bit of dead pallid flesh and dripping blood. Any report from Boyson yet? Not yet. It should be here any minute now. We can wait another few minutes. Ravik stepped back. Pulse? He glanced over the shield into Kate Higstrom's eyes. They were open and she looked at him, not with a glazed expression, but as if she saw him and knew everything. For a moment he thought she was conscious. He took a step forward and halted. Impossible. What was he thinking of? It was an accident, the light. 
the pupils had reacted to light during the narcosis. How is her pulse? 100. Blood pressure, 112. It's going down. Time's getting short, Ravik said. Boyson should be ready by now. There was the subdued ringing of the telephone downstairs. Weber turned toward the door. Ravik did not look up. He waited. He heard the door being opened. The nurse entered. Yes, Weber said. Carcinoma. Ravik nodded and went back to work. He lifted the forceps and the clips. He removed the retractor, the dressings. Eugenie, at his side, mechanically counted the instruments. He began stitching. Lightly, methodically, painstakingly, completely concentrated and without a single thought. The grave closed, the layers of flesh were drawn together to the last, outermost one. He put on the clips for the skin and straightened up. Finished. Eugenie stepped on the lever bringing the operating table to a horizontal position and covered Kate Egstroem. Scheherazade, Ravik thought, the day before yesterday, address from Maine Botcher, have you ever been happy, often, I am afraid, a routine matter, let the gypsies play. He looked at the clock above the door. Twelve o'clock. Noon. Outside, office and factory doors were opening now and healthy people streaming out. Lunch time. The two nurses rolled the level stretcher out of the operating room. Ravik tore the rubber gloves from his hands, went into the washroom, and began to Washington. Your cigarette, Weber said, washing himself at the other basin. You'll burn your lips. Yes, thanks. Who will tell her, Weber? You will, Weber declared unhesitatingly. We'll have to explain to her why we had to operate. She expected us to do it from the inside. We can't tell her what it really was. Something will occur to you, Weber said confidently. You think so? Of course. After all, you've got until tonight. And you? She wouldn't believe anything I'd say. She knows that you operated and she'll want to hear about it from you. She would only be suspicious if I told her. That's right. I still don't understand it, Weber said. How it could develop in such a short time. It can. I wish I knew what to tell her. You'll think of something, Ravik. A cyst of some sort or a fibroma. Yes, Ravik said. Some sort of cyst or fibroma. At night he went to the hospital again. Katie Stroem was sleeping. She had awakened in the evening, had vomited, spent a restless hour, and had then fallen asleep again. Did she ask anything? No, said the red-cheeked nurse. She was still drowsy and asked no questions. I think she'll sleep until morning. In case she wakes up and asks questions, tell her everything went well. She's to go back to sleep. Give her something if necessary. If she should become restless, call Dr. Weber or me. I'll leave word at the hotel where to find me. He stood in the street like someone who had for once escaped. A few hours grace before he had to lie to a trusting face. Suddenly the night seemed warm and shimmering. The grey scab of life was once again mercifully covered over by a few borrowed hours which flew up like doves. They too were lies, one had to pay for everything, they were a postponement only, but what wasn't? Was not everything postponement, merciful postponement, a bright flag which covered the remote, black, inexorably nearing gate? He went into a bistro and took a seat at one of the marble tables at the window. The room was smoky and full of noise. The waiter came. A dubinit and a package of colonials. He opened the package and lighted one of the black cigarettes. At the table next to him some Frenchmen were discussing their corrupt government and the Munich Pact. Ravik only half listened. Everyone knew that the world was apathetically sliding into a new war. No one did anything to stop it, postponement, another year's postponement, that was all they managed to struggle for. Postponement here too, again and again. He emptied the glass of Dubonit. The sweetish dull flavor of the aperitif filled his mouth with a flat distaste. Why had he ordered it? 
He called the waiter. A fine. He looked through the window and shook his thoughts off. If there was nothing to be done, one shouldn't drive oneself crazy. He recalled the time when he had learned this lesson. One of the great lessons of his life. It was in August, 1916, near Ypres. The company had returned from the front the day before. It had been a quiet section in which they were used for the first time since they had been sent into the field. Nothing had happened. Now they were lying in the warm August sun around a small fire, frying potatoes they had found in the fields. A minute later nothing was left. A sudden artillery attack, a shell had hit the middle of the fire, when he came to himself again, whole, uninjured, he found two of his comrades dead, and farther away his friend Messman, whom he had known from the time when both began to walk, with whom he had played, gone to school, from whom he had been inseparable, lying there with his belly torn open, his intestines coming out. They carried him on a tent litter to the field hospital, by the nearest path through a cornfield up a slope. Four men carried him, one at each corner, and he was lying in the brown tent litter, his hands pressed against the white, fat, bloody intestines, his mouth open, his eyes uncomprehendingly fixed. Two hours later he died. For one of them he had screamed. Ravik remembered how they had returned. He had sat in the barracks, dull and bewildered. It was the first time he had seen anything like that. Kaczynski had found him there, the group leader, a shoemaker in private life. Come, he had said. They have beer and whiskey in the Bavarian canteen today. Sausages too. Ravik had stared at him. He could not understand such callousness. Kaczynski had watched him for a while. Then he had said, You are coming with me. Even if I have to beat you up. Today you'll eat and get drunk and go to a cat house. He had not answered. Kaczynski had sat down beside him. I know what's the matter with you. I know too what you think of me now. But I have been here two years and you two weeks. Listen. Can anything still be done for Messman? No. Don't you know that we would risk everything if there were a chance to save him? He had looked up. Yes. He knew that. He knew that about Kaczynski. Well. He is dead. There is nothing to be done anymore. But in two days we'll have to get out of here for the front. This time it won't be so quiet there. Crouching here now and thinking of Messman, the thing eats into you. Ruins your nerves. Makes you jittery. Perhaps just enough to slow you down during the next attack out there. Just half a second late. Then we carry you back as we did Messman. Whom does it help? Messman? No. Someone else? No. It kills you, that's all. Now do you understand? Yes, but I can't. Shut up, you can. Others could too. You aren't the first. It had become better after that night. He had gone with him, he had learned his first lesson. Help when you can, do everything then, but when you can no longer do anything, forget it. Turn away. Pull yourself together. Compassion is meant for quiet times. Not when life is at stake. Bury the dead and devour life. You'll still need it. Mourning is one thing, facts are another. One doesn't mourn less when one sees the facts and accepts them. That is how one survives. Ravik drank his cognac. The Frenchmen at the next table were still talking about their government. About France's failure. About England. About Italy. About Chamberlain. Words, words. The only ones who did something were the others. They were not stronger, only more determined. They were not braver, they only knew that the others wouldn't fight. Postponement. But what did they do with it? Did they arm themselves? Did they make up for lost time? Did they pull themselves together? They watched the others going ahead arming themselves, and waited, passively hoping for a new postponement. The story of the herd of seals. Hundreds of them on a beach, among them the hunter killing one after the other with a club. Together they could easily have crushed him, but they lay there, watching him come to murder, and did not move, he was only killing a neighbor, 
one neighbor after the other. The story of the European seals. The sunset of civilization. Tired shapeless Scott de Marung. The empty banners of human rights. The sellout of a continent. The onrushing deluge. The haggling for the last prices. The old dance of despair on the volcano. Peoples again slowly being driven into a slaughterhouse. The fleas would save themselves when the sheep were being sacrificed. As always. Ravik pressed out his cigarette. He looked around. What did it all mean? Hadn't the evening been like a dove before, like a soft grey dove? Bury the dead and devour life. Time is short. To survive was everything. A time would come when one was needed. One should keep oneself whole and ready for that. He called the waiter and paid. The lights in the Scheherazade were lowered when he entered. The gypsies were playing and the spotlight flooded the table beside the orchestra where Joan Mud sat. Ravik stopped inside the door. One of the waiters approached him and moved a table into position. But Ravik remained standing and looked at Joan Mud. Vodka? The waiter asked. Yes. A carafe. Ravik sat down. He poured vodka into his glass and drank it quickly. He wanted to get rid of the thoughts he had hid outside. The grimace of the past and the grimace of death, a belly torn open by shells and one eaten up by cancer. He noticed that he was sitting at the same table where he had sat with Kate Egstrom two days before. Another table was vacated beside him. He did not move the. It made no difference. Whether he was sitting at this table or at the next. It did not help Kate Higstrom. What had Weber said once? Why do you get upset when an operation is hopeless? You do what you can and you go home, otherwise where would it lead? Yes, where would it lead? He heard Joan Mud's voice coming from the orchestra. Kate Higstrom was right, it was an agitating voice. He reached for the carafe with the limpid brandy. One of those moments when colors fade and life turns gray under powerless hands. The mystic ebb. The silent sessure between breaths. The bite of time slowly consuming one's heart. Santa Lucia Lantana, sang the voice by the orchestra. It came to him as though across an ocean, from a forgotten far shore where something bloomed. How do you like her? Whom? Ravik glanced up. The manager stood at his side. He motioned to Joan Mud. Much. Very much. She isn't exactly a sensation. But quite good between the other numbers. The manager moved along. For a moment his pointed beard stood out black against the white light. Then he disappeared in the darkness. The spotlight died away. The orchestra began to play a tango. The illuminated table plates emerged again and above them the blurred faces. Joan Mud rose and made her way among the tables. She had to stop several times because couples were going to the dance floor. Ravik looked at her and she looked at him. Her face betrayed no surprise. She came straight toward him. He got up and pushed the table aside. A waiter came to his aid. Thanks, he said. I'll do it myself. All we need is another glass. He moved the table back again and filled the glass which the waiter had brought. Here, this is vodka he said. I don't know whether you drink that. Yes. We have drunk it before. In the Bellaroar. That's right. We were here before too, he thought. Ages ago. Three weeks ago. Then you were sitting here in your raincoat, huddled, nothing but a bit of misery and defeat in the half-dark. Now, salute, he said. A gleam crossed her face. She did not smile. Only her face became brighter. I haven't heard that for a long time, she said. Salute. He emptied his glass and looked at her. The high brows, the wide set A's, the mouth, all that had formerly been blurred and separate, without context, now combined to shape a bright, mysterious face, a face whose openness was its secret. It neither hid nor revealed anything. It promised nothing and thereby everything. Odd. I haven't seen this before, he thought. But perhaps it was not there. Perhaps it was then completely filled with confusion and fear. Have you a cigarette? Joan Mud asked. 
Only the Algerians. Those with the strong black tobacco. Ravik was about to call the waiter. They are not too strong, Joan Mudd said. Once you gave me one. On the Pont d'Ulma. That's true. It is true and it isn't true, he thought. That was a pale, hunted creature, not you. There were many other things as well between us and suddenly none of them is true any longer. I was here once before, he said. Day before yesterday. I know. I saw you. She didn't ask about Kate Stroham. She sat in the corner, calm and relaxed, and smoked, and was completely absorbed in her smoking. Then she drank, calmly and slowly, and was completely absorbed in her drinking. She seemed to do everything she did wholly, however unimportant it was. At that time she was completely desperate too, Ravik thought, and now she wasn't at all anymore. Suddenly she had warmth and a self-evident, assured placidity. He did not know whether it was due to the fact that nothing moved her life at the moment, he only felt it shine unpremeditatedly upon him. The carafe of vodka was empty. Shall we go on drinking the same? What was it you gave me to drink then? When? Here? I think we mixed them all up. No, not here. That first evening. Ravik reflected. I can't remember any more. Wasn't it cognac? No. It looked like cognac but it was something else. I tried to get it. But I couldn't. Why do you want it? Was it so good? Not because of that. It was the warmest thing I ever drank in my life. Where did we drink it? In a small bistro near the Ark. We had to go down a few steps. Cab drivers and a few girls were there. The waiter had a woman tattooed on his arm. Now I know. It must have been Calvados. Apple brandy from Normandy. Have you tried that? I don't think so. Ravik called the waiter. Have you any Calvados? No. Sorry. No one ever asks for it. This place is too elegant for it. It must have been Calvados. It's a shame we can't find out. The simplest thing would be to go to the place again. But that's not possible now. Why? Don't you have to stay here? No. I'm through. Fine. Do you want to go there? Yes. Ravik had no trouble finding the bistro. It was fairly empty. The waiter with the woman tattooed on his arm glanced at each of them in turn, then he shuffled out from behind his counter and wiped a table. This is progress, Ravik said. He didn't do that then. Not this table, Joan Mudd said. That one, there. Ravik smiled. Are you superstitious? Sometimes. The waiter stood beside them. That's it, he said, making the tattooing jump. That's where you sat last time. Do you still remember? Perfectly. You should be a general, Ravik said. With such a memory. I never forget anything. Then I wonder how you can live. But do you also remember what we drank last time? Galvados, the waiter said without hesitating. Right. We'd like to repeat it now. Ravik turned to Joan Mudd. How simply problems are solved sometimes. Now we'll see if it tastes just the same. The waiter brought the glasses. Double. You ordered double Galvados then. You're gradually giving me an uncanny feeling, my good man. Do you also remember how we were dressed? Raincoats. The lady wore a Basque beret. It's a pity you have to be here. You belong in vaudeville. I used to be, the waiter replied, astonished. Circus. I told you that. Did you forget? Yes. It's disgraceful. But I did. This gentleman has a bad memory, Joan Mudd said to the waiter. He is an expert in forgetting just as you are an expert in not forgetting. Ravik glanced up. She looked at him. He smiled. Perhaps not, after all, he said. And now we'll taste the Calvados. Salute. Salute. The waiter remained standing. 
What one forgets one misses later in life, sir, he declared. The topic was not yet exhausted as far as he was concerned. Correct. And what one doesn't forget makes one's life a hell. Not mine. It's gone. Then how can it make one's life a hell? Ravik glanced up. Just because of it, brother. But you're a happy man, not just an artist. Is it the same Calvados? He asked Joan Mud. It is better. He looked at her. He felt a warmth rising in him. He knew what she meant, but it was disarming that she said it. She did not seem to be concerned with what effect it might have. She sat in this bare looking place as if she were all by herself. The light from the unshaded electric bulbs was merciless. Under them, two whores sitting a few tables away looked like their own grandmothers. But the glare had no effect on her. What had shone before in the subdued light of the nightclub held its own here too. The cool bright face which didn't ask for anything, which simply existed, waiting, it was an empty face, he thought, a face that could change with any wind of expression. One could dream into it anything. It was like a beautiful empty house waiting for carpets and pictures. It had all possibilities, it could become a palace or a brothel. It depended on the one who filled it. How limited by comparison was all that is already completed and labeled. He noticed that she had emptied her glass. My respects, he said. That was a double Galvados. Do you want another one? Yes. If you have time. Why shouldn't I have time? He thought. Then it occurred to him that she had seen him with Kate Higstrom last time. He looked up. Her face didn't betray anything. I have time, he said. I have to operate tomorrow at nine, that's all. Can you do it if you stay up so late? Yes. This has nothing to do with it. It's habit. Nor do I operate every day. The waiter refilled their glasses. He brought a package of cigarettes with the bottle and put it on the table. It was a package of Lawrence Green. These are what you had last time, aren't they? He asked Travick triumphantly. I have no idea. You know more than I do. I believe you. He's right, Joan Mudd said. It was Lawrence Green. You see. The lady has a better memory than you have, sir. That's yet to be proved. Anyway, we can use the cigarettes. Ravik opened the package and held it out to her. Do you still live in the same hotel? He asked. Yes. Only I took a large room. A few cab drivers entered. They sat down at one of the nearby tables and began a loud discussion. Would you like to leave? Ravik asked. She nodded. He called the waiter and paid. Are you sure you don't have to go back to the Shiherazada? No. He took her coat. She did not put it on. She simply hung it around her shoulders. It was an inexpensive mink, possibly an imitation, but it did not look cheap on her. Only what is not worn with assurance is cheap, Ravik thought. He had seen cheap crown sables. Now I'll take you to your hotel, he said when they stood outside the entrance in the light drizzle. She turned toward him slowly. Aren't we going to your place? Her face was just below his, partly turned up to him. The light from the lamp in front of the door shone full on it. Fine beads of moisture glittered on her hair. Yes, he said. A taxi approached and stopped. The driver waited a while. Then he clicked his tongue, the gears grated, and he drove away. I've been waiting for you. Did you know? She asked. No. Her eyes gleamed in the light from the street lamp, one could look through them and see no end. I've seen you today for the first time, he said. You are not the same woman as before. No. And all that was before never happened. No. I have forgotten it. He felt the light ebb and flow of her breath. Invisibly and tenderly, it was vibrating toward him, without heaviness ready and full of confidence, a strange life in a strange night. Suddenly he felt his blood. It mounted and mounted and it was more than that, life, 
a thousand times cursed and welcomed, often lost and ruin, an hour ago still a barren landscape, arid, full of rocks, and without consolation, and now gushing, gushing as if from many fountains, resounding and close to the mysterious moment in which one had not believed any more, one was the first man again, on the shore of the ocean and out of the waves emerged, white and radiant, question and answer in one, it mounted and mounted, and the storm began above his eyes. Hold me, she said. He looked down into her face and put his arm around her. Her shoulders came closer to him like a ship coming to anchor in a harbor. Must one hold you? he asked. Yes. Her hands lay close together against his chest. I'll hold you, he said. She nodded. Another taxi came to a squeaking stop beside the curb. The driver, unmoved, looked over at them. On his shoulder sat a little dog in a knitted vest. Taxi. He croaked from behind a long flaxen moustache. Look, Ravik said. That man knows nothing. He doesn't know that wings have touched us. He looks at us and doesn't see that we have changed. That is the crazy thing about the world, you may turn into an archangel, a fool or a criminal, no one will see it. But when a button is missing, everyone sees that. It is not crazy. It is good so. It leaves us to ourselves. Ravik looked at her. Us, he thought, what a word. The most mysterious in the world. Taxi. The driver croaked patiently, but louder, and lit a cigarette. Come, Ravik said. He won't let us go. He is experienced in his trade. I don't want to ride. Let's walk. It is beginning to rain. That isn't train. That is mist. I don't want a taxi. I want to walk with you. All right. But I'd like to make that man understand that something has happened here. Ravik walked over and spoke to the driver. The man smiled a beautiful smile, greeted Joan with a gesture that Frenchmen alone achieve at such moments, and drove away. How did you explain it to him? She asked when Ravik returned. With money. The simplest thing. Like all people who work nights he's a cynic. He understood immediately. He was benevolent with a touch of amiable contempt. She smiled. He put his arm around her shoulders. She leaned against him. He felt something open up in him and spread, warm and soft and wide, something that drew him down as though with many hands, and made it suddenly unbearable that they were standing side by side on their feet, those small platforms, absurdly upright, balancing, instead of forgetting and sinking down, yielding to the call of the skin, the call behind the millenniums when there did not as yet exist brains and thoughts and suffering and doubt but only the dark happiness of the blood. Come, he said. They walked along the empty grey street through the light rain, and when they reached its end, the square lay before them again, huge and unbounded and, out of the flowing river, suspended aloft, rose the massive greyness of the ark. 9. Ravik returned to the hotel. Joan Mud had still been sleeping when he had left that morning. He had thought he would be back in an hour. It was now three hours later. Hello, doctor, someone said on the stairs. Ravik looked at the man. A pale face, a bush of wild black hair, glasses. He did not recognize him. Alvarez, the man said. Hi, me Alvarez. Don't you remember? Ravik shook his head. The man bent down and pulled up his trouser leg. A long scar ran along his shin bone up to his knee. Do you remember now? Did I operate on that? The man nodded. On a kitchen table behind the front. In a temporary field hospital before Aranjuez. A little white cottage in an almond grove. Do you remember now? Suddenly Ravik scented the heavy aroma of almond blossoms. He smelled it as if it had ascended the dark staircase, sweet, putrid inextricably mixed with the sweeter and more putrid scent of blood. Yes, he said. I remember. The wounded had been lying on the moonlit terrace, beside one another in rows. A few German and Italian planes had accomplished that. Children, 
women, peasants, torn by bomb fragments. A child without a face, a pregnant woman torn open up to her breast, an old man who anxiously held the fingers torn off one hand in his other because he thought they could be sewed on. Over all that the heavy night odor and the clear dew falling. Is your leg quite all right again? Ravik asked. Just about. I can't bend it completely. The man smiled. But it was good enough to get me across the Pyrenees. Gonzalez is dead. Ravik no longer knew who Gonzalez was. But now he recalled a young student who had assisted him. Do you know what happened to Manilo? Imprisoned. Shot. Ansona? The brigade commander. Dead. Before Madrid. The man smiled again. It was a rigid automatic smile that came suddenly and was without emotion. Moura and La Pena were taken prisoners. Shot. Ravik no longer knew who Moura and La Pena were. He had left Spain after six months when the front was broken and the field hospital disbanded. Carnero, Otter, and Goldstein are in a concentration camp, Alvarez said. In France. Blatsky too is safe. Hidden across the frontier. Ravik recalled only Goldstein. There had been too many faces at that time. Do you live here in the hotel now? He asked. Yes. We moved in yesterday. Over there. The man pointed at the rooms on the second floor. We were kept in the camp down at the frontier for a long time. Finally we were released. We still had some money. He smiled again. Beds. Real beds. A good hotel. Even pictures of our leaders on the walls. Yes, Ravik said without irony. It must be pleasant after all that over there. He said goodbye to Alvarez and went to his room. The room had been cleaned and was empty. Joan had gone. He looked around. She had not left anything behind. He had not expected her to. He rang. After a while the maid came. The lady left, she said before he could ask her. I see that myself. How did you know anyone was here? But, Mr. Ravik, the girl said without adding anything and with an expression as if her honor had been offended. Did she have breakfast? No. I haven't seen her. Otherwise I would have thought of it. I know that from before. Ravik looked at her. He did not like the concluding sentence. He pulled a few francs out of his pocket and put them into the girl's apron pocket. All right, he said. Do the same next time. Bring breakfast only when I explicitly tell you to do so. And don't come up to clean the room before you know for sure that it is empty. The girl smiled understandingly. Very well, Mr. Avic. He looked after her uneasily. He knew what she thought. She believed Joan was married and did not want to be seen. In former days he would have laughed about it. Now he did not like it. But why not? He thought. He shrugged his shoulders and went to the window. Hotels were hotels. That could not be changed. He opened the window. A cloudy noon hung above the houses. Sparrows chirped in the eaves. On the floor below two voices squabbled. That would be the Goldberg family. The man was twenty years older than his wife. A wholesale corn dealer from Breslau. His wife was having an affair with the refugee Wiesenhoff. She thought no one knew it. The only one who did not know it was Goldberg. Ravik closed the window. He had operated on a gallbladder that morning. An anonymous gallbladder for Durant. He had cut open for Durant part of an unknown male belly. A fee of two hundred francs. Afterwards he had gone to see Kate Higstrom. She had a fever. Too much fever. He had been with her for an hour. She had slept restlessly. It was nothing alarming. But it would have been better if there had been no fever. He stared through the window. The strange empty feeling of afterwards. The bed that no longer had any meaning. The day that mercilessly tore yesterday into pieces like a jackal tearing the hide of an antelope. The woods of the night, miraculously grown in the dark, now endlessly remote again, merely a far to Morgana in the wasteland of ours. He turned around. 
On his table he found Lucine Martinet's address. She had been released from the hospital a short time before. She had given them no peace until they released her. Two days ago he had been with her. It was not necessary to look her up again, but he had nothing else to do and decided to go there. The house was in the Rue Clavel. Downstairs was a butcher's shop in which a strong woman was swinging a cleaver and selling meat. She was in mourning. Her husband had died two weeks before. Now the woman reigned in the shop, with a helper. Ravik saw her as he passed by. She was apparently about to go calling. She wore a hat with a long black crepe veil and was quickly chopping off a pig's leg to oblige an acquaintance. The veil waved above the open carcass. The cleaver glittered and came crashing down. With one blow, the widow said in a satisfied tone and flung the leg on the scale. Lucine lived in a small room on the top floor. She was not alone. A fellow of about twenty-five slouched on a chair. He wore a bicyclist's cap and was smoking a homemade cigarette which stuck to his upper lip when he talked. He remained sitting as Ravik entered. Lucine lay in bed. She was bewildered and blushed. Doctor, I didn't know you would come today. She looked at the young man. This is... Someone, the boy interrupted her gruffly. It isn't necessary to toss names around. He leaned back. So you are the doctor. How are you, Lucin? Ravik asked without taking any notice of him. You're wise to stay in bed. She could have been up long ago, the boy declared. There's no longer anything wrong with her. When she doesn't work it runs up expenses. Ravik turned around and looked at him. Leave us alone, he said. What? Get out. Out of the room. I'm going to examine Lucene. The boy burst out laughing. You can do that just as well with me here. We aren't so fine. And why examine? You were here only the day before yesterday. That costs for an extra visit, eh? Brother, Ravik said calmly, you don't look as if you would pay it. Besides, whether it will cost anything is a different matter. And now get out. The boy grinned and sprawled his legs comfortably. He wore tapered patent leather shoes and violet socks. Please, Bobo, Lucene said. I'm sure it will only take a moment. Bobo did not pay any attention to her. He stared at Ravik. It suits me fine that you're here, he said. Now I can put you straight right away. My dear man, if you think perhaps you can bleed us for hospital bills, operations, and all that, nothing doing. We didn't ask to have her sent to the hospital, not to mention the operation, so it's no go with the money angle. You ought to be glad we don't ask for compensation. For an unauthorized operation. He showed a row of stained teeth. That's some surprise, isn't it? Yes, sir. Bobo knows his way around, he can't be easily gypped. The boy looked very much contented. He felt he had got out of that brilliantly. Lucine became pale. She looked anxiously from Bobo to Ravik. You understand? Bobo asked triumphantly. Was he the one? Ravik asked Lucine. She did not answer. So that's it, he said and studied Bobo. A tall thin fellow with a rayon scarf around his skinny throat, in which the Adam's apple was moving up and down. Drooping shoulders, too long a nose, a degenerate chin, the picture book conception of a suburb pimp. So what's it? Bobo asked, challenging. I think I've told you often enough now to get going. I want to examine her. Murd, Bobo replied. Slowly Ravik walked toward him. He had had enough of Bobo. The boy jumped up, stepped back, and suddenly had a thin rope of about two yards length in his hands. Ravik knew what he intended to do with it. When Ravik came closer he was going to jump aside, then get swiftly behind him and slip the rope over his head so that he could strangle him from behind. It would work if the other person did not know about it or attempted to box. Bobo, Lucine called. Bobo, don't. You young scum. Ravik said. That miserable old rope trick, 
Don't you know any better? He laughed. Bobo was nonplussed for a moment. His eyes became uncertain. In an instant Travik had ripped his jacket down over his shoulders with both hands so that he could not lift his arms. This is one you did not know, eh? He said, quickly opened the door, and shoved the surprised and helpless fellow roughly out of the room. If that's the sort of thing you like, become a soldier, you would be Apache. But don't molest grown-up people. He locked the door from inside. So, Lucene, he said. Now let's have a look at you. She trembled. Calm, calm. It's over. He took the worn-out cotton quilt and put it on the chair. Then he rolled back the green blanket. Pajamas. Why that? They're less comfortable. You should not move much yet, Lucene. She remained silent for a moment. I only put them on today, she said. Haven't you got any nightgowns? I can have two of them sent to you from the hospital. No, not because of that. I put them on because I knew, she looked at the door and whispered that he would come. He said I was no longer sick. He wouldn't wait any longer. What? It's a pity I didn't know that before. Ravik looked at the door angrily. He'll wait. Lucene had the very white skin of an Emaquimin. The veins lay blue under the thin epidermis. She was well built, with delicate bones, slender, but nowhere too bony. One of the innumerable girls, Ravik thought, who make one wonder why nature puts on such a show of grace, since one knows what will become of almost all of them, overworked drudges who soon lose their figures through wrong and unhealthy ways of life. You will have to stay in bed pretty much for another week, Lucene. You may get up and walk around here. But be careful, don't lift anything. And don't climb any stairs for the next few days. Have you got someone to take care of you? Besides this Bobo. The landlady. But she too has started to grumble. Someone else? No. Before there was Marie. She is dead. Ravik took stock of the room. It was poorly furnished and clean. A few fuchsias stood in the window. And Bobo. He said. Well, he appeared again after everything was over. Lucine did not answer. Why don't you throw him out? He isn't so bad, doctor. Only wild. Ravik looked at her. Love, he thought. That too is love. The old miracle. It not only casts a rainbow of dreams against the grey sky of facts, it also sheds romantic light upon a heap of dung, a miracle and a mad mockery. Suddenly he had the strange feeling of having become, in a remote way, an accomplice. All right, Lucene, he said. Don't worry about it. First become healthy. Relieved, she nodded. And that about the money, she blurted out, embarrassed, that isn't true. He only said so. I'll pay everything. Everything. In installments. When will I be able to work again? In about two weeks, if you're not foolish. And nothing with Bobo. Absolutely nothing, Lucene. Otherwise you might die, you understand? Yes, she replied without conviction. Ravik covered her slender body with the blanket. When he looked up he noticed that she was weeping. Couldn't it be soon? She said. I can sit while I work. I must. Perhaps. We'll see. It depends on how well you take care of yourself. You should tell me the name of the midwife who did the abortion, Lucene. He saw the defense in her eyes. I won't go to the police, he said. Certainly not. I'll only try to get the money back you paid her. Then you could be calmer. How much was it? 300 francs. You'll never get it from her. One can try. What's her name and where does she live? You'll never need her again, Lucene. You can no longer have any children. And she can't do anything to you. The girl hesitated. There in the drawer, she said then. At your right in the drawer. This slip here? Yes. All right. I'll go the one of the next few days. Don't be afraid. Ravik put on his coat. 
What's the matter? He asked. Why do you want to get up? Bobo. You don't know him. He smiled. I think I know worse than him. Stay right in bed. To judge by what I have seen we need not be concerned. So long, Lucene. I'll drop in on you soon again. Ravik turned the key and the latch simultaneously, and quickly opened the door. No one stood in the corridor. Nor had he expected it, he knew Bobo's type. Downstairs the assistant was now standing in the butcher's shop, a man with a sallow face and without the ardor of the proprietress. He was chopping listlessly. Since his master's death he had become noticeably more tired. His chances of marrying his master's wife were small. A brushmaker in the bistro opposite announced this in a loud voice and also that she would drive him too into the grave before that happened. The assistant had already lost much weight, he said. But the widow had blossomed mightily. Ravik drank a cassis and paid. He had expected to find Bobo in the bistro, but Bobo was not there. Joan Mud quickly left the Shaherazada. She opened the door of the taxi in which Ravik was waiting. Come she said. Let's get away from here. Let's go to your place. Has something happened? No. Nothing. It's just that I've had enough of nightclub life. Just a moment. Ravik called to the woman who stood before the entrance, selling flowers. Granny, he said. Let me have all your roses. How much are they? But don't be exorbitant. Sixty francs. For you because you gave me that prescription for my rheumatism. Did it help? No. How can it, as long as I have to stand in the wet at night? You're the most sensible patient I ever met in my life. He took the roses. Here is my apology for having left you to wake up alone this morning, he said to Joan and put the flowers on the floor of the taxi. Would you like to have a drink somewhere? No. I'd like to go to your place. Put the flowers here on the seat. Not on the floor. They are all right down there. One should love flowers, but not make too much fuss about them. She turned her head quickly. You mean one shouldn't spoil what one loves? No. I only mean that one shouldn't dramatize beautiful things. Besides, at the moment it is better if there are no flowers between us. Joan looked at him doubtfully for a moment. Then her face brightened. Do you know what I did today? I lived. Lived again. I breathed. Breathed again. I existed. Existed again. For the first time. I had hands again. And eyes and a mouth. The driver maneuvered the taxi out from among the other cars in the small street. Then he started with a jerk. The jolt threw Joan toward Ravik. He held her in his arms for a moment and felt her closeness. It was like a warm wind as if she were melting away the crust of the day, the strange defensive coolness within him, while she sat there and spoke, carried away by her feelings and by herself. The whole day, it threw itself over my neck and against my breast as though to make me grow green and put out leaves and blossoms, it held me and held me and did not let me go, and now here I am and you. Ravik looked at her. She sat leaning forward on the dirty leather seat and her shoulders shone out of her black evening gown. She was open and outspoken and without shame, she said what she felt and he found himself poor and dry in comparison. I was performing operations, he thought. I forgot you. I was with Lucene. I was somewhere in the past. Without you. Then when the evening came a certain warmth came slowly with it. I was not with you. I thought of Kate Higstrowham. Joan, he said and put his hands on her hands, which she had rested on the seat. We can't go to my place now, I've got to go first to the hospital. Only for a few minutes. Have you got to look after the woman you operated on? Not the one of this morning. Someone else. Would you like to wait somewhere for me? Must you go right away? It would be better. I don't want to be called later. I can wait for you. Have we enough time to go by your hotel? Yes. Let's go the first. Then you'll come later. 
I can wait for you. All right. Ravik gave the driver his address. He leaned back and felt the top of the seat against his neck. His hands were still on Joan's hands. He felt that she was waiting for him to say something. Something about him and her. But he could not. She had already said too much. It was not so much, he thought. The cab stopped. You go on, Joan said. I'll manage here all right. I'm not afraid. Just give me your key. The key is in the hotel. I'll have them give it to me. I've got to learn to do that. She took the flowers from the floor. With a man who leaves me while I sleep and comes again when I don't expect it, there are many things I'll have to learn. Let me start right away. I'll come up with you. We won't overdo anything. It's bad enough to have to leave you alone again immediately. She laughed. She looked very young. Please wait a moment, Ravik said to the driver. The man slowly closed one eye. Even longer. Let me have the key, Joan said as they walked upstairs. Why? Let me have it. She opened the door. Then she stopped. Beautiful, she said into the dark room into which a bleak moon shone through the clouds outside the window. Beautiful? This hole? Yes, beautiful. Everything is beautiful. Maybe right now. Now it's dark. But, Ravik reached for the switch. Don't. I'll do it myself. And now go. And don't wait till tomorrow noon to come back. She stood in the doorway in the dark. The silver light from the window was behind her shoulders and her head. She was indistinct and exciting and mysterious. Her coat had slipped down, it lay at her feet like a heap of black foam. She leaned against the doorframe and one of her arms caught a long shaft of light from the corridor. Go and come again, she said and closed the door. Kate Higstrom's fever had gone down. Has she been awake? Ravik asked the drowsy nurse. Yes. At eleven. She asked for you. I told her what you instructed me to say. Did she say anything about the bandages? Yes. I told her you had to make an incision. A light operation. You'd explain it to her tomorrow. That was all? Yes. She said everything was all right as long as you considered it right. I was to give you her regards if you came again tonight and tell you that she has confidence in you. So. Ravik stood a while and looked down at the nurse's parted black hair. How old are you? He asked. She raised her head in astonishment. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. And how long have you been nursing? For the last two and a half years. In January it was two and a half years. Do you like your profession? The nurse smiled all over her apple face. I like it very much, she declared chattily. Of course some of the patients are trying, but most of them are nice. Madame Brissot gave me a beautiful, almost new silk dress as a present yesterday. And last week I got a pair of patent leather shoes from Madame Malerna. The one who later died at home. She smiled again. I hardly have to buy any clothing. I almost always get something. If I can't use it I exchange it with a friend of mine who has a shop. That's why I'm well off. Madame Higstrom too is always very generous. She gives me money. Last time it was a hundred francs. For only twelve days. How long will she be here this time, doctor? Longer. A few weeks. The nurse looked happy. Behind her clear unlined forehead she was calculating how much she would get. Ravik bent over Kate Higstrom once more. She was breathing quietly. The slight odor from the wound mingled with the dry perfume of her hair. Suddenly he could not stand it. She had confidence in him. Confidence. The flat cut up abdomen in which the beast was feeding. Sewn up without the possibility of doing anything. Confidence. Good night, nurse, he said. Good night, doctor. The chubby nurse sat down in the chair in a corner of the room. She dimmed the light on the side toward the bed, wrapped her feet in a blanket, and reached for a magazine. 
It was one of those cheap magazines containing detective stories and movie pictures. She adjusted herself comfortably and began to read. Beside her on a little table she had put an opened box of chocolate wafers. Ravik saw her take one without looking up. Sometimes one doesn't comprehend the simplest things, he thought, that in the same room one person should be lying deadly ill and the other not at all concerned about it. He closed the door. But isn't it the same with me? Am I not going from this room into another in which? The room was dark. The door to the bathroom was ajar. There was a light beyond it. Ravik hesitated. He did not know whether Joan was still in the bathroom. Then he heard her breathing. He walked through the room to the bathroom. He did not say anything. He knew she was here and was not asleep, but she too said nothing. Suddenly the room was full of silence and expectancy and tension, like a vortex which silently called, an unknown abyss, beyond thought, from which rose the poppy clouds and the dizziness of a red tumult. He closed the door of the bathroom. In the clear light of the white bulbs everything was familiar and known to him again. He turned on the taps of the shower. It was the only shower in the hotel. Ravik had paid for it himself and had had it installed. He knew that in his absence it was still being shown to the patron's French relatives and friends as a remarkable sight. The hot water ran down his skin. In the next room Joan Mud was lying and waiting for him. Her skin was smooth, her hair surged over the pillow like an impetuous wave, and her eyes shone lucidly even when the room was dark, as if they caught the meager light of winter stars from outside the window and reflected it. She lay there subtle and changeable and exciting because there was nothing left of the woman whom one had known an hour ago, she was everything that enticement and temptation could give without love, and yet all of a sudden he felt something like an aversion to her, a strange resistance mixed with a violent and sudden attraction. He looked around involuntarily, if the bathroom had had a second exit, he thought it possible that he would have dressed and gone out to drink. He dried himself and hesitated for a while. Strange, what had fluttered in from nowhere? A shadow, a nothing. Perhaps it was because he had been with Kate Higstrom? Or because of what Joan had said in the taxi earlier? Much too quick and much too easy. Or simply because someone was waiting, instead of his waiting? He tightened his lips and opened the door. Ravik, Joan said out of the dark. The Galvados is on the table by the window. He stood still. He realized that he had been tense. He could not have stood many things she might have said. This one was right. His tension eased into loose, light certainty. Did you find the bottle? He asked. That was easy. It was standing right here. But I opened it. I discovered a corkscrew somewhere among your things. Give me another glass. He poured two glasses and brought one to her. Here, it was good to feel the clear apple brandy. It was good that Joan had found the right word. She leaned her head back and drank. Her hair fell over her shoulders and in this moment she seemed to be nothing but drinking. Ravik had noticed this in her before. She gave herself completely to whatever she did. It occurred to him vaguely that therein lay not only fascination, but also danger. Such women were nothing but drinking, when they drank, nothing but love when they loved, nothing but desperation when they were desperate, and nothing but forgetfulness when they forgot. Joan put down the glass and laughed suddenly. Ravik, she said. I know what you are thinking. Really? Yes. You felt already half married just now? So did I. To be abandoned at the door is not exactly an enviable experience left alone with roses in one's arms. Thank God, the Calvados was here. Don't be so careful with the bottle. Ravik refilled her glass. You are a wonderful person, he said. It's true. There in the bathroom I could hardly stand you. Now I find you wonderful. Salute. Salute. He drank his Calvados. It is the second night, he said. The dangerous night. The charm of the unknown is gone and the charm of familiarity has not yet come. We'll survive it. 
Joan put her glass down. You seem to know quite a lot about it. I know nothing at all. I just talk. One never knows anything. Everything is always different. Now too. It never is the second night. It is always the first. The second would be the end. Thank God. Otherwise where would it lead? Into something like arithmetic. And now come. I don't want to go to sleep yet. I want to drink with you. The stars stand naked up there in the cold. How easily one can freeze when one is alone. Even when it is hot. Never when there are two. Two together can actually freeze to death. Not we. Naturally not, Ravik said and in the dark she did not see the expression that crossed his face. Not we. 10. What was the matter with me, Ravik? Kate Higstrom asked. She was lying in her bed, slightly raised, with two pillows under her head. The room had the odor of odor santi and perfume. The window was slightly opened at the top. Clear, somewhat chilly air streamed in from the outside and mingled with the warmth of the room as if it were not January but already April. You were feverish, Kate. For a few days. Then you slept. Almost twenty-four hours. Now the fever has gone and everything is fine. How are you feeling? Tired. Still always tired. But different from before. Not so tense anymore. I have hardly any pain. You will have some later. Not very much, and we'll take care of it so you'll be able to stand it. But it won't stay the way it is now. You know that yourself. She nodded. You have cut me up, Ravik. Yes, Kate. Was it necessary? Yes. He waited. It was better to let her ask. How long will I have to be in bed? A few weeks. She remained silent for a while. I think it will be good for me. I need quiet. I'd had enough. I realize it now. I was tired. I did not want to admit it. Did this thing have something to do with it? Certainly. Most certainly. Also the fact that I had hemorrhages from time to time? Between periods? That too, Kate. Then it's a good thing that I have time. Maybe it was necessary. To have to get up now and face all that again, I don't think I could do it. You don't have to. Forget about it. Think only of the very next thing. For instance, of your breakfast. All right. She smiled faintly. Then pass me the mirror. He gave her the hand mirror from the night table. She studied herself attentively in it. Are these flowers from you, Ravik? No. From the hospital. She put the mirror on the bed. Hospitals don't send lilacs in January. Hospitals send asters or something like that. Neither do hospitals know that lilacs are my favorite flowers. Here they do. Here you are a veteran, Kate. Ravik got up. I have to go now. I'll come back about six o'clock to look after you. Ravik. Yes. He turned around. Now it will come, he thought. Now she will ask. She extended her hand. Thanks, she said. Thanks for the flowers. And thanks for looking out for me. I always feel safe with you. All right, Kate. All right. There was nothing really to look out for. And now fall asleep again if you can. In case you should have pains call the nurse. I'll see that you get medicine. This afternoon I'll be back. Weber, where is the brandy? Was it as bad as that? Here's the bottle. Eugenie, get us a glass. Eugenie reluctantly went for a glass. That's a thimble, Weber protested. Get us a decent glass. Or oh wait, it might break your hand, I'll do it myself. I don't know why it is, Dr. Weber, Eugenie declared bitingly. Whenever Mr. Ravik comes in, you. All right, all right, Weber interrupted her. He poured a glass of cognac. Here, Ravik. What does she believe? She does not ask anything, Ravik said. She trusts me without asking questions. Weber glanced up. You see, 
he replied triumphantly. I told you so. Ravik emptied his glass. Has a patient ever expressed his thanks to you when you couldn't do anything for him? Often. And believed everything? Naturally. And how did you feel about it? Relieved, Weber said in astonishment. Very much relieved. I feel like vomiting. Like a fraud. Weber laughed. He put the bottle aside again. Like vomiting, Ravik repeated. That's the first human feeling I ever discovered in you, Eugene he said. Except, naturally, for the way you express yourself. You are not a discoverer, you are a nurse, Eugene he, you often forget that, Weber declared. The affair is settled, Ravik, isn't it? Yes. For the time being. All right. She told the nurse this morning that she wants to go to Florence as soon as she leaves the hospital. Then we're in the clear. Weber rubbed his hands. The doctors over there can take care of it then. I don't like it when someone dies here. It always hurts the reputation. Ravik rang the bell at the apartment door of the midwife who performed the abortion for Lucene. After some time a sinister looking man opened. He kept the latch in his hand when he saw Ravik. What do you want? He growled. I want to speak to Madame Boucher. She has no time. That doesn't matter. I'll wait a while. The man was about to close the door. If I can't wait I'll be back in a quarter of an hour, Ravik said. But not alone. With someone who will certainly be able to see her. The man stared at him. What does that mean? What do you want? I told you. I want to speak to Madame Boucher. The man pondered. Wait, he said and then closed the door. Ravik studied the peeling brown paint on the door, the tin letter box and the round enameled label with the name. A great deal of misery and fear had passed through this door. A few senseless laws which forced so many lives into the hands of quacks instead of doctors. No more children were born because of it. Whoever did not want a child found a way, law or no law. The only difference was that the lives of some thousands of mothers were ruined every year. The door was opened again. Are you from the police? The unshaven man asked. If I were from the police I wouldn't be waiting here. Coming. The man showed Ravik through a dark corridor into a room crowded with furniture. A plush sofa and a number of gilt chairs, an imitation or bus and carpet walnut verticals and pastoral prints on the walls. In front of the window stood a metal stand with a bird cage and a canary in it. Wherever there was any space there were chinaware and plaster figurines. Madame Boucher came in. She was enormously fat and wore a kind of billowing kimono which was not quite clean. She was a monster, but her face was smooth and pretty, with the exception of her eyes, which darted restlessly. Monsieur. She asked in a business-like tone and remained standing. Ravik got up. I come in behalf of Lucine Martinet. You performed an abortion for her. Nonsense. The woman replied immediately with complete calm. I don't know any Lucine Martinet and I don't perform abortions. You must be mistaken or someone has told you a lie. She acted as if the affair were settled and was about to leave. But she didn't go. Ravik waited. She turned around. Something else? The abortion was a failure. The girl had serious hemorrhages and almost died. She had to have an operation. I operated on her. It's a lie. Madame Boucher suddenly hissed. It's a lie. Those rats. They fool around trying to fix themselves up and then get other people into trouble. But I'll show her. Those rats. My lawyer will settle that. I am well known and a taxpayer and I'll see whether such an impudent little slut that whores around. Ravik studied her, fascinated. Her expression did not change during the outburst. It remained smooth and pretty, her mouth only was drawn in and spat like a machine gun. The girl wants very little, he interrupted the woman. She only wants back the money she paid you. Madame Boucher laughed money? Payback. When did I get any from her? 
Has she a receipt? Naturally not. You wouldn't give any receipts. Because I've never seen her. And would anyone believe her? Yes. She has witnesses. She was operated on in Dr. Weber's hospital. The diagnosis was clear. A report exists about it. You may have a thousand reports. Where does it say that I touched her? Hospital. Dr. Weber. It's a scream. Such a rat goes to an elegant hospital. Haven't you got anything else to do? I have. Listen. The girl paid you 300 francs. She can sue you for compensation. The door was opened. The sinister man entered. Something wrong, Adele? No. Sue for compensation? If she goes to court she herself will be sentenced. First of all she, that's certain because she admits that an abortion was done for her. That I did it still has to be proved. That she can't. The sinister man bleated. Quiet, Roger, Madame Boucher said. You may go. Brunier is outside. All right. Tell him to wait. You know. The man nodded and left. With him went a strong smell of cognac. Ravik sniffed. That's an old cognac, he said. At least thirty, forty years old. Lucky man who drinks something like that early in the afternoon. Madame Boucher stared at him for a moment, flabbergasted. Then she slowly drew in her lips. That's right. Do you want some? Why not? In spite of her fat she was at the door with surprising speed and silentness. Roger. The sinister man came in. You've been drinking the good cognac again. Don't lie, I smell it. Bring the bottle. Don't talk. Bring the bottle. Roger brought the bottle. I gave Brunia some. He forced me to drink with him. Madame Boucher did not answer. She closed the door and fetched a curved glass from the walnut vertical. Ravik looked at it with disgust. The head of a woman was engraved on it. Madame Boucher poured and put the glass in front of him on the tablecloth, which was adorned with peacocks. You seem to be a sensible person, sir, she said. Ravik could not deny her a certain respect. She was not of iron, as Lucine had told him, she was worse, of rubber. You could break iron. Not rubber. Her argument against collecting damages was sound. Your operation was a failure, he said. It had serious consequences. This should be reason enough for you to refund the money. Do you pay money back if a patient dies after an operation? No. But sometimes we don't take any money for an operation. For instance, from Lucene. Madame Boucher looked at him. You see, then why is she making such a fuss? She should be glad. Ravik lifted his glass. Madam, he said, my respects. One can't get the better of you. The woman slowly put the bottle on the table. Sir, many have already tried it. But you seem to be more sensible. Do you think this business is fun? Or all the money mine? The police get almost a hundred francs of those three hundred. Do you believe that I could work otherwise? One of them is sitting outside now to get money. I have to bribe them, always bribe them, there's no other way. I tell you that here, alone, between the two of us, and should you want to make use of it somehow, I'd deny it and the police would pay no attention. You may believe that? I believe it. Madame Boucher cast a quick look at him. When she saw that he did not mean it ironically, she moved a chair closer to him and sat down. She moved the chair like a feather, beneath her fat she seemed to have enormous strength. She refilled his glass with the cognac reserved for bribes. Three hundred francs looks like a good deal of money, but there are more expenses than just the police. The rent, naturally higher for me than for someone else, laundry, instruments, for me twice as expensive as for physicians, commissions bribes, I must be on good terms with everyone, drinks, presents at New Year and on birthdays for the officials and their wives, that's something, sir. Sometimes hardly anything is left. I don't question that. Then what? 
that the sort of thing can happen that happened to Lucine. Does it never happen with doctors? Madame Boucher asked quickly. Not so often by far. Sir. She straightened up. I'm honest. I tell every one of the girls who come here that something might happen. And none of them leaves. They beg me to do it. They cry and are desperate. They would commit suicide if I didn't help them. What scenes have been staged here? They roll on the rug and entreat me. Do you see the corner of that vertigo there where the veneer is chipped off? A well-to-do lady did that in her desperation. I took care of her. Do you want to see something? Ten pounds of plum jam she sent yesterday are in the kitchen. Out of pure gratitude although she had paid. I'll tell you something, sir, Madame Boucher's voice rose and became fuller you may call me an abortionist, others call me their benefactress and angel. She had got up. The kimono billowed around her majestically. The canary began to sing in his cage as if by command. Ravik got up. He had a feeling for melodrama. But he knew too that Madame Boucher did not exaggerate. All right, he said. I'll go now. For Lucine you weren't exactly a benefactress. You should have seen her before. What more does she want? She's healthy, the child is done with, that was all she wanted. And she doesn't have to pay for the hospital. She'll never be able to have a child again. Madame Boucher hesitated a second only. All the better, she declared, unmoved. Then she will be overjoyed, that little whore. Ravik realized that there was nothing to be done. Au revoir, madam, he said. It has been interesting here with you. She came close to him. Ravik would have liked to avoid shaking hands with her. But that was not her intention. She lowered her voice in a confidential manner. You are sensible, sir. More sensible than most doctors. It's a pity that you, she hesitated and looked at him encouragingly. Sometimes one needs for certain cases, an understanding physician could then be of great help. Ravik did not object. He wanted to hear more. It would not harm you, Madame Boucher added. Just in special cases, she studied him like a cat that pretends to love birds. There are well-to-do clients among them sometimes, naturally always payment in advance and, we are safe, completely safe from the police. I assume you could very well use a few hundred francs on the side, she tapped him on his shoulder. A good looking man like you. She seized the bottle with a broad smile. Well, what do you think? Thanks, Ravik said and kept her from pouring. No more. I can't stand much. He refused with great reluctance, for the cognac was excellent. The bottle had no label and certainly came from a first class private cellar. I'll think the other matter over. I'll come again sometime. I'd like to see your instruments. Maybe I can give you some advice as far as they are concerned. I'll show you my instruments when you come again. Then you'll show me your papers. Confidence for confidence. You've already shown me some confidence. Not the least. Madame Boucher smiled. I only made you a proposition which I can deny at any time. You're not a Frenchman, one can hear that, although you speak well. Nor do you look it. You're probably a refugee. She smiled more broadly and looked at him with cool eyes. One wouldn't believe you and would be, at best, interested in the French diploma which you haven't got. Outside in the hall sits a police official. If you want to, you can denounce me right away. You won't do it. But you can think over my proposition. You wouldn't give me your name and address, would you? No, Ravik said, feeling beaten. I thought not. Madame Boucher really looked like a huge well-fed cat now. Au revoir, monsieur. Consider my offer. I've often before thought of working with the assistance of a refugee doctor. Ravik smiled. He knew why. A refugee doctor would be completely at her mercy. If anything happened he would be guilty. I'll think it over, he said. Au revoir, madam. He walked along the dark corridor. Behind one of the doors he heard someone moaning. 
he assumed that the rooms were arranged like small cabins with beds. The women would stay there before they totted home. A slim man with a trimmed moustache and an olive-coloured skin sat in the hall. He studied Ravik attentively. Roger sat at his side. He had another bottle of the old cognac on the table. He tried to hide it instinctively when he saw Ravik. Then he grinned and dropped his hand. Bonsoir, doctor, he said and showed his stained teeth. It seemed he had been eavesdropping at the door. Bonsoir, Roger. It seemed to Ravik appropriate to be intimate. This indestructible woman had almost changed him from an outspoken enemy into an accomplice within half an hour in there. And so it was actually a relief to be not too formal with Roger who, after all that, had something astonishingly human about him. Downstairs he met two girls. They were looking from door to door. Sir, one of them asked with determination, does Madame Boucher live here in this house? Ravik hesitated. But what point was there in saying anything? It would not help at all. They would go. Then too he could not give them any other directions. On the third floor. There is a nameplate on the door. The luminous dial of his watch shone in the dark like a tiny imitation sun. It was five o'clock in the morning. Joan should have come at three. It was still possible that she would come. Also possible that she was too tired and had gone straight to her hotel. Ravik stretched out to go back to sleep. But he could not fall asleep. He lay awake for a long time and looked at the ceiling where the red band from the electric signs on the roof opposite ran at regular intervals. He felt empty and did not know why. It was as if the warmth of his body were slowly seeping through his skin, and as if his blood wanted to lean against something that was not there and that it fell and fell into a soft nothingness. He crossed his hands behind his head and lay quiet. Now he knew he was waiting. And he knew it was not only his consciousness that waited for Joan Mudd. His hands waited and his veins and a strangely alien tenderness within him. He got up, put on his dressing gown and sat down by the window. He felt the warmth of the soft wool on his skin. The robe was old, he had had it with him for many years. He had slept in it on his flights, he had warmed himself in it during the cold nights in Spain when, dead tired. He had come back from the field hospital to his barracks. Juana, twelve years old, with eyes eighty years old, had died under it in a wrecked hotel in Madrid, with the single wish sometime to own a dress of the same soft wool and to forget how her mother had been ravished and her father trampled to death. He looked around. The room, a few suitcases, some belongings, a handful of well-read books. A man needed few things to live. And it was good not to get used to many things when life was unsettled. Again and again one had to abandon them or they were taken away. One should be ready to leave every day. That was the reason he had lived alone, when one was on the move one should not have anything that could bind one. Nothing that could stir the heart. The adventure, but nothing more. He looked at the bed. The crumpled colorless linen. It did not matter that he waited. He had often waited for women. But he felt that he had waited differently, simply, clearly, and brutally. Also sometimes with the anonymous tenderness that inches his desire with silver, but for a long time not as he waited today. Something had crept into him to which he had not paid any attention. Did it stir again? Did it move? How long ago was it? Did something call again out of oblivion? Out of blue depths, did it again blow across him like the breath of meadows, full of peppermint, with a row of poplars against the horizon and the smell of woods in April? He did not want to possess anything. He did not want to be possessed. He was on the move. He got up and began to dress. One must remain independent. Everything began with small dependencies. One did not notice them much. And suddenly one was entangled in the net of habit. Habit for which many names existed, love was one of them. One should not grow accustomed to anything. Not even to a body. He did not lock the door. If Joan came she would not find him. She could stay if she wanted to. He deliberated for a second whether to leave a note. 
But he did not want to lie, nor did he want to tell her where he had gone. He returned about eight o'clock in the morning. He had walked in the cold under the street lights of early dawn and had felt clear and relaxed. But as he stood in front of the hotel he felt again the tenseness. Joan was not there. Ravik assured himself that he had not expected anything else. But his room seemed to him emptier than usual. He looked around and searched for a sign of her having been there. He found nothing. He rang for the maid. She came after a while. I'd like some breakfast, he said. She looked at him. She said nothing. He didn't want to ask her any questions. Coffee and croissants, Eve. Very well, Mr. Avic. He looked at the bed. If Joan had come one could not very well have expected her to lie down in a crumpled empty bed. Odd, how dead everything became that had to do with the body when there was no longer any warmth, a bed, underwear, even a bath. It was repulsive when it had lost its warmth. He lighted a cigarette. She might have assumed that he had been called to see a patient. But then he could have left a note. Suddenly he thought himself a good deal of an idiot. He wanted to be independent and succeeded only in being inconsiderate. Inconsiderate and foolish like an eighteen-year-old who wants to prove something to himself. There was more dependency in this than if he had waited. The girl brought his breakfast. Shall I do the bed now? She asked. Why now? In case you still want to go to sleep. One sleeps better in a freshly made bed. She looked at him without expression. Was someone here? He asked. I don't know. I only came at seven. Eve, he said, how does it feel to have to make a dozen strangers' beds every morning? It's all right, Mr. Avic. As long as the people don't want anything else. But there are always a few who want more. Though the brothels are so cheap in Paris. In the morning one can't go into a brothel, Eve. And some guests feel particularly strong in the morning. Yes, especially the old ones. She shrugged her shoulders. You lose the tip if you don't do it, that's all. Then too some make complaints every minute afterwards, that the room is not clean or that you are fresh. Naturally, out of anger. You can't do anything about it. That's how life is. Ravik pulled a bill out of his pocket. Let's make life somewhat easier today, Eve. Buy yourself a hat with that. Or a woolen jacket. Eve's eyes lost their dull expression. Thank you, Mr. Avic. Today is starting well. Then should I make your bed later? Yes. She looked at him. The lady is a very interesting lady, she said. The lady who keeps coming here now. One more word and I'll take the money away from you. Ravik pushed Eve out of the door. The old lechers are waiting for you. Don't disappoint them. He sat down at the table and ate. The breakfast did not taste particularly good. He got up and continued to eat standing. It tasted better. The sun hung red above the roofs. The hotel was waking up. Old man Goldberg on the floor below began his morning concert. He coughed and groaned as if he had six lungs. The refugee Wiesenhoff opened his window and whistled a parade march. On the upper floor water gushed. Doors were slammed. Ravik stretched himself. The night had gone. The corruption of the dark was done with. He decided to remain alone for a few days. Outside the newspaper boys were calling out the morning news. Incidents at the Czechoslovakian frontier. German troops at the Sudeten line. The Munich pack jeopardized. 11. The boy did not scream. He just stared at the doctors. He was still too stunned to feel any pain. Ravik glanced at the crushed leg. How old is he? He asked the mother. What? The woman asked uncomprehendingly. How old is he? The woman with the kerchief over her head moved her lips. His leg. She said. His leg. It was a truck. Ravik listened to his heart. Has he been sick? His leg. The woman said. It is his leg. Ravik straightened up. 
the heart was beating quickly like a bird's, but there was nothing alarming in the sound. During anesthesia he would have to watch the boy, who looked emaciated and rachitic. He had to start immediately. The torn leg was full of street dirt. Will you cut my leg off? The boy asked. No, Ravik said without believing it. It's better if you cut it off instead of its being stiff. Ravik looked attentively at the precocious face. There was not yet any sign of pain in it. We'll see, he said. Now we'll have to put you to sleep. It's very simple. You needn't be afraid. Be quite calm. One minute, sir. The number is for 2019. Will you put it down to my mother? What? What, Jeanette? His mother asked, startled. I noticed the number. The number of the car. For 2019. I saw it close in front of me. There was a red light. It was the driver's fault. The boy began to breathe laboriously. The insurance company must pay. The number? I wrote it down, Ravik said. Be calm. I wrote everything down. He motioned to Eugenie to start the anesthetic. My mother must go to the police. The insurance company must pay. Large beads of perspiration appeared on his face as suddenly as if it had been rained on. If you amputate the leg they pay more, than if it, remains stiff. His eyes were sunk in blue-black circles which stood out from his skin like dirty ponds. The boy moaned and tried quickly to say something. My mother, doesn't understand, help, her, he could no longer go on. He began to scream, dull repressed screams as if a tortured animal cowered within him. How is the world outside, Ravik? Kate Higstrom asked. Why do you want to know that, Kate? Rather think of something pleasanter. I feel as though I have been here for weeks already. Everything else is so remote. As if submerged? Let it remain submerged for a while. No. Otherwise I'll be afraid that this room is the last ark and that the deluge is already below the window. What's going on outside, Ravik? Nothing new, Kate. The world goes on eagerly preparing for suicide and at the same time deluding itself about what it's doing. Will there be war? Everyone knows that there will be war. What one does not yet know is when. Everyone expects a miracle. Ravik smiled. Never before have I seen so many politicians who believe in miracles as at present in France and England. And never so few as in Germany. She remained lying silent for a while. To think that it should be possible, she said then. Yes, it seems so impossible that it will happen some day. Just because one considers it so impossible and doesn't protect oneself against it. Do you have pain, Kate? Not so much that I can't stand it. She adjusted her pillow under her head. I'd like to get away from all this, Ravik. Yes, he replied without conviction. Who wouldn't like to? When I get out of here I'll go to Italy. To Fiesole. I have a quiet old house there with the garden. I want to stay there for a while. It will still be cool. A veiled serene sun. At noon the early lizards on the south walls. In the evening the bells of Florence. And at night the moon and the stars behind the cypresses. There are books in the house and there is a big stone fireplace with wooden benches around it. The andirons for the wood are set up in such a manner as to hold a stand where one can put one's glass. Red wine is warm that way. No people. Only an old couple to keep one's things in order. She looked at Ravik. Beautiful, he said. Quiet, a fireplace, books, and peace. In former days that sort of thing was considered bourgeois. Today it's the dream of a lost paradise. She nodded. I want to stay there for a while. A few weeks. Maybe even a few months. I don't know yet. I want to become calm. And then I'll return and pack and go to America. Ravik heard supper trays being carried in the corridor. The rattling of a few dishes. You are right, Kate, he said. She hesitated. Can I still have a child, 
Ravik. Not right away. You've got to become much stronger first. I don't mean that. Can I have it sometime? After this operation? Isn't. No, Ravik said. We didn't remove anything. Not a thing. She took a deep breath. That's what I wanted to know. But it will still take a long time, Kate. Your entire organism must change first. It does not matter how long it takes. She smoothed her hair. The stone on her hand glittered in the dark. It is ridiculous that I am asking for that, isn't it? Just now? No. That happens often. More often than one would think. Suddenly I have had enough of all this. I want to go back and marry, for good, the old-fashioned way, and have children and be calm and praise God and love life. Ravik looked out of the window. The wild red of the sunset hung over the roofs. The electric signs were drowned in it like bloodless shadows of colors. It must seem absurd to you, after all you know about me, Kate Higstrom said behind him. No, not at all. I've thought about it these last two days. And I feel younger and lighter than I have for longer than I can remember. When I'm over there I'll forget the years here like a senseless dream. Joan Mud came at four o'clock at night. Ravik woke up when he heard someone at the door. He had gone to sleep, not expecting her. He saw her standing in the open door. She tried to force her way through with an armful of giant chrysanthemums. He did not see her face. He only saw her figure and the huge bright blossoms. What is that? He said. A forest of chrysanthemums. For heaven's sake, what does it mean? Joan got the flowers through the door and flung them with a flourish onto the bed. The blossoms were wet and cool and the leaves smelled of autumn and earth. Presents, she said. Since I know you I'm beginning to get presents. Take them away. I'm not dead yet. To lie under flowers, what's more, chrysanthemums, the good old bed of the Hotel International really looks like a coffin. No. Joan snatched up the flowers from the bed with a violent movement and threw them on the floor. You mustn't, she straightened up. Don't talk like that. Ever. Ravik looked at her. He had forgotten how they had met. Forget it, he said. I didn't mean anything. Don't talk like that ever again. Not even as a joke. Promise. He saw her lips trembling. But, he said. Does it really frighten you so? Yes. It is even worse. I don't know what it is. Ravik got up. I'll never make a joke about it again. Are you satisfied now? She nodded, leaning on his shoulder. I don't know what it is. I simply can't stand it. It's like a hand reaching out of the dark. It is fear, blind fear as if it were lying in wait somewhere for me. She pressed close to him. Don't let it happen. Ravik held her tight in his arms. No, I won't let it happen. She nodded again. You can do it. Yes, he said with a voice full of sadness and derision, thinking of Kate Higstrom. I can. Of course I can. She moved in his arms. I was here yesterday. Ravik did not move. You were? Yes. He was silent. Suddenly something perished. How childish he had been. Waiting or not waiting, to what purpose? A foolish game with someone who did not play games. You were not here. No. I know I shouldn't ask you where you were. No. She freed herself from his embrace. I'd like to take a bath, she said in a changed voice. Outside it's snowing. I'm cold. Can I still do it? On will it wake up the hotel? Ravik smiled. Don't ask about the consequences if you want to do something. Otherwise you'll never do it. She looked at him. One should ask in trifling matters. Never in great ones. Also correct. She went into the bathroom and let the water run. Ravik sat down by the window and reached for a box of cigarettes. Outside over the roofs stood the red reflection of the town where silently the snow drifted. 
a taxi whined through the streets. The chrysanthemums gleamed palely on the floor. A newspaper was lying on the sofa. He had brought it along in the evening. Fighting at the Czechoslovakian frontier. Fighting in China. An ultimatum. An overthrown cabinet. He took the paper and pushed it under the chrysanthemums. Joan came out of the bathroom. She was warm and crouched on the floor beside him among the flowers. Where were you last night? She asked. He reached her down a cigarette. Do you really want to know? Yes. He hesitated. I was here, he said then, and waited for you. I thought you weren't coming and then I left. Joan waited. Her cigarette glowed in the dark and died away again. That's all, Ravik said. Did you go out to drink? Yes. Joan turned around and looked at him. Ravik, she said, did you really go away because of that? Yes. She put her arms on his knees. He felt her warmth through the dressing gown. It was her warmth and the warmth of the gown which was more familiar to him than many years of his life and suddenly it seemed to him as if both had belonged together for a long time and as if Joan had returned to him from somewhere out of his life. Ravik, I've come to you every night. You ought to have known that I'd come yesterday too. Didn't you go out because you didn't want to see me? No. You can tell me when you don't want to see me. I would tell you. Wasn't it that? No, it was really not that. Then I'm happy. Ravik looked at her. What did you say? I'm happy, she repeated. He fell silent for a while. Do you really know what you're saying? He asked. Yes. The pale radiance from outside was mirrored in her eyes. One shouldn't say something like that lightly, Joan. I'm not saying it lightly. Happiness, Ravik said. Where does it start and where does it end? His foot touched the chrysanthemums. Happiness, he thought. The blue horizons of youth. The golden bright balance of life. Happiness. My God, where was it now? It starts with you and ends with you, Joan said. That is quite simple. Ravik did not reply. What is she talking about? He thought. Soon you will tell me that you love me, he said then. I love you. He made a gesture. You hardly know me, Joan. What has that to do with it? Much. Love, that means someone you want to grow old with. I don't know anything about that. It is someone you cannot live without. That's what I know. Where is the Calvados? Ravik asked. On the table. I'll get it for you. Stay where you are. She brought the bottle and a glass and put them on the floor with the flowers. I know that you don't love me, she said. Then you know more than I do. She looked up quickly. You will love me, she said. Fine. Let us drink to that. Wait. She filled the glass and drained it. Then she filled it again and handed it to him. He took it and held it for a moment. All this is not true, he thought. A half dream in the waning night. Words spoken in the dark, how can they be true? Genuine words need much light. How do you know all that so precisely? He asked. Because I love you. How she handles that word, Ravik thought. Without deliberation, like an empty bowl. She fills it with something and calls it love. With how many things had it been filled already? With fear of being alone with stimulation through another ego, with the boosting of one's self-reliance, with the glittering reflection of one's fantasy, but who really knows? Wasn't what I said about growing old together the stupidest thing of all? Isn't she far more right with her spontaneousness? And why do I sit here on a winter night, between wars, and spout words like a schoolmaster? Why do I resist, instead of plunging myself into it disbelievingly? Why do you resist? Joan asked. What? Why do you resist? She repeated. I don't resist, what should I resist? I don't know. 
something within you is closed up and you don't want to let anything or anyone in. Come, Ravik said, let me have another drink. I am happy and I wish you were happy, too. I am completely happy. I wake up with you and I go to sleep with you. I don't know anything else. My head is made of silver when I think of both of us and sometimes it is like a violin. The streets are full of us as if we were music, and from time to time people break in and talk and pictures flash by like a movie, but the music remains. That always remains. A few weeks ago you were still unhappy, Ravik thought, and you did not know me. Uneasy happiness. He emptied his glass of Calvados. Have you been happy often? He asked. Not often. But sometimes. When was the last time your head was made of silver? Why do you ask me? Just to ask something. Without a reason. I have forgotten. And I don't want to know any more. It was different. It's always different. She smiled at him. Her face was bright and open like a flower with few leaves that hid nothing. Two years ago, she said. It did not last long. In Milan. Were you alone at the time? No. I was with someone else. He was very unhappy and jealous and did not understand. Naturally not. You would understand. He made terrible scenes. She made herself comfortable, pulled a pillow down from the sofa and pushed it behind her back. He called me a whore and faithless and ungrateful. It wasn't true. I was faithful as long as I loved him. He didn't understand that I did not love him any longer. One never understands that. Yes, you would understand. But I would always love you. You are different and everything is different with us. He wanted to kill me. She laughed. They always want to kill. A few months later the other one wanted to kill me. But they never do it. You would never want to kill me. Only with Galvados, Ravik said. Pass the bottle. The conversation, thank God, is becoming more human. A few minutes ago I was pretty frightened. Because I love you? We won't start that again. That's like parading about in a frock coat and a powdered wig. We are together, for shorter or longer, who knows. We are together, that's enough. Why do we have to labor lit? I don't like that for shorter or longer. But those are only words. You won't leave me. These two are only words, and you know it. Naturally. Has anyone you loved ever left you? Yes. She looked at him. One always leaves the other. Sometimes the other is quicker. And what did you do? Everything. She took the glass out of his hands and finished it. Everything. But it didn't help. I was terribly unhappy. For long? For a week. About a week. That isn't long. It's an eternity if you are really unhappy. I was so unhappy with every part of me that everything was exhausted after a week. My hair was unhappy, my skin, my bed, even my clothes. I was so filled with unhappiness that nothing else existed. And if nothing else exists anymore, unhappiness ceases to be unhappiness, because there is nothing left with which to compare it. Then it is nothing but complete exhaustion. And then it is over. Slowly one starts to live again. She kissed his hand. He felt the soft cautious lips. What are you thinking of? She asked. Of nothing. Nothing but that you are of a wild innocence. Completely corrupt and not corrupt at all. The most dangerous thing in the world. Give me back the glass. I'll drink to my friend Morosau, the connoisseur of the human heart. I don't like Morosau. Can't we drink to someone else? Naturally you don't like him. He has keen eyes. Let's drink to you. To me? Yes, to you. I'm not dangerous, Joan said. I'm in danger, but not dangerous. The fact that you think so is part of it. Nothing will ever happen to you. Salute. Salute. But you don't understand me. Who wants to understand? That's the cause of all misunderstandings in the world. Pass me the bottle. You drink too much. 
Why do you want to drink so much? Joan, Ravik said, the day will come when you will say, too much. You drink too much, you'll say and believe that you desire my good only. In reality, you will simply want to prevent my excursions into a sphere which you cannot control. Salute. Today we celebrate. We have gloriously escaped pathos which stood like a fat cloud outside the window. We slew it with pathos. Salute. She straightened up. She propped herself with her hands on the floor and looked at him. Her eyes were wide open, the bathrobe had slipped down from her shoulders, her hair was thrown back on the nape of her neck, and there was something of a bright young lioness about her in the dark. I know, she said calmly, you're laughing at me, I know it and I don't mind. I feel that I'm alive, I feel it in my whole being, my breath is different and my sleep is no longer dead, my joints have purpose again and my hands are no longer empty and it does not matter to me what you think about it and what you may say about it, I let myself fly and I let myself run and I throw myself into it, without a thought, and I am happy and I am neither cautious nor afraid of saying it, even if you do laugh at me and make fun of me. Ravik was silent for a while. I'm not making fun of you, he then said. I'm making fun of myself, Joan. She leaned toward him. Why? There is something in the back of your head that resists. Why? There is nothing that resists. I am just slower than you are. She shook her head. It's not only that. There's something that wants to remain alone. I feel it. It's like a barrier. There's no barrier. That is merely fifteen more years of life than you have had. Not everyone's life is like a house that belongs to him and that he can go on decorating even more richly with the furniture of his memory. Some people live in hotels, in many hotels. The years close behind them like hotel doors, and the only thing that remains is a little courage and no regrets. She did not answer for some time. He did not know whether she had listened to him or not. He looked out of the window and calmly felt the deep glow of the Calvados in his veins. The beat of the pulses was still and became a widespread quietness in which the machine guns of ceaselessly ticking time were silent. The moon rose, a blurred red, over the roofs like the cupola of a mosque, half hidden by clouds, emerging slowly while the earth sank into the drifting snow. I know, Joan said her hands on his knees and her chin on her hands, it's foolish to tell you these earlier things about myself. I could be silent or I could lie, but I don't want to. Why should I not tell you everything about my life and why should I make more out of it? I'd rather make less out of it because it is laughable to me now and I don't understand it any more. and you may laugh about it and also about me too. Ravik looked at her. One of her knees was crushing a few of the large white blossoms against the newspaper he had bought. A strange night, he thought. Somewhere now there is shooting and men are being hunted and imprisoned and tortured and murdered, some corner of a peaceful world is being trampled upon, and one knows it, helplessly, and life buzzes on in the bright bistros of the city, no one cares, and people go calmly to sleep and I am sitting here with a woman between pale chrysanthemums and a bottle of Calvados, and the shadow of love rises, trembling, lonesome, strange and sad, it to an exile from the safe gardens of the past, shy and wild and quick as if it had no right. Joan, he said slowly and wanted to say something entirely different, it is good that you are here. She looked at him. He took her hands. You understand what that means? more than a thousand other words. She nodded. Suddenly her eyes were filled with tears. It doesn't mean anything, she said, I know. That's not true, Ravik replied and knew that she was right. No, nothing at all. You must love me, beloved. That's all. He did not answer. You must love me, she repeated. Otherwise I'm lost. Lost, he thought. What a word! How easily she uses it! Who is really lost does not talk. 12. Did you take my leg off? Gina tasked. 
His thin face was bloodless and white like the wall of an old house. His freckles stood out very large and dark as though they did not belong to his face but were drops of paint sprinkled over it. The stump of his leg lay under a wire basket over which the blanket was drawn. Have you any pain? Ravik asked. Yes. In my foot. My foot hurts very much. I asked the nurse. The old dragon wouldn't tell me. The leg has been amputated, Ravik said. Above the knee or below the knee? Ten centimeters above it. Your knee was crushed and could not be saved. Good, Jeanette said. That makes about 15% more from the insurance company. Very good. An artificial leg is an artificial leg, whether above or below the knee. But 15% more is something you can put into your pocket every month. He hesitated for a moment. For the time being you'd better not tell my mother. She can't see it anyway with this parrot cage over the stump. We won't tell her anything, Jeanet. The insurance company must pay an annuity for life. That's correct, isn't it? I think so. His face twisted into a grimace. They'll be surprised. I am thirteen years old. They'll have to pay for a long time. Do you know yet which insurance company it is? Not yet. But we have the number of the car. You kept it in mind. The police have been here already. They want to question you. You were still asleep this morning. They'll come again tonight. Jeanette deliberated. Witnesses, he said then. It's important that we have witnesses. Have we any? I think your mother has two addresses. She had the slips of paper in her hand. The boy became restless. She'll lose them. If only she hasn't lost them already. You know how old people are. Where is she now? Your mother sat at your bedside all night and until noon today. Only then were we able to send her away. She'll come back again soon. Let's hope she'll still have them. The police, he made a weak gesture with his emaciated hand. Cheat, he murmured. They are all cheats. In cahoots with the insurance companies. But if one has good witnesses, when will she come back? Soon. Don't get excited about it. It'll be all right. Jeanet moved his mouth as if he were chewing something. Sometimes they pay the whole amount at once. A settlement instead of an annuity. We could start a business with it, mother and I. Now rest, Ravik said. You'll have time to think about it later. The boy shook his head. You will, Ravik repeated. You must be rested when the police come. Yes, you're right. What shall I do? Sleep. But then. They'll wake you up. Red light. I'm sure it was a red light. Certainly. And now try to sleep. There is a bell in case you should need anything. Doctor. Yes? Ravik turned around. If everything works out. Jeanet lay on his pillow and something like a smile flitted across his twisted, precocious face. Sometimes one is lucky after all, isn't one? The evening was humid and warm. Tattered clouds floated low over the city. In front of Fuki's restaurant, circular coke ovens had been set up. A few tables and chairs stood around them. Morosa was sitting at one of them. He beckoned to Ravik. Come, have a drink with me. Ravik sat down beside him. We sit too much in rooms, Morosau declared. Has that ever occurred to you? But you don't. You're always standing in front of the Shaherazada. My boy, spare me your miserable logic. Evenings I'm a sort of two-leg door at the Shaherazada, but not a human being in the open. We live in rooms too much, I say. We think too much in rooms. We make love too much in rooms. We despair too much in rooms. Can you despair in the open? And how? Ravik said. Only because we live too much in rooms. Not if one is used to the open. One despairs more decently in a landscape than in a two-room and kitchenette apartment. More comfortably, too. Don't contradict me. To contradict shows an occidental narrowness of the mind. 
who actually wants to be right. Today is my day off and I wish to absorb life. By the way, we also drink too much in rooms. We also urinate too much in rooms. Get away with your irony. The facts of life are simple and trivial. Only our imagination gives life to them. It makes the laundry pole of facts a flagstaff of dreams. Am I right? No. Of course not. I don't even want to be. Of course you are right. Good, brother. We also sleep too much in rooms. We become pieces of furniture. Stone buildings have broken our spines. We have become walking sofas, dressing tables, safes, leases, salaries, kitchen pots, and water toilets. Correct. Walking party platforms, ammunition factories, institutes for the blind and asylums for the insane. Don't keep interrupting me. Drink, be quiet and live, you murderer with the scalpel. See what has become of us. As far as I know, only the old Greeks had gods of drinking and the joy of life, Bacchus and Dionysus. Instead of that we have Freud, inferiority complexes and the psychoanalysis. We're afraid of the two great words in love and not afraid of much two great words in politics. A sorry generation. Morosa winked. Rather quinked, too. Good old cynic with dreams, he said. Are you engaged in improving the world again? Morosa grinned. I'm engaged in feeling it, you romantic without illusions, for a short time on earth, called Ravik. Ravik laughed. For a very short time. This is now my third life as far as names go. Is this Polish vodka? Estonian. From Riga. The best. Poor, and then let us sit calmly here and stare at the most beautiful street in the world and praise this mild evening and casually spit in the face of despair. The fire in the coke ovens crackled. A man with a violin took up a position by the curb and began to play Orpas de Marblonde. Passers by jostled him, the bow scraped, but the man continued to play as if he were alone. It sounded thin and empty. The violin seemed to be freezing. Two Moroccans went from table to table and offered garish carpets of artificial silk. The newspaper boys passed with the latest editions. Morosau bought the Paris Sawyer and the Interransigent. He read the headlines and pushed the newspapers aside. They are all damned counterfeiters, he growled. Have you ever observed that we are living in the age of counterfeiters? No. I thought we were living in the age of cans. Cans? How so? Ravik pointed at the newspapers. Cans. We don't have to think anymore. Everything is premeditated, pre-chewed, pre-felt. Cans. All you have to do is open them. Delivered to your home three times a day. Nothing any more to cultivate yourself, or let grow and boil on the fire of questions, of doubt, and of desire. Cans. He grinned. We don't live easily, Boris. Just cheaply. Cans with false labels. Morosau lifted the papers. Counterfeiting. Take a look at that. They build their ammunition factories because they want peace, their concentration camps because they love the truth, justice is the cover for every factional madness, political gangsters are saviors, and freedom is the big word for all greed for power. Counterfeit money. Counterfeit spiritual money. The liar's propaganda. Kitchen Machiavellism. Idealism in the hands of the underworld. If at least they would be honest, he crushed the newspapers together and threw them away. Very likely we are reading too many newspapers in rooms, Ravik said and laughed. Naturally. In the open one only needs them to start a fire. Morosa stopped abruptly. Ravik was no longer sitting beside him. He had jumped up and was pushing his way through the crowd in front of the cafe in the direction of the Avenue George V. Morosa sat for a second, astonished. Then he pulled some money out of his pocket, threw it onto a china plate beside the glasses, and followed Ravik. He did not know what had happened but he followed him anyhow, to be at hand if he should need him. He saw no police. 
neither did he see any plain clothes detectives hunting Ravik. The sidewalks were packed with people. Good for him, Morosa thought. If a policeman recognized him, he can easily escape. He saw Ravik again only when he had reached the Avenue George V. The traffic lights changed at that moment and the jammed lines of cars dashed forward. Notwithstanding, Ravik tried to cross the street. A taxi almost knocked him down. The cab driver was furious. Morosau grabbed Ravik's arm from behind and pulled him back. Are you mad? He cried. Do you want to commit suicide? What's the matter? Ravik did not answer. He stared across the street. The traffic was very dense. Car after car, four rows deep. It was impossible to get through. Moros shook him. What happened, Ravik? The police? No. Ravik did not take his eyes from the passing cars. What is it? What is it, Ravik? Hike? What? Morosau's eyes narrowed. What does he look like? Quick! Quick, Ravik! A grey coat. The shrill whistle of the traffic policeman came from the middle of the Champs Elysees. Eh? Ravik dashed across between the last cars. A dark grey coat, that was all he knew. He crossed the Avenue George V and the Rubasno. Suddenly there were dozens of grey coats. He cursed and walked on as quickly as he could. The traffic had stopped at the Rue Galilee. He rapidly crossed it and ruthlessly pushed his way through the crowd, along the Champs Elysees. Eh? He came to the Rue de Presbourg, crossed it, and suddenly stood still. Before him was the place de Isle, huge, confusing, full of traffic, with streets branching off in all directions. Gone. No one could be found here. He turned around slowly, still scrutinizing the faces of the crowd, but his excitement was gone. Suddenly he felt very empty. He must have been mistaken again, or Hag had escaped him a second time. But could one be mistaken twice? Could someone disappear from the surface of the earth twice? There were the side streets. Hag could have turned into one of those. He looked along the Rue de Presburg. Cars, cars, and people, people. The busiest hour of the evening. There was no point in searching along them. Too late again. Nothing? Morosau asked when he caught up with him. Ravik shook his head. I am probably seeing ghosts again. Did you recognize him? I thought so. Only just a minute ago. Now, now I don't know at all. Morosau looked at him. There are many faces that look alike, Ravik. Yes, and some that one never forgets. Ravik stood still. What do you want to do? Morosau asked. I don't know. What can I do now? Morosau stared into the crowd. Damned bad luck. Just at this time. Close of business. Everything crowded. Yes. And, moreover, the light. Half darkness. Could you see him well? Ravik did not answer. Morosau took his arm. Listen, he said. Running around in the streets and cross streets is pointless. While you are looking through one street you will think he is in the next one. Not a chance. Let's go back to Fouquet's. That's the best place. You can keep a better lookout from there than by running around. In case he comes back, you'll be able to see him from there. They sat down at an outside table which was open to the street in two directions. For a long time they sat in silence. What do you intend to do if you meet him? Morosau asked finally. Do you know yet? Ravik shook his head. Think about it. It's better for you to know beforehand. There's no sense in being taken by surprise and doing something foolish. Particularly not in your situation. You don't want to be imprisoned for years. Ravik looked up. He did not answer. He only looked at Morosau. It wouldn't matter to me. Morosau said. If it were me. But it does matter to me in your case. What would you have done if he had been the one and you had got hold of him across the street at the corner? I don't know, Boris. I really don't know. You have nothing on you, have you? No. If you had attacked him without planning it, 
you would have been separated in a minute. By now you would be at police headquarters and he would probably have got away with a few black and blue marks. You know that, don't you? Yes. Ravik stared into the street. Morosau deliberated. At best you might have tried to push him under an automobile at the intersection. But that wouldn't have been sure either. He might have got away with a couple of scratches. I won't push him under an automobile, Ravik replied without taking his eyes from the street. I know that. I wouldn't do it either. Morosau was silent for a while. Ravik, he said then. If he was the one and if you meet him you must be dead sure what to do, you know that? You'll have only one chance. Yes, I know. Ravik continued to stare into the street. If you should see him follow him. But don't do anything else. Only follow him. Find out where he lives. Nothing else. All the rest you can work out later. Take your time. Do nothing foolish. Do you hear? Yes, Ravik said absent-mindedly and stared into the street. A man selling pistachio nuts came to their table. He was followed by a boy with toy mice. He made them dance on the marble tabletop and run up his sleeve. The violin player appeared for the second time. Now he wore a hat and played Pali's Moilamur. An old lady with a syphilitic nose was hawking violets. Morosau looked at his watch. Eight, he said. It's senseless to wait any longer, Ravik. We've been sitting here for over two hours already. The man won't come back now. Everyone in France is eating supper somewhere at this hour. Why don't you go, Boris? Why are you sitting around here with me anyhow? That has nothing to do with it. I can sit here with you as long as we like. But I don't want you to drive yourself crazy. It's senseless for you to wait here for hours. The chances of meeting him are now the same everywhere. No, now they are greater in any restaurant, in any nightclub, in any brothel. I know, Boris. Ravik stared into the street. The traffic had become less dense. Morosa put his large hairy hand on Ravik's arm. Ravik, he said, listen. If you are destined to meet that man, you'll meet him, and if not, then you can wait for him for years. You know what I mean. Keep your eyes open, everywhere. And be prepared for anything. But otherwise go on living as if you were mistaken. That's the only thing you can do. Otherwise you will ruin yourself. I lived through the same thing once. About twenty years ago. I kept thinking I saw one of my father's murderers. Hallucinations. He emptied his glass. Damned hallucinations. And now come with me. We'll go somewhere and have something to eat. You go and have something to eat, Boris. I'll come later. Do you intend to stay here? Just for another moment. Then I'll go to the hotel. I have something to do there. Morosau looked at him. He knew what Ravik wanted to do in the hotel. But he also knew that he couldn't do anything else. This was Ravik's business alone. All right he said. I'll be at the Mia Marie. Later at Publish Keys. Call me or come there. He raised his bushy eyebrows. And don't run any risks. Don't be a hero for nothing. And a damned idiot. Don't shoot unless you are sure you can escape. This is no child's play and no gangster movie. I know that, Boris. Don't worry. Dash. Ravik went to the Hotel International and started back immediately. On his way he passed the Hotel de Milan. He looked at his watch. It was 8.30. He could still find Joan at home. She came toward him. Ravik, she said surprised. You've come here? Yes. You've never been here, do you know that? Since the day you brought me here. He smiled absent-mindedly. That's true. Joan. We lead a strange life. Yes. Like moles. Or bats. Or owls. We see each other only when it is dark. She walked through the room with long lithe strides. She wore a dark blue tailored dressing gown, drawn tight about her hips with a belt. 
The black evening gown which she wore at the Scheherazade was lying on the bed. She was very beautiful and infinitely remote. Don't you have to go, Joan? No. Not for half an hour. This is the best time for me. The hour before I have to leave. You see what I have? Coffee and all the time in the world. And now even you are here. I have Galvados too. She brought the bottle. He took it and put it, unopened, on the table. Then he took her hands. Joan, he said. The light in her eyes dimmed. She stood close to him. Tell me at once what it is. Why? What should it be? Something. There is always something the matter when you are this way. Did you come because of that? He felt her hands trying to pull away from him. She did not move. Even her hands did not move. It was only as if something in them wanted to pull away from him. You can't come tonight, Joan. Not tonight and perhaps not tomorrow and not for a few days. Do you have to stay at the hospital? No. It is something else. I can't talk about it. But it is something that has nothing to do with you and me. She stood there for a while, motionless. All right, she said then. You understand? No. But if you say so, it is right. You aren't angry? She looked at him. My God, Ravik, she said. How could I ever be angry with you about anything? He looked up. It was as though a hand had pressed hard on his heart. Joan had spoken without purpose, but nothing she could have done would have touched him more. He paid little heed to what she murmured and whispered during the night, it was forgotten as soon as dawn stood grey outside the window. He knew that the rapture of those hours in which she crouched or lay at his side was as much rapture over herself, and he took it for intoxication and the shining of owl of the moment, but never for more. Now for the first time, like a flyer who, through an opening of gleaming clouds on which the light plays hide and seek, suddenly perceives the earth below, green, brown, and solid, he saw more. He saw devotion behind the rapture, feeling behind the intoxication, simple confidence behind the rush of words. He had expected suspicion, questions, and lack of understanding, but not this. It was always the little things that brought revelation, never the big ones. The big ones were too tied up with dramatic gestures and the temptation to lie. A room. A hotel room. A few suitcases, a bed, light, the black solitude of night and passed outside the window, and here a bright face with grey eyes and high brows and the bold sweep of the hair, life, lie and life openly turned toward him like an oleander bush toward the light, here it was, here it stood, waiting, silent, calling to him, take me, hold me. Had he not said a long time ago, I'll hold you? He stood up. Good night, Joan. Good night, Ravik. He was sitting in front of the Café Fouki. He was sitting at the same table as before. He sat there for hours buried in the darkness of his past in which only a single feeble light burned, the hope for revenge. They had arrested him in August, 1933. He had kept two friends of his who were wanted by the Gestapo hidden at his place for two weeks and he had then helped them to escape. One of them had saved his life in 1917 at Bixkut in Flanders and had brought him back under cover of machine gun fire when he had been lying in no man's land slowly bleeding to death. The other was a Jewish writer whom he had known for years. He had been brought up for examination, they wanted to find out in which direction the two had escaped, what papers they had on them and who would be of help to them on the road. Haik had examined him. After he had fainted the first time he had tried to shoot or strike down Haik with his own revolver. He had jumped into a crashing red darkness. It had been a useless attempt against four strong, armed men. For three days out of unconsciousness, slow awakening, out of frantic pain Hake's cool smiling face emerged. For three days the same questions, for three days the same body, bruised all over, almost incapable of further suffering. And then on the afternoon of the third day Sybil was brought in. She did not know about anything. 
he was shown to her to force a confession from her. She was a beautiful, luxury-loving creature who had lived a carefree superficial life. He had expected her to scream and break down. She did not break down. She turned on the torturers. She used deadly words. Deadly for her and she knew it. Hike had ceased smiling. He had cut short the examination. Next day he had explained to Ravik what would happen to her in the concentration camp for women if he did not confess. Ravik had not answered. Haik had explained to him what would happen to her before that. Ravik had not confessed to anything because there was nothing to confess. He had tried to convince Haik that this woman could not know anything. He had told him that he only knew her superficially. That she had meant little more in his life than a beautiful picture. That he could never have confided anything to her. All this had been true. Haik had only smiled. Three days later Sybil was dead. She had hanged herself in the concentration camp for women. A day later one of the fugitives was brought back. It was the Jewish writer. When Ravik saw him he could no longer recognize him, not even by his voice. It took another week before he was finally dead under Haik's examination. Then came the concentration camp for Ravik. The hospital. The escape from the hospital. The silver moon stood above the Arc de Triomphe. The street lamps along the Champs Elysees flickered in the wind. The lights of night were reflected in the glasses on the table. Unreal, Ravik thought, unreal the one and the other. Unreal these glasses, this moon, this street, this night, and this hour that touches me with its breath, strange and familiar as if it had been here before, in another life, on another star. Unreal these memories of years that are past, submerged, alive and dead at the same time, only phosphorescing now in my brain and petrified into expectation, unreal this fluid rolling through the darkness of my veins, unresting, 98.6 in temperature, slightly salty in flavor, 4 liters of secrecy and drive, blood, and the reflection in ganglia, the invisible storehouse in nothingness, called memory. Star after star, rising year after year, one bright, the other bloody as Mars above the Rudaberry, and many darkly gleaming and full of spots, the sky of memory beneath which the present restlessly carries on its confused life. The green light of revenge. The city quietly floating in the late moonlight and in the drone of automobile motors. Long rows of houses, stretching endlessly, rows of windows and packed behind them bundles of fate by the block. The heartbeat of millions of men, the incessant beaters of a million-fold motor, moving slowly, slowly along the street of life, with every throb a tiny millimeter closer to death. He got up. The Champs Elysee was almost empty. Only a few whores loitered at the corners. He walked down the street, past the Rue Pierre Charon, the Rue Marbeuf, the Rue Marignan to the Ronde Point and back to the Arc de Triomphe. He stepped over the chains and stood before the tomb of the unknown soldier. The small blue flame flickered in the shadow. A withering wreath lay in front of it. He crossed the Ito Isle and went to the bistro where he thought he had first seen Haik. A few taxi drivers were still sitting there. He sat down by the window where he had been sitting before and drank his coffee. The street outside was empty. The drivers were talking about Hitler. They found him ridiculous and prophesied his immediate downfall should he dare to come near the Maginot line. Ravik stared into the street. Why am I sitting here? He thought. I could be sitting anywhere in Paris. The chances are the same. He looked at his watch. It was just before three. Too late. Hake, if it had been he, would not be roaming the streets at this time. Outside he saw a horse strolling around. She looked inside through the window and walked on. If she comes back I'll go, he thought. The whore came back. He did not go. If she comes once more I'll certainly go, he decided. Then Hake is not in Paris. The whore returned. She beckoned with her head and passed by. He remained sitting. She returned once more. He did not go. The waiter put the chairs on the tables. The cab drivers paid and left the bistro. The waiter turned off the light above the counter. The room was plunged into murky darkness. 
Ravik looked around. The check, he said. Outside it had become windier and colder. The clouds floated higher and faster. Ravik walked by Jones Hotel and stopped. All was dark except one window where a lamp shimmered behind curtains. It was Joan's room. He knew that she hated to enter a dark room by herself. She had left the light on because she was not coming to him today. He looked up and suddenly he no longer understood himself. Why didn't he want to see her? The memory of the other woman had died long ago, only the memory of her death had remained. And the other thing? What did it have to do with her? What did it still have to do even with himself? Wasn't he a fool to chase an illusion, the reflex of an entangled, blackened memory, a dark reaction, to begin anew stirring the dross of dead years, stirred up by mere chance, by an accursed resemblance, to allow a piece of the rotted past to break open again, the abscess of a barely healed neurosis, and thereby jeopardize everything he had built up in himself, his own self, that clear bit of life divorced from what he had been the life he had created for himself and the only person close to him? What had the one to do with the other? Hadn't he taught himself that time and again? How else could he have escaped? And where would he be without it? He felt that the lump of lead in his brain was melting away. He breathed deeply. The wind came along the street with swift blasts. He looked up at the lighted window again. There was someone to whom he meant something someone to whom he was important, someone whose face changed when she looked at him, and he had been about to sacrifice that to a twisted illusion, to the impatient, disdainful arrogance born of a faint hope for revenge. What did he really want? Why did he resist? What was he saving himself for? Life offered itself to him and he raised objections. Not because there was too little, because there was too much had the bloody thunderstorm of his past to sweep over him that he could recognize it? He moved his shoulders. Heart, he thought, heart. How it opened itself up. How it throbbed. Window, he thought, lonely window lit at night, reflection of another's life that had given itself up to him passionately, waiting, open, until he too should open. The flame of love, the Saint Elmo's fire of tenderness, the bright, swift, sheet lightning of the blood, one knew it, one knew everything about it, one knew so much that one thought this soft golden confusion could never flood one's brain again, and then suddenly one night one stood in front of a third-rate hotel and it rose like mist out of the asphalt and one felt it as though it had come from the other end of the earth, from blue coconut islands, from the warmth of a tropical spring, as though it had filtered through oceans, coral reefs lava, and darkness and impetuously pierced its way into Paris, into the shabby rue Poncelet, with the odor of hibiscus and mimosa, in a night filled with revenge and the past, the irresistible, indisputable, enigmatic resurrection of emotion. Dash. The Scheherazade was crowded. Joan was sitting at a table with some people. She saw Ravik at once. He remained standing by the door. The place was full of smoke and music. She said something to the people at her table and came up to him quickly. Ravik. Are you still needed here? Why? I want to take you with me. But didn't you say? That's over. Are you still needed here? No. I'll just tell them that I'm going. Do it quickly, I'll wait for you in the taxi outside. Yes. She remained standing. Ravik. He looked at her. Did you come because of me? She asked. He hesitated a second. Yes, he said in a low voice while her face moved close to his. Yes, Joan. Because of you. Only because of you. The taxi drove along the Rue de Liege. What was the matter, Ravik? Nothing. I was afraid. Forget it. It was nothing. She looked at him. I thought you would never come again. He bent over her. He felt her trembling. Joan, he said. Don't think about anything and don't ask any questions. Do you see the light of the street lamps and the thousand colored signs out there? 
We are living in a dying age and this city quivers with life. We are torn from everything and we have nothing left but our hearts. I was in the land of the moon and I've come back, and here you are and you are life. Don't ask anything more. There are more secrets in your hair than in a thousand questions. Here before us is the night, a few hours and an eternity, until the morning rumbles against the windows. That people love each other is everything, a eh, marvel and the most obvious thing in the world, this is what I felt today when the night melted away into a flowering bush and the wind smelled of strawberries and without love one is only a dead man on furlough, nothing but a scrap of paper with a few dates and a chance name on it and one might as well die. The light from the street lamp swept through the window of the taxi like the circling beam of a lighthouse through the darkness of a ship's cabin. Joan's eyes were alternately very translucent and very dark in her pale face. We shall not die, she whispered in Ravik's arms. No. Not we. Only time. Damned time. It always dies. We live. We always live. When you wake up it is spring and when you go to sleep it is fall and a thousand times in between it is winter and summer, and when we love each other enough we are immortal and indestructible like the heartbeat and the rain and the wind, and that is much. Day by day we are conquerors, beloved, and year by year we are defeated, but who wants to realize that and to whom does it matter? The hour is life, the moment is closest to eternity, your eyes glisten, stardust trickles through infinity, gods can age, but your mouth is young, the enigma trembles between us, the you and me, call and answer, out of evenings, out of dusks, out of the ecstasies of all lovers, pressed from the remotest cries of brutal lust into golden storms, the endless road from the amoeba to Ruth and Esther and Helen and Aspasia, to blue Madonnas in chapels on the road, from jungle and animal to you, to you. She lay in his arms, motionless, her face pale, in such surrender that she almost seemed absent, and he bent over her and spoke and spoke, and at the beginning he felt as though someone were looking over his shoulder, a shadow that talked soundlessly too, with a faint smile, and he bent deeper and felt her move toward him, and it was still there, and then it was gone. 13. A scandal, said the woman with the emeralds who was sitting opposite Kate Higstrowham. Her eyes sparkled. A wonderful scandal. All Paris is laughing about it. Did you have any idea that Louis was a homosexual? Surely not. None of us knew, he kept it very well covered up. Lena de Newberg was considered his official mistress, and now imagine, a week ago he returned from Rome three days earlier than he had said and went to Nicky's apartment the same evening, intending to surprise him, and whom did he find there? His wife, Ravik said. The woman with the emeralds glanced up. Suddenly she looked as if she had just been told that her husband was bankrupt. You already know the story? She asked. No. But it must be like that. I don't understand. She stared at Ravik, irritated. After all it was most improbable. That's just why. Kate Higstrom smiled. Dr. Ravik has a theory, Daisy. He calls it the systematics of chance. According to it the most improbable is always practically the most logical. That's interesting. Daisy smiled politely and entirely uninterestedly. It wouldn't have led to anything, she continued calmly, if Louis had not made a terrific scene. He was completely beside himself. Now he is living in the Krillin. Wants to divorce her. Both are waiting for evidence. She leaned back in her chair, full of expectation. What do you say? Kate Higstrom looked quickly at Travick. He was studying a branch of orchids which stood on the table between hat boxes and a basket of fruit containing grapes and peaches, white flowers like butterflies with lascivious, red spotted hearts. Unbelievable, Daisy, she said. Really unbelievable. Daisy enjoyed her triumph. I'm sure you couldn't have known that beforehand, could you? She asked Travick. He carefully put the branch back into the narrow crystal vase. No, certainly not that. 
Daisy nodded in satisfaction and picked up her bag, her compact, and her gloves. I've got to go. I'm late now. Louise is having a cocktail party. Her minister is coming. All sorts of rumors are going around. She rose. By the way, Ferdy and Martha have broken up again. She has sent her jewelry back to him. For the third time now. It still impresses him. The poor fool. He thinks he is loved for his own sake. He'll return everything to her and another piece as a reward. As always. He doesn't know, but she has already selected what she'd like to have at Ostertag's. He always buys there. A ruby brooch, big square stones, best pigeon blood. She is smart. She kissed Kate Higstroem. Adieu, my lamb. Now you are at least somewhat au courant. Can't you get out of here soon? She looked at Travick. He caught Kate Higstroem's look. Not right away, he said. Sorry. He helped Daisy into her coat. It was a dark mink without a collar. A coat for Joan, he thought. Daisy made a very good appearance, slim, exquisite, with a short nose and delicate joints, well groomed and entirely without sex appeal. Why don't you come for tea with Kate? She said. Only a few people are there on Wednesdays, so we can chat undisturbed. I'm very much interested in operations. Gladly. Ravik closed the door behind her and came back. Beautiful emeralds, he said. Kate Higstroem laughed. Well, that was my life before, Ravik. Can you understand that? Yes. Why not? Wonderful if one can do it. It gives you protection against so much. I can't understand it any longer. She got up and walked carefully to her bed. Ravik smiled. It makes very little difference where one lives, Kate. Some places are more comfortable than others, but it is never important. The only important thing is what one makes of it. She put her long beautiful legs onto the bed. Everything is inconsequential, she said, when you have been in bed for a few weeks and can walk again. Ravik took a cigarette. You don't have to stay here any longer if you don't want to. You can live in the Lancaster if you take a nurse with you. Kate Higstroem shook her head. I'll stay here until I can travel. Here I am protected against too many daisies. Throw them out when they come, Ravik said. Nothing is more tiring than listening to gossip. She stretched herself cautiously on her bed. Would you believe that Daisy is a wonderful mother in spite of her gossiping? She is bringing up her two children magnificently. That can happen, Ravik declared, unimpressed. Kate Higstroem smiled. She drew the blanket over her. A hospital is like a convent, she said. You learn to appreciate the simplest things again. Walking. Breathing. Seeing. Yes. Happiness lies all around us. We only have to pick it up. She looked at him. I really mean it. So do I, Kate. Only the simple things never disappoint us. And as far as happiness is concerned you can't start too far down. Jeanet was lying on his bed, a heap of pamphlets scattered over his blanket. Why don't you put the light on? Ravik asked. I can still see well enough. I have good eyes. The pamphlets contained descriptions of artificial legs. Jeanet had got them together in every way he could. His mother had brought him the last ones. He showed Ravik a wonderfully colored folder. Ravik turned on the light. This is the most expensive, Jeanette said. It is not the best, Ravik replied. But it is the most expensive. I'll explain to the insurance company that I must have it. Naturally I don't want it at all. Only the insurance company shall pay for it. I want a wooden stump and the money. The insurance company has its own physicians who check on everything, Jeanette. The boy straightened up. Do you think they won't allow me a leg? They will. Perhaps not the most expensive. But they won't give you any money, they'll see to it that you really get it. Then I'll have to take it and sell it immediately. Of course I'll not get the full price. Do you think 20% off is enough? I'll offer it first for 10. 
maybe we can talk with the shopkeeper in advance. What does it matter to the insurance company whether I take the leg? They must pay, nothing else really matters to them, or does it? Of course not. You can try. It would amount to something. We could buy the counter and the equipment for a small cremery for that money. Jeanette smiled cunningly. Thank God, a leg like that with its joint and everything else is pretty expensive. A precision job. That's fine. Has someone from the insurance company already been here? No, not yet about the leg and the compensation. Only about the operation and the hospital. Do we have to hire a lawyer? What do you think? It was a red light. I'm quite positive. The police. The nurse came with the supper. She put it on the table beside Jeanette. The boy did not say anything until she had gone. They give you a lot to eat here, he declared then. I've never had so much. I can't finish it all by myself. My mother always comes and eats the rest. There is enough for both of us. She's saving money this way. The room here costs a great deal anyway. That's paid by the insurance company. It makes no difference where you are. A gleam flitted across the grey face of the boy. I spoke to Dr. Weber. He'll give me 10%. He'll send the bill for what it costs to the insurance company. They pay it, but he'll let me have the 10% in cash. You're efficient, Jeanette. You've got to be efficient when you are poor. That's right. Are you in pain? In the foot I don't have any more. Those are the nerves which are still there. I know. It's funny just the same. To have pain in something that isn't there anymore. Maybe the sole of my leg is still there. Jeanette grinned. He had cracked a joke. Then he removed the lid from his supper plates. Soup, chicken, vegetable, pudding. That's something for mother. She likes chicken. We didn't often have it at home. He leaned back comfortably. Sometimes I wake up at night and think we have to pay for everything here ourselves. That's how one thinks at night, the first moment. Then I remember that I'm lying here like the son of rich people and I have the right to ask for everything and can ring for the nurses and they must come and other people must pay for all that. Wonderful, isn't it? Yes, Ravik said. Wonderful. He sat in the examination room of the Osiris. Is there still someone there? He asked. Yes, Leonie said. Yvonne. She is the last. Send her in. You're all right, Leonie. Yvonne was twenty-five years old, fleshy, blonde, with a broad nose and the short chubby hands and feet of many whores. She swayed into the room complacently and lifted the sleazy silk rag she wore. There, Ravik said. Over there. Can't it be done here? Yvonne asked. No. Why? Instead of answering Yvonne turned silently around and showed her hefty behind. It was blue with welts. She must have received a terrific thrashing from someone. I hope your client paid you well for it, Ravik said. This is no joke. Yvonne shook her head. Not a centime, doctor. It was not a client. Then it was fun. I didn't know you liked that. Yvonne again shook her head, a satisfied mysterious smile on her face. Ravik noticed that she enjoyed the situation. She felt important. I'm not a masochist, she said. She was proud of knowing the word. What was it then? A row? Yvonne waited a second. Love, she said then and stretched her shoulders voluptuously. Was he jealous? Yes. Yvonne beamed. Does it hurt very much? Something like this doesn't hurt. She sat down carefully. Do you know, doctor, that Madame Roland at first didn't want to let me work? Just one hour, I told her, try it only for one hour. You'll see. And now with the blue behind I have much more success than ever before. Why? I don't know. There are fellows who are mad about it. It excites them. In the last three days I have made 250 francs more. How long will it show? At least two or three weeks. Yvonne clicked her tongue. 
If this goes on I'll be able to buy a fur coat. Fox, perfectly matched cat skins. If it doesn't last long enough your friend can easily help you out with another sound thrashing. That he won't do, Yvonne said vivaciously. He is not like that. He is not a calculating beast, you know. He only does it out of passion. When it comes over him. Otherwise I could beg him on my knees, but he wouldn't do it. Character. Ravik glanced up. You're all right, Yvonne. She picked herself up. Then the work can go on. An old one is already waiting for me downstairs. A man with a grey pointed beard. He always comes after these visits. To be the first because he wants to be sure. I've shown him my streaks. He is wild about them. He has no say at home. That's why. So he dreams about how he would like to thrash his old lady, I believe. She burst into clear bell-like laughter. Doctor. The world is funny, isn't it? She swayed out of the room complacently. Ravik put aside the things he had used and stepped to the window. The dusk hung silver grey above the buildings. The bare trees rose through the asphalt like the black hands of the dead. One had at times seen such hands in buried trenches. He opened the window and looked out. The hour of unreality, hovering between day and night. The hour of love in the small hotels, for those who were married and at evening presided with dignity over their families. The hour of aperitifs. The hour in which the earth caught its breath. The hour in which the Italian women in the lowlands of Lombardy were already beginning to say Felicissima not. The hour of despair and the hour of dreams. He closed the window. Suddenly the room seemed to be much darker. Shadows had fluttered in and crouched in the corners full of silent chatter. The bottle of cognac which Roland had brought up sparkled on the table like a polished topaz. Ravik remained standing for a moment, then he went down. The music box was playing and the big room was already brightly illuminated. The girls were sitting in their short pink silk chemises in two rows on the hassocks. They all had their breasts bare. The customers wanted to see what they were buying. Half a dozen had arrived mostly middle-aged tradesmen. They were the cautious experts, they knew when the examinations took place and came about this time to be positively sure of not risking a clap. Yvonne was with her old gentleman. He sat at a table with a dubonnet in front of him. She stood beside him, one foot on a chair, and drank champagne. She received ten percent for each bottle. The man must be really crazy to spend so much. That was something only foreigners did. Yvonne was aware of it. She had an air of a benevolent circus trainer. Do you want another Calvados? Ravik asked. Joan nodded. Yes, let me have another. He called the maitre d'hotel. Have you still older Calvados than this? Isn't this good? It is. But maybe you have still another in your cellar. I'll see. The waiter went to the cashier's desk where the proprietress was asleep with her cat. From there he disappeared through a ground glass door into the room where the owner lived among his accounts. After a while the waiter returned with an important, composed air and went downstairs into the cellar without glancing at traffic. It seems to be working. The waiter returned with a bottle which he held in his arms like a baby. It was a dirty bottle, not one of the picturesquely encrusted bottles for tourists, but simply one that was dirty from lying in the cellar for many years. He opened it cautiously, sniffed the cork, and then fetched two big glasses. Sir, he said to Ravik and poured a few drops. Ravik took the glass and inhaled the odor. Then he drank, leaned back, and nodded. The waiter returned his nod solemnly and filled both glasses a third full. Just try this, Ravik said to Joan. She took a sip and put the glass down. The waiter watched her. She looked at Ravik, astonished. I've never tasted anything like that before, she said and sipped a second time. One doesn't drink it, one just inhales it. That's it, madam, the waiter declared with satisfaction you've grasped it. Ravik, Joan said, there's danger in what you're doing. 
after this Galvados I'll never drink any other kind. Oh yes, you'll drink other kinds too. But I'll dream of this one. Fine. It'll make you a romantic. A Calvados romantic. But then I won't like the other anymore. On the contrary. It will taste even better than it really is. It will be a Calvados with the longing for another Calvados. That in itself makes it less ordinary. Joan laughed. That's nonsense. You know it yourself. Naturally it's nonsense. But we are living on nonsense. Not on the meager bread of facts. Otherwise, what would happen to love? What has that to do with love? A great deal. It takes care of its continuance. Otherwise we would love once only and reject everything else later. But as it is, the remnant of desire for the man one leaves behind, or by whom one is left behind, becomes the halo around the head of the new one. To have lost someone before in itself gives the new one a certain romantic glamour. The hallowed old illusion. Joan looked at him. I find it abominable to hear you talk like this. I too. You shouldn't do it. Not even in fun. It turns a miracle into a trick. Ravik did not answer. And it sounds as if you were already tired and were thinking about leaving me. Ravik looked at her with a remote tenderness. You need never think about that, Joan. When it comes to that, you will be the one who leaves me. Not I you. That much is sure. She set her glass down hard. What nonsense. I'll never leave you. Are you trying to talk me into something again? Those eyes, Ravik thought. As if behind them lightning were flashing. Soft, reddish lightning out of a thunderstorm of candles. Joan, he said. I don't want to talk you into anything. I'll tell you the story of the wave and the rock. It's an old story. Older than we are. Listen. Once upon a time there was a wave who loved a rock in the sea, let us say in the Bay of Capri. The wave foamed and swirled around the rock, she kissed him day and night, she embraced him with her white arms, she sighed and wept and besought him to come to her. She loved him and stormed about him and in that way slowly undermined him, and one day he yielded, completely undermined, and sank into her arms. He took a sip of Galvados. And? Joan asked. And suddenly he was no longer a rock to be played with, to be loved, to be dreamed of. He was only a block of stone at the bottom of the sea, drowned in her. The wave felt disappointed and deceived and looked for another rock. And? Joan looked at him suspiciously. What does that mean? He should have remained a rock. The wave always says that. But things that move are stronger than immovable things. Water is stronger than rocks. She made an impatient gesture. What has all this to do with us? That's only a story without meaning. Or you're making fun of me again. When it comes to that, you'll leave me, that's the one thing I'm sure of. That, Ravik said, laughing, will be your last statement when you go. You'll explain to me that I've left you. And you'll find reasons for it, and you'll believe them, and you'll be right before the oldest law court in the world, nature. He called the waiter. Can we buy this bottle of Calvados? You want to take it with you? Exactly. Sir, that's against our rules. We don't sell bottles. Ask the patron. The waiter returned with a newspaper. It was the Paris Sawyer. The patron will make an exception, he explained, as he pressed the cork tight and wrapped the bottle in the Paris Sawyer after first removing the sports page and putting it, folded, into his pocket. Here, sir. You had best keep it in a dark cool place. It comes from the estate of the patron's grandfather. Good. Ravik paid. He took the bottle and looked at it. Sunshine that has lain all through a hot summer and a blue fall on apples in an ancient wind swept orchard of Normandy, come with us. We need you. There is a storm raging somewhere in the universe. They stepped out into the street. It had begun to rain. Joan stopped. Ravik. Do you love me? Yes, Joan. More than you think. 
She leaned against him. Sometimes it doesn't look like it. On the contrary. Otherwise I'd never tell you such things. You'd better tell me other things. He looked into the rain and smiled. Love is not a pond into which one can always look for one's reflection, Joan. Love has its ebb and flow. And wrecks and sunken cities and octopuses and storms and chests with gold and pearls. But the pearls lie deep. I don't know anything about that. Love is belonging together. Forever. Forever, he thought. The old fairy tale. When one can't even hold the minute. Shivering, she buttoned her coat. I wish it was summer, she said. I've never longed for it as I have this year. Dash. She took her black evening gown out of the wardrobe and flung it on the bed. How I hate this sometimes. Always the same black dress. Always the same Scheherazade. Always the same. Always the same. Ravik looked up. He didn't say anything. Don't you understand? She asked. Oh yes. Why don't you take me away from here, beloved? Where to? Anywhere. Ravik unwrapped the bottle of Calvados and drew the cork. Then he fetched a glass and filled it. Come, he said. Drink this. She shook her head. It doesn't help. Sometimes it doesn't help to drink. Sometimes nothing helps. I don't want to go there tonight, to those idiots. Stay here. And then? Phone that you are sick. Nevertheless, I'll have to go tomorrow. It will be even worse then. You could be sick for a few days. That's just the same. She looked at him. What can it be? What's wrong with me, Ravik? Is it the rain? Is it this wet darkness? Sometimes it's like lying in a coffin. These grey afternoons that drown me. I had forgotten it a while ago, I was happy being with you in that little restaurant. Why did you have to talk about things like leaving and being left? I don't want to know or hear anything about that. It makes me sad, it holds pictures out to me which I don't want to see, and it makes me restless. I know you don't mean it this way, but it hits me. It hits me, and then rain and darkness come. You don't know that. You are strong. Strong? Ravik repeated. Yes. How do you know that? You have no fear. I haven't any fear left. That's not the same, Joan. She wasn't listening to what he said. She walked across the room with her long strides for which the room was too small. She always walked as if she were walking against a non-existent wind. I want to get away from all this, she said. Away from this hotel, this nightclub with those greedy eyes, away from it all. She stopped. Ravik. Must we live the way we live? Can't we live like other people who love each other? Can't we be together and have things that belong to us around us? and evenings and security, instead of these suitcases and empty days and these hotel rooms where one is a stranger? Ravik's face was indecipherable. There it comes, he thought. He had expected it any time. Do you actually see that for us, Joan? Why not? Other people have it. Warmth, belonging together, a few rooms and when one closes one's door the restlessness has gone and it doesn't creep through the walls as it does here. Do you really see that? Ravik repeated. Yes. A neat little apartment with a neat little bourgeois life. A neat little security on the edge of the abyss. Do you really see that? You could just as well call it something else, she said defiantly. Something not quite so, contemptuous. When one is in love one finds other names for it. It remains the same, Joan. Do you really see that? Neither of us is made for it. She stopped. I am. Ravik smiled. There were tenderness, irony, and a shadow of sadness in it. Joan, he said, not you either. You even less than I. But that isn't the only reason. There is still another. Yes. She replied with bitterness. I know. No, Joan. You don't know. But I'll tell you. 
it will be better so. You shouldn't think what you are thinking now. She still stood before him. Let's get it over quickly, he said. And don't ask many questions afterwards. She did not answer. Her face was empty. Suddenly it was again the face she had had formerly. He took her hands. I live illegally in France, he said. I have no papers. That's the real reason. That's why I'll never be able to rent an apartment. Nor can I marry if I love someone. I need proofs of my identity and visas for that. I don't have them. I'm not even permitted to work. I must do it clandestinely. I can never live otherwise than now. She stared at him. Is that true? He shrugged his shoulders. There are a couple of thousand people who are living in a similar way. I'm sure you know that, too. Everyone knows it nowadays. I am one of them. He smiled and let her hands go. A man without a future, as Moros calls calls it. Yes, but. I'm even very well off. I work, I live, I have you, what are a few inconveniences? And the police? The police don't bother too much about it. If they happened to catch me, I'd only be deported, that's all. But that's improbable. And now go and telephone your nightclub that you won't come. We'll have this evening for ourselves. The whole evening. Tell them that you're sick. If they want a certificate I'll get you one from Weber. She did not go. Deported, she said as if she could understand it only slowly. Deported? From France? And then you would be away? For a short while only. She did not seem to hear him. Away. She repeated. Away? And what would I do then? Ravik smiled. Yes, he said. What would you do then? She sat there, leaning on her elbows as if paralyzed. Joan, Ravik said, I have been here for two years and it has not happened. Her face did not change. And if it should happen in spite of that? Then I would be back soon. In a week or two. It's like a trip, nothing more. And now call the Scheherazade. She got up hesitantly. What shall I say? That you have bronchitis. Speak a little hoarsely. She walked over to the telephone. Then she came quickly back. Ravik. He freed himself carefully. Come, he said. Let's forget it. It's really a blessing. It protects us against becoming reentities of passion. It keeps love pure, it remains aflame, and doesn't become the stove for the family cabbage. Now go and telephone. She lifted the receiver. He looked at her while she spoke. At first her heart wasn't in it, she still looked at him as if he were going to be arrested immediately. But then she began gradually to lie, easily and casually. She was actually lying more than was necessary. Her face became alive and reflected the pain in her chest which she was describing. Her voice became more tired and steadily hoarser and finally was punctuated by coughs. She was no longer looking at Ravik, she looked straight ahead and was completely absorbed in her role. He watched her silently and then drank a big gulp of Calvados. No complexes, he thought. A mirror which gives a wonderful reflection, but which holds nothing. Joan put the receiver down and smoothed her hair. They believed everything. You did it first rate. They said I should stay in bed. And if it wasn't completely gone by tomorrow, for heaven's sake, stay there then. You see. That takes care of tomorrow too. Yes, she said, gloomy for a second. If you take it that way. Then she came to him. You frightened me, Ravik. Tell me it isn't true. You often say things just for the sake of saying them. Tell me it isn't true. Not the way you said it. It isn't true. She leaned her head on his shoulder. It can't be true. I don't want to be alone again. I'm nothing when I'm alone. You must stay with me. I'm nothing without you, Ravik. Ravik looked down at her. Joan, he said. Sometimes you are like the janitor's daughter and sometimes Diana of the woods. And sometimes both. Her head did not move on his shoulder. What am I now? 
he smiled. Diana with the silver bow. Invulnerable and deadly. You should tell me that more often. Ravik remained silent. She had not understood what he meant. Nor was it necessary. She took what she liked the way she liked and did not bother about anything else. But wasn't it just this that attracted him? Whoever wanted someone who was like himself? And who would ask for morals in love? That was an invention of the weak. And the dirge for the victims. What are you thinking of? She asked. Nothing. Nothing? Something, he said. We'll go away from here for a few days, Joan. There where the sun is. To Canor Antibes. To hell with all caution. To hell too with all dreams of three room apartments and the vulture cry of the middle class. And to hell with the darkness and the cold and the rain. Aren't you Budapest and the odor of blooming chestnuts at night when the entire city, hot and longing for summer, is sleeping with the moon? She had straightened up quickly. Do you really mean that? Yes. But, the police. To hell with the police. It is no more dangerous than here. Resorts for tourists are not so painstakingly checked. Particularly not the expensive hotels. Have you never been there? No. Never. I was only in Italy and on the Adriatic. When are we leaving? In two or three weeks. That's the best time. But have we any money? We have some. In two weeks we'll have enough. We could live in a small pension, she said hastily. You don't belong in a small pension. You belong in a hole like this or a first-rate hotel. We live in the Cap Hotel in Antibes. Besides, it's very sensible. Those hotels are entirely safe and no one asks for papers there. In the next few days I have to carve open the stomach of someone of importance, a governor or minister, he'll provide the money we still need. Joan got up quickly. Her face was changed. Come, she said. Let me have more of that old Calvados, Ravik. It really seems to be a Calvados of dreams. She went to the bed and lifted the evening gown. My God! And I only have these two old black rags. Fourteen. Andre Durand was honestly incensed. There's no working with you anymore, he declared. Ravik shrugged his shoulders. He had learned from Weber that Durand was to receive 10,000 francs for the operation. Unless he arranged with him in advance how much he was to get, Durand would send him only 200 francs. That's what he had done last time. Half an hour before the operation. I would never have thought it of you, Dr. Ravik. Neither would I, Ravik said. You know you can always rely on my generosity. I don't understand why you are so businesslike now. At the very moment when the patient knows that we have his life in our hands it is painful for me to talk about money. It isn't for me, Ravik replied. Durant looked at him for a while. His wrinkled face with the white goatee expressed dignity and indignation. He adjusted his gold-rimmed pince-nez. How much were you thinking of? He asked reluctantly. Two thousand francs. What? Durand looked as though he had been shot and could not yet believe it. Ridiculous, he then said briefly. All right, Ravik replied. You can easily find someone else. Take Binet, he is excellent. He reached for his coat and put it on. Durand stared at him. His dignified face labored. Wait a minute, he said when Ravik picked up his hat. You can't let me down like that. Why didn't you tell me this yesterday? Yesterday you were in the country and I could not reach you. Two thousand francs. Do you know that even I won't ask that much? The patient is a friend of mine whom I can only charge for my expenses. Durand looked like the heavenly father in a child's book. He was seventy years old, a fairly good diagnostician, but a poor surgeon. His excellent practice had been based mainly on the work of his former assistant, Binet, who, two years ago, had finally succeeded in making himself independent. Since that time Durand had engaged Ravik for his more difficult operations. 
Ravik was known for making the smallest incisions and working in such a fashion that hardly any scar was left. Durand was an excellent connoisseur of Bordeaux wines, a favorite guest at elegant parties, and his patients came mostly from there. If I had known that, he murmured. He had always known it. That was why before important operations he remained for one or two days in his house in the country. He wanted to avoid talking about the price before the operation. Afterwards it was simpler, then he could hold out helps for the next time, and then the next time it was the same thing. This time, to the astonishment of Durant, instead of coming in at the last moment Ravik had arrived half an hour before the appointed time for the operation and so had got hold of him before the patient was anesthetized. There was no possibility of using this as a reason for breaking off the discussion. The nurse put her head through the open door. Shall we begin the anesthetic, Professor? Durant looked at her. Then imploringly and compassionately at Ravik. Ravik answered his look compassionately but firmly. What do you think, Dr. Ravik? The decision rests with you, Professor. Just a minute, nurse. We do not yet see the procedure quite clearly. The nurse withdrew. Durant turned toward Ravik. Now what? he asked reproachfully. Ravik put his hands in his pockets. Postpone the operation until tomorrow, or for an hour and take Binet. Binet had performed almost all of Durant's operations for twenty years and had made no headway because Durant had systematically cut him off from almost all chance of becoming independent and had always characterized him as a better class underling. He hated Durant and would demand at least five thousand francs, Ravik knew that much. Durant knew it, too. Dr. Ravik, he said. Our profession shouldn't be involved in this sort of business discussion. I agree with you. Why don't you leave it to my discretion to settle this matter? Haven't you always been satisfied up to now? Never, Ravik said. You never told me that because it wouldn't have done any good. Besides, I wasn't very much interested. This time I am interested. I need the money. The nurse came in again. The patient is restless, Professor. Durant stared at Ravik. Ravik stared back. It was difficult to get money from a Frenchman, that he knew. More difficult than from a Jew. A Jew sees the transaction a Frenchman only the money he is going to hand out. One minute, nurse, Durant said. Take the pulse, blood pressure and temperature. I have done that. Then start the anesthetic. The nurse left. All right then, Durant said, I'll give you a thousand. Two thousand, Ravik corrected him. Durant did not consent. He stroked his goatee. Listen, Ravik he said then with warmth. As a refugee who isn't allowed to practice. I should not perform any operations for you, Ravik interrupted him calmly. Now he expected to hear the traditional comment that he ought to be grateful to be tolerated in the country. But Durant forwent that. He could see that he wasn't getting anywhere and time pressed. Two thousand, he said bitterly, as if each word were a banknote fluttering out of his throat. I'll have to pay it out of my own pocket. I thought you would remember what I've done for you. He waited. Strange, Ravik thought, that bloodsuckers like to moralize. This old cheat with the rosette of the Legion of Honor in his buttonhole reproaches me for being exploited by him, instead of being ashamed. And he even believes it. Well, 2000, Durant said. 2000, he repeated. It was as if he had said home, love, God, green asparagus, young partridges, old street Emilian. Gone, well, can we start now? The man had a fat pot belly and thin arms and legs. Ravik happened to know who he was. His name was Laval and he was a high official whose department handled refugee matters. Weber had told him this as a special joke. Laval was a name known to every refugee in the international. Ravik made the first cut quickly. The skin opened like a book. He clipped it tight and looked at the yellowish fat which popped up. We'll take a few pounds off as a free gift. 
then he can eat them on again, he said to Durant. Durant did not answer. Ravik removed the layers of fat in order to get close to the muscles. There he lies now, the little god of the refugees, he thought. The man who holds hundreds of little fates in his hand, in this whitish swollen hand which lies here now lifeless. The man who had ordered the deportation of old Professor Meyer who hadn't enough strength left to walk once more the road to Calvary and who had simply hanged himself in a closet of the Hotel International the day before his deportation. In the closet, because there was no hook elsewhere. He could do it, he was so emaciated that a clothes hook was strong enough to hold him. Not much more than a bundle of clothes with a bit of strangled life inside. That was what the maid had found in the morning. If this potbelly had had mercy, Maya would still be alive. Clips, he said. Tampon. He continued to cut. The precision of the sharp knife. The sensation of a clean incision. The abdominal cavity. The white coils of the intestines. The man who lay there with his belly opened up had his moral principles, too. He had felt human compassion for Maya but he had also felt something that he called his patriotic duty. There was always a screen behind which one could hide, a superior who in turn had his superior, orders, instructions, duties, commands, and finally the many-headed monster, morale, necessity, hard reality, responsibility, or whatever it was called, there was always a screen behind which to evade the simple law of humanity. There was the gallbladder. Rotten and sick. Hundreds of tornadoes Rossini have done this to him, a tripe lamodican, of heavy canards presses, pheasants, young chickens, fat sauces, together with bad temper and with thousands of pints of good Bordeaux wines. Professor Meyer had had no such worries. If one should blunder now, cut too far, cut too deep. Then in a week would a better man sit in that stuffy room that smelled of files and moths, where trembling refugees awaited their life or death sentences. A better one, but maybe someone worse. This unconscious sixty-year-old body here on the table under the bright lights undoubtedly considered himself humane. Surely he was a kind husband, a good father, but the minute he entered his office he was transformed into a tyrant hiding behind the phrases, we can't do that and where would it get us if and so on. France would not have perished if Maya had continued to eat his meager meals, if the widow Rosenthal had been allowed to go on waiting for her dead son in a maid's room in the International, if the tubercular dry goods dealer, Stallman, had not been imprisoned for six months because of illegal entry to be released only to die before he could be shipped across the border. Fine, the incision was fine. Not too deep. Not too wide. Catgut. The knot. The gallbladder. He showed it to Durant. It shone greasily in the white light. He threw it into the pail. Let's go on. Why did they sew with Riverdin in France? Out with the clip. The warm belly of an average official with a salary of thirty or forty thousand francs a year. How could he pay ten thousand for this operation? Where did he earn the rest? This pot belly had played marbles too. That was a good stitch. Stitch after stitch. Two thousand francs was still written across Durant's face although his pointed beard was hidden. It was in his eyes. A thousand francs in each eye. Love spoils one's character. Would I otherwise have squeezed this ream tear and shaken his faith in the divinely appointed world order of exploitation? Tomorrow he'll sit unctuously at this potbelly's bedside and accept grateful speeches for his work. Careful, there was one more clip. The potbelly means one week at Antibes for Joan and me. A week of light in the rain of ashes of our times. A blue piece of sky before the thunderstorm. Now the seam of the peritoneum especially fine for the two thousand francs. I should sew it up with a pair of scissors inside in memory of Maya. The humming white light. Why does one think so disconnectedly? Newspapers, probably. Radio. The incessant rattling of liars and cowards. The lack of concentration through avalanches of words. Confused brains. Exposed to all the demagogic trash. 
no longer used to chewing the hard bread of knowledge. Toothless brains. Nonsense. So that's done now. There's still the flabby skin. In a few weeks he can again deport trembling refugees. If he doesn't die. But he won't. People like him die at eighty, honored, self-respecting, and with proud grandchildren. That's done with. The end. Take him away. Ravik drew the gloves from his hands and the mask from his face. The high official glided out of the operating room on soundless wheels. Ravik gazed after him. Laville, he thought, if you only knew. That your thoroughly legal gallbladder had provided me, an illegal refugee, with a few highly illegal days on the Riviera. He began to Washington beside him Durand washed his hands slowly and methodically. The hands of an old man with high blood pressure. While carefully rubbing his fingers he rhythmically chewed with his lower jaw, slowly and as if grinding corn. When he stopped rubbing he also stopped chewing. As soon as he started again, the chewing began, too. This time he washed particularly slowly and deliberately. He wants to keep the two thousand francs a few minutes longer, Ravik thought. What are you still waiting for? Durand asked after a while. For your check. I'll send you the money as soon as the patient pays. That will be a few weeks after he is released from the hospital. Durant began to dry his hands. Then he seized a bottle of eau de cologne d'Orsay and rubbed it on. You have that much confidence in me, haven't you? He asked. Cheat, Ravik thought. Still wants to squeeze out a little humiliation. You said the patient was a friend of yours who would only pay the expenses. Yes, Durant replied unobligingly. Well, the expenses amount to a few francs for the materials and the nurses. You own the hospital. If you charge a hundred francs for everything, you may deduct that and let me have it later. The expenses, Dr. Ravik, Durant declared, straightening up, are, I'm sorry to say, considerably higher than I had thought. The two thousand francs for you are part of them. Therefore I must also charge the patient for that. He sniffed the eau de cologne on his hands. You see. He smiled. His yellow teeth formed a lively contrast to his snow white beard. As if someone had made water in the snow, Ravik thought. Nevertheless he'll pay. Weber will give me the money on the strength of it. I won't do this old goat the favor of begging him for it now. All right, he said. If it is so difficult for you, then send it later. It is not difficult for me. Although your demand came suddenly and as a surprise. It's for the sake of order. All right, then we'll do it for the sake of order, it's all the same. It's absolutely not the same. The effect is the same, Ravik said. And now excuse me. I want to get a drink. Adieu. Adieu, Durant said, surprised. Kate Higstrom smiled. Why don't you come with me, Ravik? She stood before him, slender, sure of herself, with long legs, her hands in the pockets of her coat. The Forsythia must be in bloom by now in Fiesol. A yellow fire along the garden wall. A fireplace. Books. Peace. Outside a truck thundered along the pavement. The glass frames of the pictures tinkled in the small reception room of the hospital. There were photographs of the Cathedral of Chartres. The quiet at night. Far away from everything, Kate Higstrom said. Wouldn't you love that? Yes. But I couldn't stand it. Why not? Quiet is only good when one is quiet oneself. I am not quiet myself. You know what you want. That's almost the same thing. Don't you know what you want? I don't want anything. Kate Higstrom slowly buttoned her coat. Now what is that, Ravik? Happiness or despair? He smiled impatiently. Probably both. As always, both. One shouldn't think about it too much. What else should one do? Be happy. She looked at him. One doesn't need anyone else for that, he said. One always needs someone else for that. He remained silent. 
What am I talking about? He thought. Travel chatter, goodbye embarrassment, mealy sermons. Not for the little happinesses of which you once spoke, he said. They bloom everywhere like violets around burnt down houses. One who doesn't expect anything will not be disappointed, that's a good basis. Then anything else that comes along adds a bit to it. It's nothing at all, Kate Higstrowham replied. It only seems so when one lies in bed and thinks cautiously. Not any more when one can walk around. Then one loses it again. One wants more. An oblique ray of light fell through the window across her face. It left her eyes in shadow, just her mouth bloomed in it alone. Do you know a doctor in Florence? Ravik asked. No. Do I need one? There's always a chance some trifling matter may turn up afterwards. Anything. It would make me more comfortable to know that you have a doctor there. I feel very well. And I'll come back if anything should happen. Of course. This is just a precaution. There is a good physician in Florence. Professor Fiola. Will you remember that? Fiola. I'll forget it. It isn't at all important, Ravik. I'll write him. He'll take care of you. But why? There is nothing wrong with me. Professional precaution, Kate. Nothing else. I'll write him to call you up. If you like. She took her bag. Adieu, Ravik. I'm leaving. Maybe I'll go right to Cannes from Florence. And from there to New York on the Contidi Savoia. If you happen to come to America you'll find a woman in a country house with a husband and children and horses and dogs. I leave the Kate Higstrowham you've known here. She has a small grave in the Scheherazade. Have a drink over it now and then when you're there. All right. With vodka. Yes. With vodka. She stood undecided in the dark of the room. Now the ray of light fell behind her on one of the photographs of Chartres. The high altar with the cross. Strange, she said. I should be happy. I'm not. That's true of every farewell. Even farewell to despair. She stood before him, hesitating, full of soft life, determined and a little sad. The simplest thing when saying goodbye always is to go, Ravik said. Come, I'll go out with you. Yes. The air was mild and humid. The sky hung above the roofs like glowing iron. I'll call a taxi, Kate. No. I'll walk to the corner. I'll find one there. It's the first time I've been out. How does it feel? Like wine. Don't you want me to call a cab for you? No. I'll walk. She looked down the wet street. Then she smiled. In some corner there is a bit of fear left. Does that go with it? Too? Yes. That goes with it. Adieu, Ravik. Adieu, Kate. She stood for another second as though she wanted to say something. Then she walked down the stairs with careful steps, slender, still supple, along the street toward the violet colored evening and toward her destruction. She did not turn back again. Ravik went back. As he passed the room which Kate Higstrowham had occupied, he heard music. Surprised, he stopped. He knew that there was no new patient there as yet. He cautiously opened the door and saw the nurse kneeling in front of a record player. She was startled when she heard Ravik and got up. The Victrola was playing an old record, La Dernier Valse. The girl smoothed her dress. Miss Higstrowham gave me the Victrola as a present she said. It's an American make. One can't buy it here. Nowhere in Paris. It's the only one here. I was trying it out immediately. It plays five records automatically. She beamed with pride. It's worth at least three thousand francs. And all the records with it. There are fifty-six. Besides there is a radio built in. That's luck. Luck, Ravik thought. Happiness again. Here it was a record player. He stopped and listened. The violin flew up from the orchestra like a dove, plaintive and sentimental. 
It was one of those languishing airs that sometimes touch our hearts more than all the nocturnes of Chopin. Ravik looked around. The bed was stripped and the mattress put up. The laundry was piled by the door. The windows stood open. The evening stared into the room ironically. A fading scent of perfume and the dying strains of a waltz were what was left of Katig Stroem. I can't take everything with me at once, the nurse said. It is too heavy. I'll take the Victrola along first and then I'll come back twice and get the records. Maybe even three times. It's wonderful. One could open a cafe with it. A good idea, Ravik said. Be careful not to break anything. 15. Ravik came awake very slowly. For a short while he still lay in the strange twilight between dream and reality, the dream was still the, paler and more tattered, and at the same time he realized already that he was dreaming. He was in the Black Forest, close to the German frontier, at a small station. There was the sound of a waterfall nearby. The scent of pines came from the mountains. It was summer and the valley was full of the smell of resin and meadows. The railway tracks shone red in the evening sun, as if they had been traversed by a train from which blood was dripping. What am I doing here? Ravik thought. What am I doing here in Germany? I have been in France. I have been in Paris. He floated over a soft iridescent wave which showered more sleep upon him. Paris, now it was melting away, it was only a haze, it disappeared. He was not in Paris. He was in Germany. But why had he come back here? He walked across the small platform. The conductor was standing by a newsstand. He was reading the Volkus of Abukta, a middle-aged man with a fat face and very blond eyebrows. When does the next train leave? Ravik asked. The conductor looked at him lazily. Where are you going? Suddenly Ravik felt a wave of hot panic. Where was he? What was the name of this place? What was the name of the station? Should he say Freiburg? Damn it, why didn't he know where he was? He looked along the platform. No sign. Nowhere the name of the place. He smiled. I am on furlough, he said. Where do you want to go? The conductor asked. I am just riding around. I got off the train here by chance. I liked the way it looked from the window. Now I don't like it anymore. I can't stand waterfalls. Now I want to go on. Where do you want to go? You must know where you want to go. Day after tomorrow I have to be in Freiburg. I've got time until then. It's fun to ride along aimlessly. This line doesn't go to Freiburg, the conductor said and looked at him. What nonsense is this? Ravik thought. Why do I ask at all? How did I come here? I know, he said. I've plenty of time. Do they have Kiyosh anywhere here? Genuine Black Forest Kiyosh. They're in the station restaurant, the conductor said, still looking at him. Ravik walked slowly across the platform. His steps resounded on the cement under the open roof of the station. He saw two men sitting in the first and second class waiting room. He felt their looks on his back. A few swallows flew along under the roof of the station. He made believe he was watching them and looked out of the corner of his eye at the conductor, who was folding up his newspaper. Then he followed Ravik. Ravik went to the restaurant. The place smelled of beer. No one was there. He left the place. The conductor was standing outside. He saw Ravik come out and went into the waiting room. Ravik walked faster. He had made himself suspect, he knew that suddenly. At the corner of the building he turned around. No one was on the platform. He walked hastily through between the express room and the empty baggage office. He ducked under the baggage platform, on which a few milk cans stood, and crept along past the express room window, behind which a telegraph instrument was ticking, until he reached the other side of the building. Cautiously he turned around. Then he quickly crossed the tracks and ran through a blooming meadow toward the pine woods. The powdery heads of the dandelions flew up as he ran across the meadow. 
When he reached the pines he saw the conductor and the two men standing on the platform. The conductor was pointing at him and the two men began to run. He jumped backward and forced his way through the pines. The coniferous branches beat against his face. He ran in a big circle and then stood still lest his whereabouts be discovered. He heard the men breaking through the pines and continued to run. Every moment he listened. Sometimes he did not hear anything, then all he could do was wait. Afterwards there would be a crackling again, and he too continued to creep, on hands and knees now, to make less noise. He clenched his hands into fists and held his breath while listening. He felt a convulsive desire to jump up and rush away, but this would disclose where he was. He could move only when the others moved. He lay in a thicket between blue liver leaves. Hepatica triloba, he thought. Hepatica triloba, the liver leaf. The woods seemed endless. Now there was crackling everywhere. He felt perspiration breaking out of all his pores as if his body were aiming and suddenly his legs gave at the knees as if the joints had softened. He tried to get up. But he was swallowed by the earth. The ground was like a morass. He looked down. The ground was solid. It was his legs. They were of rubber. Now he heard his pursuers closer. They came directly toward him. He dragged himself up but he sank down again on his rubber knees. He dragged his legs. He waded on laboriously, and he heard the crackling coming closer and closer, then all of a sudden a patch of blue sky appeared through the branches, a glade opened, he knew he was lost if he could not run swiftly across it, he dragged and dragged along and, turning around, he saw behind him a face, craftily smiling, Hake's face, he sank and sank down, defenseless, helpless, he was suffocating, he tore at his sinking chest with his hands, he groaned. Had he groaned? Where was he? He felt his hands at his throat. His hands were wet. His throat was wet. His chest was wet. His face was wet. He opened his eyes. He was not yet fully aware of where he was, in the swamp amid the pines or somewhere else. As yet he was altogether unaware of Paris. A white moon hung on a cross above an unknown world. A pale light hung behind a dark cross like a martyred halo. A white dead light cried noiselessly on a pallid iron colored sky. The full moon stood behind the wooden cross in the window of a room in the Hotel International in Paris. Ravik sat up. What had this been? A railway train full of blood, dripping blood, madly racing through a summer evening along bloody rails, the hundred times repeated dream of being in Germany again, to be surrounded persecuted, hunted by the hangman of a bloody regime which had legalized murder, how often he had gone through it. He stared into the moon, the white vampire sucking the colors of the world with its borrowed light. Those dreams, filled with the horror of the concentration camps, full of the torpid faces of slain friends, full of the tearless, petrified pain of those surviving, full of disconsolate farewell and of loneliness that was beyond lamentation. During the day one succeeded in erecting the barrier, the rampart that was higher than one's eyes, one had slowly built it during long laborious years, desires strangled with cynicism, memories buried with callousness and trampled down, one had stripped everything from oneself including one's name, cemented over one's feelings, and when in spite of it at times the livid face of one's past emerged in an unguarded hour, sweet, ghost-like and calling, one had drowned it by drinking to the point of insensibility. During the day, but nights one was still at its mercy. The brakes of discipline were loosed and the cart began to slip, behind the horizon of consciousness it rose again, it broke out of graves, the frozen cramp was loosened. The shadows came back, one's blood boiled, one's sores ran, and the black storm swept across all bulwarks and barricades. To forget that was easy as long as the lanterns of willpower illuminated the world, but when they faded and the noise of the worms became audible, when a destroyed world emerged out of the floods like a sunken vinatu and lived again, that was something else. One could get drunk, dull, and leaden, night after night, to overcome all that, 
one could turn the nights into days and the days into nights, during the day one dreamed differently from nights, not in such forlornness, but off from everything. Hadn't he done it? How often had he returned to the hotel when the first grey of the morning was creeping through the streets? Or had he not waited in the catacombs with anyone willing to drink with him until Morosau came, from the Scheherazade, who went on drinking with him under the artificial palm where only the clock in that windowless room showed how far the light had waxed outside? Getting drunk in a U-boat, that's what it was. It was easy to shake your head and declare that one should be sensible. But hell, it wasn't so easy. Life was life, it was worth nothing and everything, one could throw it away, that was easy, too. But did one not also throw away one's revenge with it and then did one not throw away as well the thing that, sneered at, spat on, daily and hourly ridiculed, was, nevertheless, roughly called belief in humaneness and humanity? An empty life, one didn't throw that away like an empty cartridge. It was still good enough to fight with when the time came for it and when it was needed. Not for personal reasons, not even for revenge, however blood deep revenge might be, not out of egotism, nor for altruistic reasons, however important it might be for one turn of the wheel to help push this world forward out of blood and debris, for no other reason, finally than to fight, merely to fight, and to wait for one's chance to fight as long as one still breathed. But the waiting was corrosive and maybe it was hopeless, and to it was added the secret fear that if the time finally came one would be too crushed by then, too eaten up, too inert from waiting, too tired in one's cells still to be able to march along with the others. Wasn't that the reason one trampled into oblivion everything that could feed on the nerves? extinguished it, efficiently and callously, with sarcasm, with irony, even with counter-sentimentality, with the escape into another human being, into an alien ego? Until it was done the brutal helplessness would come back again while one was at the mercy of sleep and ghosts. The round moon crept under the crossbar of the window. It was no longer a crucified halo, it was a fat, obscene voyeur staring into chambers and beds. Ravik was now wide awake. This had been a comparatively harmless dream. He had known others. But it was a long time since he had dreamed at all. He pondered, it was almost the whole time since he had ceased sleeping alone. He groped beside the bed. The bottle was not there. It had not stood there for quite a while. It stood on the table in the corner of the room. He hesitated a moment. It was not necessary to drink. He knew that. It was also not necessary to refrain from drinking. He got up and walked, barefooted, to the table. He found a glass, uncorked the bottle, and drank. It was the remainder of the old Calvados. He held the glass up to the window. The moon turned it into an opal. Brandy should not stand in the light, he thought. Neither in the sun, nor in the moon. Wounded soldiers who had lain outside through the night under a full moon were weaker than after other nights. He shook his head and emptied his glass. Then he poured himself another. Glancing up he noticed that Joan had opened her eyes and was looking at him. He stopped. He did not know whether she was awake and really saw him. Ravik, she said. Yes. She shivered as if she had only just awakened. Ravik, she said in an altered voice. Ravik, what are you doing there? I'm taking a drink. But why? She straightened up. What's the matter? She said dazedly. What has happened? Nothing. She smoothed back her hair. My God, she said, how frightened I was. I didn't intend that. I thought you would go on sleeping. Suddenly you were standing there, in the corner, quite changed. I'm sorry. Joan. I didn't think you would wake up. I felt that you were gone. It was cold. Like a wind. A cold fright. And then suddenly you were standing there. Has anything happened? No, nothing. Nothing at all, Joan. I woke up and wanted a drink. Let me have a sip. Ravik filled the glass and walked over to the bed. Now you look like a child, he said. 
She took the glass with both hands and drank. She drank slowly and looked over the rim of the glass at him. What made you wake up? She asked. I don't know. I think it was the moon. I hate the moon. You will not hate it in Antibes. She lowered the glass. Are we really going? Yes, we'll go. Away from this mist and rain? Yes, away from this damned mist and rain. Give me another glass. Don't you want to sleep? No. It's a pity to sleep. One misses too much life by sleeping. Give me a glass. Is it the good one? Didn't we want to take it along? One shouldn't take anything along. She looked at him. Never? Never. Ravik went to the window and drew the curtains. They closed only halfway. The moonlight came through the opening in a shaft of light and divided the room into two halves of diffused darkness. Why don't you come to bed? Joan asked. Ravik stood by the sofa on the other side of the moonlight. He saw Joan indistinctly, sitting in bed. Her hair hung darkly bright over the nape of her neck. She was naked. Between him and her flowed the cold light as though between two dark shores, flowing nowhere flowing into itself alone. Into the square of the room, filled with the warm smell of sleep, it flowed from an endless way through the black airless ether, a broken light, rebounding from a remote dead star and magically transformed out of warm sun gleams into leaden cold rivers, it flowed and flowed and yet stood still and never filled the room. Why don't you come? Joan asked. Ravik walked across the room through the dark and the light and again through the dark, it was only a few steps, but it seemed far to him. Did you bring the bottle with you? Yes. Do you want the glass? How late is it? Ravik looked at the phosphorescent numbers on the dial of his little watch. About five o'clock. Five. It could just as well be three. Or seven. At night time stands still. Only the clocks move. Yes. And nevertheless everything happens at night. Or because of it. What? That which later becomes visible during the day. Don't frighten me. You mean it happens beforehand while one sleeps? Yes. She took the glass from his hand and drank. She was very beautiful and he felt he loved her. She was not beautiful as a statue or a picture is beautiful. She was beautiful as a meadow across which the wind blows. It was life that pulsed in her and that had formed her into what she was, formed her mysteriously through the meeting of two cells, out of nothingness in a womb. It was the same incomprehensible enigma that in one tiny seed was contained the entire tree, petrified, microscopic, but there, predestined already, crown and fruit and the showering blossoms of all April mornings, and that out of a night of love and the meeting of a bit of slime there came a face, shoulders, and eyes, just these eyes and these shoulders, and that they had been somewhere, among millions of people somewhere in the world, and then one stood on a November night on the Pont de Lume in Paris, and they came toward one. Why at night? Joan asked. Because, come close to me, beloved, given back to me from the abyss of sleep returned from the moon meadows of chance, because night and sleep are betrayers. Do you remember how we fell asleep tonight, one close to the other, we were so close to each other, as close as humans can be. Our foreheads, our skins, our thoughts, our breath touched each other, mixed, and then sleep gradually began to seep between us, grey, colourless, first a few spots only, then more. It came upon our thoughts like a scab, into our blood, it dropped and dropped the blindness of unconsciousness into us, and then suddenly each of us was alone, we drifted lonely somewhere along dark canals, delivered to unknown powers and every shapeless menace. When I awoke I saw you. You slept. You were still far away. You had entirely slipped away from me. You no longer knew anything of me. You were somewhere I could never follow you. He kissed her hair. How can love be perfect when I every night lose you in sleep? I lay close to you. At your side. In your arm. 
you were in an unknown land. You were at my side, but you were farther away than if you had been on Sirius. When you are away during the day, it doesn't matter, I am aware of everything during the day. But who is aware of anything during the night? I was with you. You were not with me. You just lay at my side. Whoever knows how he'll come back from that land where one is without controls? Transformed without knowing it. You too. Yes, I too, Ravik said. And now give me the glass again. While I talk nonsense, you're drinking. She handed him the glass. It's good you woke up, Ravik. Blessed be the moon. Without it we would have slept and known nothing of each other. Or, in one of us, the seed of leave taking might have been sown while we were defenseless. And, gradually and invisibly, it would grow and grow until it came to light one day. She laughed softly. Ravik looked at her. You don't take it very seriously, do you? No. And you? No. But there is something to it. That's why we don't take it seriously. Therein man is great. She laughed again. I'm not afraid of it. I trust our bodies. They know better what they want than the thoughts that haunt our brains at night. Ravik emptied his glass. All right, he said. And quite right too. Don't let's go to sleep any more tonight. Ravik held the bottle against the silver shaft of the moonlight. It was still one third full. Not much left, he said. But we can try. He put it on the table by the bed. Then he turned around and looked at Joan. You look like all desires of a man and one more of which he was not aware. Good, she said. We should wake up every night, Ravik. At night you're different from what you are during the day. Better? Different. Nights you're surprising. You are always coming from somewhere, somewhere about which one knows nothing. Not during the day? Not always? Sometimes. Lovely confidences, Ravik said. You wouldn't have told me that a few weeks ago. No. Then I knew you less well. He glanced up. There was not a shadow of ambiguity in her face. She simply meant it this way and found it quite natural. She neither wanted to hurt him, nor to say anything important. That's going to be just fine, he said. Why? In a few more weeks you'll know me even better and I'll be still less surprising to you. Just like me, Joan said and laughed. Not you. Why not? That has its reason in fifty thousand years of biology. Love makes the woman keen-sighted and confuses the man. Do you love me? Yes. You don't say it often enough. She stretched herself. Like a satisfied cat, Ravik thought like a satisfied cat sure of its victim. Sometimes I could throw you out of the window, he said. Why don't you do it? He looked at her. Could you do it? She asked. He did not answer. She lay back on the pillow. Destroy someone because one loves him? Kill him because one loves him too much? Ravik reached for the bottle. My God, he said. What have I done to deserve this? to awake at night and be forced to listen to something like this. Isn't it true? Yes. For third-rate poets and women to whom it doesn't happen. For those who do it, too. All right. Could you do it? Joan, Ravik said. Stop this servant girl chatter. I'm not the man for such speculations. I've already killed too many people. As an amateur and as a professional, as a soldier and as a surgeon, that gives one contempt, indifference, and respect for life. One does not erase much by killing. Who has killed often would not kill out of love. One ridicules and diminishes death by it. And death is never small, or ridiculous. And it does not concern women, it is a matter for men. He remained silent for a while. What are we talking about? He said then and bent over her. Aren't you my unrooted happiness? My happiness in the clouds, my searchlight happiness? Come, let me kiss you. Life was never so precious as today, when it matters so little. 16. The Light. 
ever I knew it was the light. It came flying from the horizon like white foam between the deep blue of the ocean and the lighter blue of the day, it came flying, breathless and deepest breath at the same time, radiance and reflection in one, the simple, primordial happiness of being so bright, so gleaming, of floating thus without substance. How it stands behind her head, Ravik thought. Like an aureole without color. Space without perspective. How it flows over her shoulders. Milk from Canaan, silk spun from beams. No one can be naked in this light. The skin catches and radiates it, like the rocks and the sea out there, light foam, most transparent confusion, thinnest dress of brightest mist. How long have we been here now? Joan asked. Eight days. It is like eight years. Don't you think? No. Ravik said. It is like eight hours. Eight hours and three thousand years. Here where you stand, a young Etruscan woman stood in just the same way three thousand years ago, and the wind came in just this way from Africa and chased the light across the ocean. Joan crouched down beside him on the rock. When do we have to go back to Paris? We'll find out tonight in the casino. Have we been winning? Not enough. You play as if you were used to playing. Maybe you are. I really don't know anything about you. Why did the croupier greet you like a rich munitions maker? He mistook me for a munitions maker. That's not true. You recognized him, too. It was politer to pretend so. When were you last here? I don't know. Once many years ago. How tanned you are. You should always be as brown as that. Then I would have to live here all the time. Would you like to? Not all the time. But I would like to live always the way we live here. She flung her hair back over her shoulders. I'm sure you find that very superficial, don't you? No, Ravik said. She smiled and turned to him. I know it's superficial but, my god. We have had too little superficiality in our wretched lives. We've had enough wars, hunger and upheavals and revolutions and inflations, but never a little security and lightness and quiet and time. And now you say there's another war coming. Really, it was easier for our parents, Ravik. Yes. We have only this one short life, and it passes, she put her hands on the warm rock. I am not worth much. Ravik. I am not anxious to live in an historical age. I want to be happy and I wish things would not be so burdensome and difficult. That's all. Who wouldn't wish that, Joan? You too? Of course. That blue, Ravik thought. That almost colorless blue of the horizon, where the sky plunges into the sea, and then this storm deepening along sea and zenith up to these eyes which are bluer here than they ever were in Paris. I wish we could, Joan said. But we do it, for the moment. Yes, for the moment, for a few days, but then we'll be going back to Paris again, to that nightclub in which nothing changes, to that life in a dirty hotel. You exaggerate. Your hotel isn't dirty. Mine is pretty dirty, except my room. She rested her elbows on her knees. The wind blew through her hair. Morosau says you were a wonderful doctor. It's a pity things are the way they are with you. Otherwise you could earn a lot of money. Particularly as a surgeon. Professor Durant. How do you happen to hit on him? Sometimes he comes to the Scheherazade. René, the head waiter, says he doesn't move a finger for less than 10,000 francs. René is well informed. And sometimes he performs two or three operations in one day. He has a wonderful house, a Packard. Strange, Ravik thought. Her face doesn't change. It is if anything even more captivating than before while she babbles this millennium old woman's nonsense. She looks like a sea-eyed Amazon while, with procreative instinct, she preaches bankers' ideals. But isn't she right? Isn't so much beauty always right? And hasn't she every excuse in the world? 
he saw the motorboat approach in a wave of foam. He did not move, he knew why it was coming. The come your friends, he said. Where? Joan had already seen the boat. Why my friends? She asked. They are really more your friends. They've known you longer than me. Ten minutes longer. Anyway, longer. Ravik laughed. All right, Joan. I don't have to go. That's quite simple. I won't go. Of course not. Ravik stretched himself out on the rock and closed his eyes. The sun at once became a warm golden blanket. He knew what would follow. We are not very polite, Joan said after a while. Lovers are never polite. They have both come because of us. To call for us. If you don't want to go for a ride, the least you can do is to go down and tell them so. All right. Ravik half opened his eyes. Let's simplify it. You go down and tell them I have to work, and go with them. Just as you did yesterday. To work, that sounds odd. Who does any work here? Why don't you come with us? They like you very much. They were disappointed yesterday when you didn't come. Oh, God. Ravik opened his eyes fully. Why is it that all women love these idiotic conversations? You would like to go for a ride, I have no boat, life is short, we are only here for a few days, why should I behave magnanimously for you now and persuade you to do what you will do anyway, just to make you feel better? You don't have to persuade me. I can do it by myself. She looked at him. Her eyes were of the same radiant intensity, only her mouth was drawn down for a second, it was an expression flitting across her face so quickly that Ravik could believe he was mistaken. But he knew he was not mistaken. The ocean beat resoundingly against the rocks of the jetty. It spirited high and the wind carried off a spray of glistening drops. Ravik felt it on his skin like a brief shiver. That was your wave, Joan said. Your wave of the story you told me in Paris. I see, have you kept it in mind? Yes. But you aren't a rock. You are a block of concrete. She walked down to the dock and the whole sky rested on her beautiful shoulders. It was as if she carried it. She had her excuse. She would sit in the white boat, her hair would fly in the wind, and I am an idiot for not going with them, Ravik thought. But I am not yet suited for that role. This too is a foolish arrogance of forgotten days, a quixotism. But what else is left? Blooming fig trees in moonlit night, Seneca's and Socrates' philosophy, Schumann's violin concerto, and the foreknowledge of loss gained earlier than by others. He heard Joan's voice from below. Then he heard the low thunder of the motor. He did not sit up. She would take her place in the stern. There was an island with a cloister somewhere in the sea. Sometimes the cocks crowed from over there. How red the sun shone through one's eyelids. The soft meadows of youth red with flowers of the expectant blood. The old lullaby of the sea. The bells of Vinita. The magic happiness of non-thinking. He quickly fell asleep. Dash. In the afternoon he went to fetch the car from the garage. It was a tall but which Morosau had rented for him in Paris. He had come down in it with Joan. He drove along the coast. The day was very clear and almost too bright. He drove across the middle Corniche to Nice and Monte Carlo, and then to Villefranche. He loved the old small harbour and sat for a while in front of one of the bistros on the quay. He strolled about the garden in front of the casino in Monte Carlo and the suicide cemetery high above the sea. He looked for a grave and stood before it for a long time and smiled. He drove through the narrow streets of old Nice and across the new part of the city, through the squares with the monuments, then he drove back to Cannon beyond Cannes up to where the rocks were red and the fishing villages had biblical names. He forgot Joan. He forgot himself. He simply opened up to this clear day, to the triad of sun, sea, and land which made a coast blossom while the mountain roads above it were still full of snow. Rain hung over France, the storm roared over Europe, but this narrow coast seemed not yet to know about all that. 
it seemed to have been forgotten, life had a different pulse beat here, and while the land behind it grew grey with the mist of misery, of foreboding and danger, the sun shone here and it was serene and in its radiance gathered the last foam of a dying world. A brief dance of moths and gnats around the last light, meaningless like every dance of gnats, foolish as the light music coming from the cafes, a world having become superfluous as butterflies in October, frost already in their little summer hearts, thus it danced, chattered, flirted, loved, betrayed, and deluded its senses for yet a little before the scythes and the big winds came. Ravik turned the car in Street Raphael. The small square harbour was full of sailboats and motorboats. The cafes on the quay had set up garish umbrellas. Tan women were sitting at the tables. How it all came back again, Ravik thought, the pleasant, easy-going way of life. The gay temptation, the release, the game, how it came back no matter from how long ago. Once he too had experienced this butterfly existence and had thought it would suffice. The car shot out of the turn along the street into the glowing sunset. He returned to the hotel and found a message from Joan. She had called and left word she wouldn't be back for dinner. He went down to the Eden Rock. There were few people for dinner. Most of the others were in Juan Lapins and in Cannes. He sat by the railing of the terrace which was built on the rock like a ship's deck. Below the surf foamed. The waves emerged from the sunset, dark red and greenish blue, changed to a lighter golden red and orange, and then took the dusk on their slender backs and scattered it into twilight colored foam. Ravik sat on the terrace for a long time. He felt cool and deeply alone. He saw what would happen clearly and without emotion. He knew that he could still prevent it for a while, tricks and clever moves were possible. He knew them and would not use them. This had already gone too far for that. Tricks were something for small affairs. There was only one thing left, to face it. To face it honestly, without self-deception and without dodging. Ravik lifted the glass of clear light Provencal wine against the light. A cool night, a sea-ringed terrace the sky filled with the laughter of the sun's farewell and with the bells of faraway stars, and, cool within me, he thought, a searchlight which penetrates the silent months of the future and sweeps over them and leaves them in the dark again, and I am aware of it, painlessly as yet, but I am also aware that it won't remain painless, and once again my life is like a glass in my hand, transparent filled with alien wine which can't be kept because it would become flat, would become the stale vinegar of dead passion. It would not last. There was much too much of a beginning in that other life for it to last. Innocently and thoughtlessly, like a plant toward light, it turns toward the temptation and the variegated multifariousness of a lighter life. It wanted future, and all he had to offer was a bit of shabby present. Nothing had happened yet but that wasn't necessary. Things were always decided a long time in advance. Usually one didn't notice and took the spectacular ending for the decision which, long months before, had come in silence. Ravik emptied his glass. The light wine seemed to taste different than before. He refilled the glass and drank again. The wine once more had its old light flaky taste. He got up and drove to Cannes to the casino. He played calmly and for small stakes. He still felt the coolness within him and knew he could win as long as it lasted. He played the last twelve, the twenty-seven square and twenty-seven. After an hour he had won three thousand francs. He doubled his stakes for the square and played four as well. He noticed Joan when she entered. She had changed her dress and so she must have returned immediately after he had left the hotel. She was with the two men who had called for her in the motorboat. He knew them as Le Clerc, a Belgian, and Nugent, an American. Joan looked very beautiful. She wore a white evening gown with large grey flowers. He had bought it for her the day before their departure. She had seen it and rushed toward it. How do you know so much about evening gowns? She had asked. It is much better than mine. And after a second glance, also more expensive. 
bird, he thought, still on my branches but with wings ready for flight. The croupier pushed some chips toward him. The square had won. He withdrew the winnings and left the stake. Joan went to the baccarat tables. He did not know whether she had seen him. Some people who were not playing glanced after her. She always walked as if she were walking against a light wind and as if she had no goal. She turned her head and said something to Nugent, and suddenly Ravik felt the urge in his hands to push away the chips, to push himself away from this green table, to get up, to take Joan away, quickly, past all the people, doors, away, to an island, perhaps to that island on the horizon of Antibes, away from all this to isolate her and keep her. He bet again. The seven had come up. Islands did not isolate. And the restlessness of the heart could not be confined, one lost easiest what one held in one's arms, never what one left. The ball slowly stopped rolling. The twelve. He bet again. When he glanced up he was looking straight into Joan's eyes. She stood at the other side of the table and was looking at him. He nodded to her and smiled. She stared at him. He pointed at the wheel and shrugged his shoulders. The nineteen came up. He placed his bets and looked up again. Joan was not there anymore. He forced himself to remain sitting. He took a cigarette out of the package that lay beside him. One of the attendants gave him a light. He was a fat, bald-headed man, in uniform. Times have changed, he said. Yes, Ravik said. He did not know the man. It was different in 29. Yes. Ravik no longer knew whether he had been in Cannes in 1929 or whether the man was just talking. He saw that the four had come up without his having noticed it and he tried to concentrate better. But suddenly it seemed stupid to him to be gambling here with a few francs in order to be able to stay a few days more. To what purpose? Why had he come here at all? It was confounded weakness, nothing else. That fed on one, slowly, silently, and one noticed it only when one wanted to exert oneself to the utmost and broke. Morosa was right. The best way to lose a woman was to show her a kind of life that one could offer her for only a few days. She would try to regain it, but with someone else who was capable of making it permanent. I'll tell her that we have to break up, he thought. I'll part from her in Paris before it is too late. He considered going on playing at another table. But suddenly he felt no desire to. One should not do something on a small scale that one had done on a large scale. He looked around. Joan was not to be seen. He went into the bar and drank cognac. Then he went to the parking place to get his car and drive around for an hour. As he was starting the car, he saw Joan coming. He got out. She came toward him quickly. Were you going to drive home without me? She asked. I was going to drive through the mountains for an hour and then come back. You were lying. You didn't intend to come back. You were going to leave me behind with those idiots. Joan, Ravik said. Soon you will claim it's my fault you are with those idiots. It is your fault. I went in the boat with them because I was angry. Why weren't you in the hotel when I returned? You had a dinner appointment with your idiots. She was taken aback for a second. I only made it because you weren't there when I came back. All right, Joan, Ravik said. Let's not go on talking about it. Did you enjoy it? No. She stood before him, breathless, agitated, impetuous, in the blue darkness of the soft night. The moon was in her hair and her lips were of such a deep red in her pale face that they were almost black. It was February, 1939, and in Paris the inevitable would begin, slowly, crawlingly, with all the little lies, humiliations and disputes. He wanted to leave her before this happened, and yet she was here and there weren't many more days left. Where were you going to drive? She asked. Nowhere in particular. Just drive. I'll ride with you. But what will your idiots say? Nothing. I have said goodbye to them already. I told them you were waiting for me. 
Not bad, Ravik said. You are a child with deliberation. Wait till I put the top up. Leave it down. My coat will keep me warm enough. Let's drive slowly. Past all the cafes where the people who have nothing to do but be happy sit and have no arguments. She slid onto the seat beside him and kissed him. This is the first time I've been on the Riviera, Ravik, she said. Don't be hard on me. This is the first time I've really been with you and the nights aren't cold anymore and I am happy. He drove the car out of the heavy traffic to the road past the Hotel Carlton and then in the direction of Wanley Pins. The first time, she repeated. The first time, Ravik, and I know everything you could answer, and it has nothing to do with it. She leaned close to him and put her head on his shoulder. Forget what happened today. Don't think about it. You are a wonderful driver, Ravik. Do you know that? What you did just now was beautiful. The idiots were saying the same thing. Yesterday they saw what you could do with a car. You are uncanny. You have no past. One doesn't know anything about you. I know a hundred times more about the life of those idiots by now than about yours. Do you think that I could get some Galvados somewhere? I need some after all the excitement tonight. It is difficult to live with you. The car swept over the road like a low flying bird. Too fast? Ravik asked. No. Drive faster. So that it blows through us like wind through a tree. How the night rushes past. I am penetrated through and through by love. One can look through me because of my love. I love you so much that my heart spreads out like a woman in a cornfield before a man who looks at her. My heart wants to lie down on the ground. In a meadow. It wants to lie and to fly. It is mad. It loves you when you drive a car. Let's never go back to Paris. Let's steal a trunk full of jewelry or rubber bank and take this car and never come back. Ravik stopped in front of a little bar. The hum of the motor died and softly from afar came suddenly the deep breathing of the sea. Come, he said. We'll get your Galvados here. How much have you had already? Too much. Because of you. Besides, all of a sudden I couldn't listen to the babbling of those idiots any longer. Then why didn't you come to me? I have come to you. Yes. When you thought I would leave. Have you had anything to eat? Not much. I'm hungry. Did you win? Yes. Then let's drive to the most expensive restaurant and eat caviar and drink champagne and let's be as our parents were before all these wars, carefree and sentimental and without fear, uninhibited and full of bad taste, with tears, the moon, oleanders, violins, the ocean, and love. And I want to believe that we'll have children and a garden and a house and you'll have a passport and a future, and I had given up a great career for your sake and we still love each other after twenty years and are jealous and you still think me beautiful and I cannot sleep when you aren't home for a night, and... He saw tears streaming down her face. She smiled. That is all part of it, beloved, all part of that bad taste. Come, he said. We'll drive to the Chateau Madrid. That's in the mountains and they have Russian gypsies there and you shall have anything you want. It was early in the morning. The sea below was grey and without waves. The sky had neither clouds nor colours. Only on the horizon a small streak of silver emerged from the water. It was so still that they heard each other breathing. They were the last guests up there. The gypsies had driven past them in an old ford down the serpentine road. The waiter in a Citroen. The cook, to get supplies, in a six-passenger 1929 de la Haye. Daybreak, Ravik said. Now the night is somewhere on the other side of the earth. There will be aeroplanes some time with which one will be able to overtake it. They will go as fast as the earth turns. Then if you tell me again at four o'clock in the morning that you love me we can let it be four o'clock forever, we will simply fly around the earth with time and the hours will stand still. Joan leaned against him. I can't help it. It is beautiful. It is heartbreakingly beautiful. You may laugh. It is beautiful, Joan. She looked at him. 
where is the plane of which you spoke? We'll be old, beloved, when your plane is invented. And I don't want to get old. Do you? Yes. Really? As old as possible. Why? I want to see what becomes of this planet. I don't want to get old. You won't get old. Life will pass over your face, that will be all, and it will become more beautiful. One is old only when one no longer feels. No. When one no longer loves. Ravik did not answer. To leave you, he thought. To leave you. What was I thinking a few hours ago in Cannes? She stirred in his arms. Now the party is over and I am going home with you and we are going to sleep together. How beautiful it all is. How beautiful it is when one lives completely and not with just a part of oneself. When one is full to the rim and calm because there is nothing more to get in. Come, let's drive home. To our borrowed home, to that white hotel that looks like a country house. The car slid down the serpentine road almost without aid of the motor. The day was slowly becoming brighter. The earth smelled of dew. Ravik turned off the headlights. When they were passing the corniche they met vans with vegetables and flowers. They were on the road to Nice. Later they passed a company of spahis. They heard the trotting of the horses through the droning of the motor. It sounded clear and almost artificial on the macadam road. The riders' faces were dark under their burnouses. Ravik looked at Joan. She smiled at him. Her face was pale and tired and more fragile than before. In its soft fatigue it seemed to him more beautiful than ever on this magic, dark, still morning whose yesterday was sunk in the distance and which had not as yet any hour, which still floated timelessly, full of quietude, without fear or question. The Bay of Antibes came toward them in a great circle. The dawn was steadily growing lighter. Iron-gray shadows of four men of war, three destroyers and a cruiser, stood against the brightening day. They must have come into the harbor during the night. Low and menacing and silent they stood against the receding sky. Ravik looked down at Joan. She had fallen asleep on his shoulder. 17. Ravik was going to the hospital. He had been back from the Riviera for a week. Suddenly he stopped. What he saw was like something out of a child's toy box. The new building shone in the sun as if it had been constructed from a model kit, the scaffolding stood out against the bright sky like filigree, and when a beam with a figure on it began to topple, it looked as if a matchstick with a fly on it were tumbling down. It fell and fell and seemed to fall endlessly. The figure freed itself and now it was like a tiny doll that stretched out its arms and sailed clumsily through space. It was as if the world were frozen and still as death for a moment. Nothing stirred, no breeze, no breath, no sound, only the little figure and the rigid beam fell and fell. Then suddenly everything was noise and movement. Ravik realized that he had been holding his breath. He ran. The victim lay on the pavement. A second ago the street had been almost empty. Now it was swarming with people. They came from all directions as if an alarm had sounded. Ravik forced his way through the crowd. He noticed that two workers were attempting to lift the victim. Don't lift him. Leave him where he is. He shouted. The people around and in front of him made way. The two workers held the victim half suspended. Let him down slowly careful. Slowly. What are you? One of the workers asked. A doctor? Yes. All right. The workers laid the victim on the pavement. Ravik knelt beside him and examined him. He carefully opened the sweaty blouse and felt the body. Then he rose. What? Asked the worker who had spoken to him before. Unconscious, isn't he? Ravik shook his head. What? The worker asked. Dead, Ravik said. Dead? Yes. But, the man said incredulously, we had just been eating lunch together. Is there a doctor here? Someone asked behind the ring of gaping people. What's the matter? Ravik said. Is there a doctor here? Quick. What's the matter? 
That woman. What woman? The beam hit her. She's bleeding. Ravik forced his way out through the crowd. A short woman with a large blue apron lay on a heap of sand beside a lime trough. Her face was wrinkled, very pale, and her eyes were as motionless as lumps of coal. Blood spurted like a little fountain from below her neck. It spurted sideways in a throbbing, oblique ray and gave a strange impression of disorder. Under her head a dark pool was quickly seeping into the sand. Ravik pressed his fingers on the artery. He pulled out of his pocket a bandage and the small first aid kit he always kept with him. Hold this, he said to the man next to him. Four hands grasped for the bag simultaneously. It fell to the sand and opened. He pulled out the scissors and a stick and tore open the bandage. The woman did not say anything. Not even her eyes moved. She was rigid and every muscle of her body was tense. Everything will be all right, mother, Ravik said. Everything will be all right. The beam had struck her shoulder and neck. The shoulder was crushed, her collarbone was broken and the joint smashed. It would remain stiff. It is your left arm, Ravik said and carefully examined the neck. The skin was lacerated, but everything else was uninjured. The foot was twisted, he tapped the bone and the leg. Grey stockings, well mended but whole, tied under the knee with a black ribbon, with what detail one always saw all this. Black laced boots, mended, the laces tied with a double knot, the shoes repaired at the toe. Has anyone telephoned for an ambulance? he asked. Nobody answered. I think the policeman has, someone said after a while. Ravik raised his head. Policeman? Where is he? Over there, with the other. Ravik got up. Everything has been taken care of then. He was about to walk away. At this moment the policeman pushed through the crowd. He was a young man with a notebook in his hand. He excitedly licked his short, blunt pencil. One moment, he said and started to write. Everything has been taken care of here. Ravik said. One moment, sir. I'm in a hurry. I have an urgent case. One moment, sir. Are you the physician? I've tied off the artery, that's all. Now all that's needed is to wait for the ambulance. One moment, doctor. I must put down your name. You are a witness. I didn't see the accident. I happened to come by afterwards. Nevertheless, I must put down everything. This is a serious accident, doctor. I can see that, Ravik said. The policeman tried to learn the woman's name. The woman could not answer. She only stared at him without seeing him. The policeman bent over her zealously. Ravik looked around. The crowd fenced him in like a wall. He could not get through. Listen, he said to the policeman. I'm in a great hurry. Very well, doctor. Don't make it more difficult. I must put everything down in order. The fact that you are a witness is important. The woman may die. She won't die. No one can tell about that. And then there is the question of compensation. Did you call for an ambulance? My colleague is attending to that. Don't bother me now or it will take that much longer. The woman is half dead and you want to disappear, one of the workmen said reproachfully to Ravik. She'd be dead by now if I hadn't been here. Well then, the workman said without obvious logic. You've got to stay. The shutter of a camera clicked. A man wearing a hat turned up in front, smiled. Will you just go through that again as if you were applying the bandage? He asked Ravik. No. It's for the press. The man said. Your picture will be in the paper with your address and a caption saying you saved the woman's life. Good publicity. Please, over here, this way, the light is better here. Go to hell, Ravik said. The woman urgently needs an ambulance. The bandage can't remain like that for long. See that an ambulance is called. One thing after the other, doctor. The policeman declared. First I must finish the report. Has the deceased told you his name yet? 
asked a half-grown youth. Targul. The policeman spat in front of the boy's feet. Take another picture from here, someone said to the photographer. Why? So that it will show that the woman was on the closed-off part of the sidewalk. See that? He pointed at a board that was standing sidewise, with the inscription, Attention! Danger! Take the picture so that one can see it. We need it. Compensation is out of the question here. I'm a press photographer, the man with the hat declared brushing the suggestion aside. I only photograph what I consider interesting. But this is interesting. What is more interesting? With the board in the background. A board is not interesting. Action is interesting. Then put it down in your report. The man tapped the policeman on the shoulder. Who are you? He asked angrily. I am the representative of the construction company. All right, the policeman said. You stay here, too. What's your name? You must know that. He asked the woman. The woman moved her lips. Her eyelids began to flutter. Like butterflies, like deathly tired grey moths, Ravik thought, and at the same moment, idiots that I am. I must try to get away. Damn it, the policeman said. Maybe she's gone crazy. That makes more work. And my office hours end at three. Marcel, the woman said. What? Just a moment. What? The policeman bent down again. The woman was silent. What? The policeman waited. Once more. Say it once more. The woman remained silent. You with your damn chatter, the policeman said to the representative of the construction company. How can a man get his report together this way? At that moment the shutter clicked. Thank you. The photographer said. Full of action. Have you got our sign in it? The representative of the construction company asked without waiting for the policeman. I'll order half a dozen immediately. No, the photographer declared. I'm a socialist. Just pay the insurance, you miserable watchdog of the millionaires. A siren shrieked. The ambulance. This is the moment, Ravik thought. He cautiously took a step. But the policeman held him back. You must come with us to headquarters, doctor. I'm sorry, but we must have a record of everything. The other policeman stood beside him now. There was nothing to be done. Let's hope it will work out all right, Ravik thought, and went with them. The official on duty at police headquarters had listened quietly to the gendarme and policeman who had written the report. Now he turned to Ravik. You are not a Frenchman, he said. He didn't ask, he stated it as a fact. No, Ravik said. What are you? A Czech. How is it that you are a doctor here? As a foreigner you can't practice if you aren't naturalized. Ravik smiled. I don't practice here. I'm here as a tourist. For pleasure. Have you your passport with you? Is that necessary, Fernand? Another official asked. The gentleman has helped the woman and we have his address. That should be enough. There are still other witnesses. I'm interested. Have you your passport with you? Or your carte d'identite? Of course not, Ravik said. Who keeps his passport with him all the time? Where is it? At the consulate. I took it there a week ago. It had to be extended. Ravik knew that if he said his passport was at his hotel he might be sent there with a policeman and the bluff would be discovered at once. Besides, to be on the safe side, he had given a false address. He had a chance at the consulate. At which consulate? Fernand asked. The Czech. We can call up and ask them. Fernand looked at Ravik. Of course. Fernand waited a while. All right, he said then. We'll just ask. He rose and went into one of the adjoining rooms. The other official was very embarrassed. Pardon us, doctor, he said to Ravik. Of course, it isn't necessary at all. It will be cleared up immediately. We are obliged to you for your help. Cleared up, Ravik thought. 
He looked about calmly while he took out a cigarette. The gendarme stood by the door. That was mere chance. No one really suspected him as yet. He might push him aside, but there were still the man from the construction company and the two workmen. He gave it up. It would be too hard to break through, a few more policemen would be standing outside the door. Fernand returned. There is no passport with your name at the consulate. Maybe there is, Ravik said. How is that possible? An official at the telephone doesn't necessarily know everything. There are half a dozen people who deal with these matters. This one knew. Ravik did not reply. You are not a Czech, Fernand replied. Listen, Fernand, the other official began. You haven't a Czech accent, Fernand said. Maybe not. You are a German. Finand declared triumphantly. And you have no passport. No, Ravik replied. I am a Moroccan and have all the French passports in the world. Sir, Fernand shouted. How dare you! You're insulting the French colonial empire. Murd, one of the workmen said. The representative of the construction company made a face as if he wanted to salute. Fernand, now don't. You're lying. You're not a Czech. Have you a passport or not? Answer. The Ratin Man, Ravik thought. The Ratin Man which one can never drown. What does it matter to this idiot whether I have a passport or not? But the rat smells something and here it comes creeping out of its hole. Answer. Fernand barked at him. A piece of paper. To have it or not to have it. This creature would beg my pardon and bow if I had that scrap of paper. It would not make any difference if I had murdered a family or robbed a bank, this man would salute me. But even Christ without a passport, nowadays he would perish in a prison. Anyhow, he would be slain long before his thirty-third year. You'll stay here until this is cleared up, Fernand said. I'll see to that. All right, Ravik said. Finan stamped out of the room. The second official rummaged among his papers. Sir, he said presently, I am sorry. He is crazy on this subject. Never mind. Are we through? One of the workmen asked. Yes. All right. He turned to Ravik. When the world revolution comes, you won't need a passport. You must understand, sir, the official said. Fernand's father was killed in the World War. That's why he hates the Germans and does such things. He looked at Travik for a moment in embarrassment. He seemed to surmise what was wrong. I am awfully sorry, sir. If it was up to me. Never mind. Ravik looked around. May I use the telephone before this Fernand returns? Of course. They're on the table. Do it quickly. Ravik telephoned Morosau. He told him in German what had happened. He was to let Weber know. Joan too? Morosau asked. Ravik hesitated. No. Not yet. Tell her I have been detained, but everything will be all right again in two or three days. Take care of her. All right, Morosau replied, not over enthusiastically. All right, was it? When Finand returned, Ravik put the receiver down. What were you talking just now? He asked with a grin. Check. Esperanto. Weber came next morning. A damned hole, he said as he looked around. French prisons are still real prisons, Ravik replied. Not tainted with the humbug of humanitarianism. Good stinking 18th century. Disgusting, Weber said. Disgusting that you got into it. One shouldn't do any good deeds. One has to suffer for them immediately. I should have let the woman bleed to death. We live in an iron age, Weber? In a cast iron one. Did our friends find out that you are here illegally? Naturally. The address too? Of course not. I would never expose the old international. The hotel keeper would be punished because she harbors unregistered guests. And raid would ensue during which a dozen refugees would be caught. I gave the Hotel Lancaster as my address this time. An expensive, 
fine little hotel. I stayed there once during my former life. And your new name is Wazek. Vladimir Wazek. Ravik grinned. My fourth. Hell, Weber said. What can be done, Ravik? Not much. The main thing is that our friends mustn't find out that I've been here a few times before. Otherwise it will mean six months in prison. Damn it. Yes, the world becomes more humane day by day. Live dangerously, Nietzsche said. The refugees do, against their will. And if they don't find out? Two weeks, I guess. And the usual deportation. And then? Then I'll return. Until you are caught again? Exactly. It has taken a long while this time. Two years. A lifetime. We must do something. It can't go on like this. It can. What can you do? Weber thought about it. Durant. He then said suddenly. Naturally. Durant knows a lot of people and is influential, he interrupted himself. My God, you yourself performed an operation on one of the principal bigwigs. That man with the gallbladder. Not I Durant. Weber laughed. Naturally he can't tell that to the old gentleman. But he'll be able to do something. I'll wring his heart. You'll achieve very little. I cost him two thousand francs some time ago. His type doesn't forget that sort of thing easily. He will, Weber said, rather amused. The thing is he'll be afraid you might tell about those ghosted operations. You have performed dozens for him. Besides he needs you badly. He can easily find someone else. Binet or some refugee surgeon. There are plenty of them. Weber smoothed his moustache. Not with your hand. We'll try it anyway. I'll do it this very day. Can I get anything for you here? How is the food? Ghastly. But I can make them bring in something. Cigarettes. Enough. You can't help me with what I really need, a bath. Ravik lived there for two weeks with a Jewish plumber, a half-Jewish writer, and a Pole. The plumber was homesick for Berlin, the writer hated it, nothing mattered to the Pole. Ravik provided the cigarettes. The writer told Jewish jokes. The plumber was indispensable as an expert in combating the stench. After two weeks, Ravik was summoned. First he was brought before an inspector who only asked him whether he had any money. Yes. All right. Then you can take a taxi. An official went with him. The street was light and sunny. It was good to be outside again. An old man was selling balloons at the entrance. Ravik could not imagine why he was selling them in front of the prison. The official hailed a taxi. Where are we going? Ravik asked. To the chief. Ravik did not know which chief it was. It didn't make much difference to him either as long as it wasn't the chief of a German concentration camp. There was only one real horror in the world to be completely and helplessly at the mercy of brutal terrorism. The present incident was harmless. The taxi had a radio. Ravik turned it on. He got the vegetable market report, then the political news. The official yawned. Ravik dialed another station. Music. A hit. The official perked up. Charles Drenay, he said. Manil Montant. Real class. The taxi stopped. Ravik paid. He was conducted into a waiting room that smelled of expectation, sweat and dust, like all the waiting rooms in the world. He sat for half an hour and read an old issue of La Vie Parisienne left behind by a visitor. It was like classic literature after two weeks without books. Then he was taken before the chief. It took some time before he recognized the short, fat man. Usually he was not concerned with faces when he operated. They were as unimportant to him as so many numbers. He was interested in the sick places only. But he had looked at this face with curiosity. There he sat, healthy, his pot belly filled again, minus gallbladder, level. Ravik had forgotten by this time that Weber had intended to seek Durant's aid and he had not expected to be presented to level himself. 
Laval looked him up and down, thereby giving himself time. Of course your name is not Twazek, he grumbled. No. What is your name? Newman. Ravik had arranged this with Weber, who had explained it to Durant. Wozek was too improbable. You are a German, aren't you? Yes. Refugee? Yes. One never can tell. You don't look it. Not all refugees are Jews, Ravik explained. Why were you lying? About your name? Ravik shrugged his shoulders. What else can we do? We lie as little as possible. We have to, do you think it's fun for us? Level swelled up. Do you think it is fun for us to be bothered with you? Gray, Ravik thought. His head had been whitish gray, the lacrimal sacks dirty blue, the mouth had gaped half open. At that time he hadn't talked, then he had been a heap of flabby flesh with a rotting gallbladder in it. Where do you live? The address was wrong, too. I have lived everywhere. Sometimes here, sometimes there. For how long? For three weeks. Three weeks ago I came from Switzerland. I was put across the border. You know that from a legal point of view we haven't the right to live anywhere without papers, and that most of us haven't yet been able to make up our minds to commit suicide. That's the reason we bother you. You should have remained in Germany, Level grumbled. It isn't quite so bad there. People exaggerate. A slightly different incision, Ravik thought, and you wouldn't be here to talk this nonsense. The worms would have crossed your borderline without papers, or you would be a handful of dust in an undistinguished turn. Where did you live here? Level asked. That's what you would like to know, to catch the others too, Ravik thought. In first rate hotels, he said. Under various names. Always for only a few days. That's not true. Why do you ask me if you know better? said Ravik, who was slowly getting fed up. Level struck the table angrily with the flat of his hand. Don't be impudent. Immediately afterwards, he examined his hand. You hit the scissors, Ravik said. Level put his hand into his pocket. Don't you think you're rather impertinent? He asked suddenly with the calm of a man who can afford to control himself because the other person is dependent on him. Impertinent? Ravik looked at him, astonished. You call that impertinence? We are neither in school nor in a reformatory for repentant criminals. I'm acting in self-defense, would you like me to feel like a criminal begging for a mild sentence? Only because I'm not a Nazi and therefore have no papers? The fact that we still don't consider ourselves criminals, although we have had experience of all kinds of prison, police, humiliations, only because we want to remain alive, that's the only thing that keeps us upright, don't you understand? God knows this is something other than impertinence. Lovell did not answer. Have you practiced here? He asked. No. The scar must be smaller by now, Ravik thought. I sewed it nicely at that time. It was quite a job with all that fat. Meanwhile he's been stuffing himself again. Stuffing and drinking. That's where the greatest danger is, Level explained. Without examinations, without control, you hang around here. Who knows for how long? Don't think that I believe you about those three weeks. Who knows what you had your hand in, in how many shady affairs. In your paunch with its hardened arteries, its swollen liver, and its fermenting gallbladder, Ravik thought. And if I hadn't had my hand in it, your friend, Durant, would probably have killed you in a humane and idiotic way and would have become even more famous as a surgeon because of it and would have raised his fees. This is where the greatest danger lies, Level repeated. You are not permitted to practice. So you will accept anything that comes your way, that's obvious. I was talking about it with one of our authorities. He's of entirely the same opinion. If you really know anything about medical science, his name should be familiar to you. No, Ravik thought, that's impossible. He won't say Durant now. Life can't crack such jokes. Professor Durant, 
Laval said with dignity. He explained it to me. Menials, students who have not yet completed their studies, masseurs, assistants, here all these claim to have been great medical men in Germany. Who can check on that? Illegal operations, abortions, collaboration with midwives, quackery, and heaven knows what else. We can't be severe enough. Durant, Ravik thought. That's his revenge for the 2,000 francs. But who'll do his operations now? Binet, surely? Very likely they have got together again. He noticed that he was no longer listening. He did not become attentive again until Weber's name was mentioned. A certain Dr. Weber has spoken in your behalf. Do you know him? Slightly. He was here. Laval gazed straight ahead for a moment. Then he sneezed loudly, got his handkerchief out and blew his nose circumstantially, contemplated what he had blown out, folded his handkerchief together and put it into his pocket again. I can't do anything for you. We must be severe. You'll be deported. I know that. Have you been in France before? No. Six months imprisonment if you return. You know that? Yes. I'll see to it that you are deported as soon as possible. That's all I can do. Have you any money? Yes. All right. Then you will have to pay for the trip of your escort and yourself to the border. He nodded. You may go now. Any special hour when we have to be back? Ravik asked the official who was escorting him. Not exactly. It depends. Why? I'd like to drink an aperitif. The official looked at him. I won't run away, Ravik said. He drew a twenty franc bill out of his pocket and toyed with it. All right. A few minutes can't make any difference. They had the taxi stop at the next bistro. There were a few tables already standing outside. It was cool, but the sun was shining. What will you have? Ravik asked. A mapicon. Nothing else at this hour of the day. Give me a fine. Without water. Ravik sat the calmly and breathed deeply. Air, eh, what could that be? The branches of the trees on the sidewalk had brown shining buds. There was a smell of fresh bread and new wine. The waiter brought the glasses. Where is the telephone? Ravik asked. Inside, to your right, next to the toilets. But, the official said. Ravik put the twenty franc bill into his hand. You can probably imagine to whom I'm going to telephone. I won't disappear. You can come with me. Come along. The official didn't hesitate for long. All right, he said and got up. A human being is a human being, after all. Joan. Ravik. My God. Where are you? Have they let you out? Tell me where you are. In a bistro. Stop it. Tell me where you really are. I'm really in a bistro. Where? Are you no longer in prison? Where have you been all this time? This Morosau? He told you exactly what went wrong with me? He hasn't even told me where they took you. I would have come right away. That's why he didn't tell you, Joan. Better so. Why do you telephone from a bistro? Why don't you come here? I can't come. I've only a few minutes. I had to persuade the official to stop here for a moment. Joan, I'll be sent to Switzerland in the next few days, and, Ravik glanced out the window. The official was leaning on the counter and talking. And I'll be back at once. He waited. Joan. I'll come. I'll come at once. Where are you? You can't come. I'm half an hour's distance from you. I've only a few minutes left. Hold the official off. Give him money. I can bring money with me. Joan, Ravik said. It won't work. I must stop now. He heard her breathe. You don't want to see me? She then asked. It was difficult. I shouldn't have telephoned, he thought. How can one explain anything without being able to look at the other person? I'd like nothing better than to see you, Joan. Then come. That man can come with you. 
It's impossible. I must stop now. Tell me quickly what you're doing now. What? How do you mean that? What are you wearing? Where are you? In my room. In bed. I was up late last night. I can put something on in a minute and come right away. Late last night? Of course. All that went right on also while one was imprisoned. One forgot about it. In bed, half asleep, her hair tumbled on the pillows, stockings scattered on chairs, lingerie, an evening gown, things began to reel, the window of the hot telephone booth, half misted by his breath, the infinitely remote head of the official that swam in it as though in an aquarium. He pulled himself together. I must stop now, Joan. He heard her disconcerted voice. But that's impossible. You can't simply go away like this and I don't know anything, either way you are going or what, propped up. The pillows pushed aside, the telephone like a weapon and an enemy in her hand, the shoulders, the eyes, deep and dark with excitement. I'm not going to war. I'm merely traveling to Switzerland. I'll be back soon. Imagine I am a businessman who is going to sell a carload of machine guns to the League of Nations. When you come back, then it will be the same all over again. I won't be able to live from fear. Say the last sentence once more. It's true. Her voice became angry. I'm the last one to be told anything. Weber can visit you, not I. You've called up Mirosau, not me. And now you're going. My God. Ravik said. We won't quarrel, Joan. I'm not quarreling. I'm merely saying what's wrong. All right. I must stop now. Adieu, Joan. Ravik. She called. Ravik. Yes. Come back again. Come back again. I'm lost without you. I'll come back. Yes, yes. Adieu, Joan. I'll be back soon. He stood in the hot steaming booth for a moment. Then he noticed that his hand had not let go of the receiver. He opened the door. The official looked up. He smiled good naturedly. Through? Yes. They went back outside to their table. Ravik emptied his glass. I shouldn't have telephoned, he thought. I was calm before. Now I am confused. I should have known that a telephone conversation could bring nothing else. Not for me, or for Joan. He felt the temptation to go back, to call up again and tell her everything he really wanted to tell her. To explain to her why he couldn't see her. That he didn't want her to see him as he was, dirty, under guard. But he would come out and it would be the same all over again. I think we've got to move on, the official said. Yes. Ravik called the waiter. Give me two small bottles of cognac, all the newspapers and a dozen packages of caporals. And the check. He looked at the official. Permissible, isn't it? A man is a man, the official said. The waiter brought the bottles and cigarettes. Open the bottles, Ravik said, while he carefully distributed the cigarettes in his pockets. He corked the bottles again in such a way that he could easily open them without a corkscrew and put them into the inside pocket of his coat. You're good at that, the official said. Practice. Sorry to say. As a boy I would never have thought I might have to play Indian again in my old age. The Pole and the writer were enthusiastic about the cognac. The plumber did not drink strong liquor. He was a beer drinker and explained in detail how much better the beer had been in Berlin. Ravik lay on his plank and read the papers. The Pole did not read, he didn't understand French. He smoked and was happy. At night the plumber began to cry. Ravik was awake. He listened to the suppressed sobbing and stared at the small window behind which glimmered a pale sky. He could not sleep. Nor could he later on when the plumber was calm. Too well lived, he thought. Too many things already to hurt when one didn't have them anymore. 18. Ravik was on his way from the station. He was tired and dirty. Thirteen hours in a hot train with people who ate garlic, with hunters and their dogs, 
with women who held cages containing chickens and pigeons on their laps. And before that almost three months at the frontier. He walked along the Champs Elysee. There was a twinkling in the dusk. Ravik looked up. The twinkling seemed to come from pyramids of mirrors standing around the Ron Point and reflecting back and forth the last grey light of May. He stopped and looked more sharply. There actually were pyramids of mirrors. They were everywhere, behind the tulip beds in ghost-like repetition. What's that? He asked a gardener who was leveling a bed of newly turned dirt. Mirrors, the gardener answered, without looking up. I can see that. The last time I was here they weren't around. Haven't you been here for some time? Three months. Ah, three months. This was done in the last two weeks. For the King of England. Coming for a visit. So he can see his face mirrored here. Terrible, Ravik said. Of course, the gardener replied without surprise. Ravik walked on. Three months, three years three days, what was time? Nothing and everything. The fact that the chestnut trees were in bloom now, and before they hadn't yet had any leaves, that Germany had broken her treaties again and occupied the whole of Czechoslovakia, that in Geneva, the refugee Joseph Blumenthal had shot himself in a fit of hysterical laughter in front of the Palace of the League of Nations that somewhere in his own chest there was the aching remnant of the pneumonia he had survived in Belfort under the name of Genther, and that now, on an evening soft as a woman's breast, he was back again, all this held almost no surprise for him. One took it as one took many things, with fatalistic calm, which was the only weapon of helplessness. The sky was the same everywhere, always the same above murder and hatred and sacrifice and love, the trees blossomed anew, unsuspectingly, every year, the plum blue dusk changed and came and went, unconcerned with passports, betrayal, despair, and hope. It was good to be in Paris again. It was good to walk, to walk slowly, without thinking, along this street in the silver grey light, it was good to have this hour, still full of respite full of a mild interchange at the boundary where a distant grief and the tender recurrent happiness of simply being alive melted into each other like horizons, this first hour of arrival before one was again pierced by knives and arrows, this strange animal feeling, this breath reaching far and coming from afar, this breeze, without emotion yet, along the streets of the heart, past the dull fires of facts past the nail-studded cross of bygone days and past the barbed hooks of the future, this sashura, the silence within oscillation, the moment of pause, most open and most secret form of being, the unemphatic beat of eternity in the very transitoriness of the world. Morosau sat in the palm room of the International. He was drinking a bottle of uva. Hello, Boris old fellow, Ravik said. I seem to have returned at the right moment. Is that Vuva? Still the same. Thirty-four this time. Slightly sweeter and stronger. Good that you're back again. It was three months. Wasn't it? Yes. Longer than usual. Morosa rang an old-fashioned table bell. It pealed like a sacristan's bell in a village church. The catacombs had only electric lights, no electric bells. It didn't pay. The refugees rarely dared to ring. What's your name now? Morosau asked. Still Ravik. I didn't mention this name at the police station. I called myself Wazek, Newman, and Genther. A caprice. I didn't want to give up Ravik. I like it as a name. They didn't find out that you were living here, did they? Of course not. Obviously. Otherwise there would have been a raid. So you can stay here again. Your room is vacant. Does the old lady know what happened? No. Nobody. I told them you went to Rouen. Your things are at my place. The girl came in with a tray. Clarice, bring a glass for Mr. Avic, Morosau said. Ah, Mr. Avic. The girl showed her yellow teeth. Back again? You stayed away more than six months, monsieur. Three months, 
Clarice. Impossible. I thought it was six months. The girl shuffled off. Immediately afterwards the slovenly waiter of the catacombs came with a wine glass in his hand. He had no tray, he had been in this place for a long time and could afford to be informal. His face indicated what would follow and Morosau anticipated it. All right, Jean. Tell me how long Mr. Avic has been away. Do you know exactly? But Mr. Morosau? Naturally I know to the very day. It's exactly. He paused for effect, smiled, and said, exactly four and a half weeks. Correct, Ravik said before Morosau could answer. Correct, Morosau replied too. Naturally, I'm never mistaken. Jean disappeared. I didn't want to disappoint him, Boris. Neither did I. I only wanted to demonstrate to you the feebleness of time once it becomes the past. That's comforting frightening, or a matter of indifference. I lost sight of 1st Lieutenant Bolsky of the Neobrashensk Guard Regiment in 1917 in Moscow. We were friends. He went north across Finland. I made my way across Manchuria and Japan. When we met again here eight years later, I thought I had seen him last in 1919 in Harbin, he thought it had been in 1921 in Helsinki. A difference of two years and a few thousand miles. Morosa took the bottle and filled the glasses. You see, at least they recognized you again. That in itself gives one some feeling of being home, doesn't it? Ravik drank. The wine was cool and light. In the meantime I've been close to the border, he said. Very close, below Basel. One side of the road belonged to Switzerland, the other was German. I stood on the Swiss side and ate cherries. I could spit the pits into Germany. Did that give you a feeling of being at home? No. I never felt farther away. Morosau grinned. I can understand that. How was it on the way? As usual. It's getting more difficult, that's all. They watch the frontiers more closely. Once they caught me in Switzerland, once in France. Why did you never drop us a line? I didn't know how far the police might go here. Sometimes they have fits of energy. It's better not to jeopardize anyone. After all, our alibis aren't really so very good. Old frontline rule, lie still and disappear. Did you expect anything else? Not I. Ravik looked at him. Letters, he said then. What are letters? Letters never help. No. Ravik took a package of cigarettes out of his pocket. Strange, how everything turns out when one is away. Don't fool yourself, Morosau replied. I'm not. When one stays away it's good. When one returns, it's different. Then it starts again. Perhaps. Perhaps not. You're pretty cryptic. It's a good thing you take it that way. Do you want to play a game of chess? The professor died. He was my only worthy opponent. Levy went to Brazil. Job as a waiter. Life moves damn fast nowadays. One shouldn't get used to anything. One shouldn't. Morosau looked at Ravik attentively. I didn't mean it that way. Neither did I. But couldn't we leave this musty palm grave? I haven't been here for three months. Nevertheless, it stinks just as it always did, of the kitchen, dust, and fear. When do you have to go? Not at all today. It's my day off. Right. Ravik smiled briefly. The evening of elegance, of old Russia, and of the large glasses. Do you want to come with me? No. Not tonight. I'm tired. I've hardly slept at all the last few nights. Not very quietly anyhow. Let's wander around for an hour and sit somewhere. I haven't done that in a long time. Vuva? Morosau asked. They were sitting in front of the Café Kalaisi. It's early evening, old fellow. The hour for vodka. Yes. Nevertheless, Vuva. I'm getting worried. At least to fine? Ravik shook his head. 
When one arrives somewhere one should drink oneself stiff the first night, brother, Morosau declared. It's unnecessary heroism to stare soberly into the dreary faces of the shadows of the past. I'm not staring, Boris. I am enjoying life cautiously. Ravik saw that Morosau didn't believe him. He made no attempt to convince him. He sat calmly at the table, in the first row on the street, drank his wine and watched the strolling evening crowds. As long as he had been away from Paris, everything had been sharp and clear. Now it was misty, pale, and colorful, pleasantly flowing, but as things appear to someone who has descended a mountain too quickly and who can only hear the noise down in the valley as if through cotton wool. Did you go anywhere else before you came to the hotel? Morosau asked. No. Weber asked for you several times. I'll call him up. I don't like the way you behave. Tell me what's wrong. Nothing in particular. The border at Geneva was too well guarded. I tried it the first. Then at Basel. Difficult the two. Finally I got across. Caught a cold. Rain and snow at night in the open fields. Couldn't do much about it. It turned into pneumonia. A doctor in Belford got me into a hospital. He smuggled me in and out. Kept me in his house ten days after that. I've got to send the money back to him. Are you all right again? Pretty much. That's why you aren't drinking any hard liquor? Ravik smiled. Why are we talking around the point? I'm a little tired and want to get used to things again. That's really so. Strange, how much you think when you're on the road. And how little when you arrive. Morosa waved this aside. Ravik, he said in a fatherly tone, you are talking to your father Boris, a connoisseur of the human heart. Don't make detours and ask me quickly so that we can get it behind us. All right. Where is Joan? I don't know. I haven't heard anything about her for several weeks now. Haven't seen her either. And before that? Before that she inquired about you for some time. Then not any more. She is no longer at the Scheherazade. No. She left about six weeks ago. She came the two or three times later. But not after that. Isn't she in Paris now? I don't think so. At least it would seem not. Otherwise she would have come again to the Scheherazade from time to time. Do you know what she's doing? Something in the movies, I think. At least that's what she told the hat check girl. You know how it is. One of those damned pretenses. Pretenses? Yes, pretenses, Morosa said angrily. What else, Ravik? Did you expect anything else? Yes. Morosau remained silent. To expect and to know are two different things, Ravik said. Only for goddamned romantics. Now drink something sensible, not this lemonade. Some decent Calvados. Certainly not Calvados. Cognac, if it will make you feel any better. Or even Calvados, for all I care. At last, Morosau said. The window? The blue silhouette of the roofs? The faded red sofa? The bed? Ravik knew that he had to bear it. He sat on the sofa and smoked. Morosau had brought him his belongings and told him where he could find him if he wanted to. He had thrown away his old suit. He had taken a bath, hot and cold, a long bath with much soap. He had washed away the three months and rubbed it from his skin. He had put on clean underwear and another suit, he had shaved, most of all he would have liked to go to a Turkish bath if it had not been too late. He had done all this and felt fine doing it. He would have liked to do even more, because suddenly now while sitting by the window, the emptiness began crawling out of the corners. He filled a glass with Calvados. Among his belongings had been an opened bottle with a little left in it. He recalled the night when he had been drinking it with Joan, but it evoked little feeling. It had been too long ago. He merely noticed that it was very good old Calvados. The moon rose slowly above the roofs. 
the dirty yard opposite became a palace of shadows and silver. Everything could be turned from dirt into silver, with a little imagination. The fragrance of flowers came through the window. The sharp smell of carnations at night. Ravik leaned over the sill and looked down. A wooden box with flowers stood below him on the sill. They belonged to the refugee Wiesenhof if he was still living there. Ravik had pumped out his stomach once. It had been at Christmas, a year ago. The bottle was empty. He threw it onto the bed. Then it lay like a black embryo. He rose. Why was he staring at the bed? When one had no woman, one had to get one. That was easy in Paris. He went through the narrow streets to the Eto Isle. The warm life of the city at night vibrated from the Champs Elysees. He walked back, faster, then gradually more slowly till he arrived at the Hotel de Milan. How is everything? He asked the porter. Ah, monsieur. The porter got up. Monsieur hasn't been here for a long time. Yes, not for quite a while. I wasn't in Paris. The porter took stock of him with his small lively eyes. Madame isn't here any longer. I know. Not for quite some time. The porter was a good porter. He knew what was wanted of him without being asked. Four weeks now, he said. Four weeks ago she moved out. Ravik took a cigarette out of his package. Is Madame no longer in Paris? The porter asked. She is in Cannes. Cannes. The porter rubbed his large hand across his face. You won't believe it, sir, that I was a porter at the Hotel Rull in Nice eighteen years ago, would you? I do. Those days. Those tips. That wonderful time after the war. Nowadays. Ravik was a good guest. He understood hotel employees without need of too broad a hint. He drew a five franc bill out of his pocket and put it on the table. Thank you, sir. Have a good time. You look younger, sir. I feel it, too. Good night. Ravik stood on the street. Why had he gone to that hotel? All that was lacking now was to go to the Scheherazade and get drunk. He gazed at the star-filled sky. He should be glad it had turned out this way. He had been saved a lot of unnecessary recrimination. He had known it and Joan had known it, too. In the long run, at least. She had done what was the only right thing to do. No explanations. Explanations were second-rate. Where feelings were concerned, there were no explanations. Only actions. Thank God the wagon grease of morals had no part in it. Thank God that Joan knew nothing about that. She had acted, and it was done with. No tugging back and forth. He had acted, too. Why was he loitering here now? It must be the air. This soft fabric woven out of May and evening in Paris. And the night, of course. At night one was always different than by day. He went back to the hotel. May I use your telephone? Certainly, sir. But we have no booth. Only this instrument. That's good enough. Ravik looked at his watch. Weber might be at the hospital. It was the time for the last nightly round. Is Dr. Weber in? He asked the nurse. He did not recognize her voice. It must be a new one. You can't talk to Dr. Weber now. Is he in? He's in. But you can't talk to him now. Listen, Ravik said. Go and tell him that Travik is on the phone. Go immediately. It's important. I'll wait. All right, the nurse said hesitatingly. I'll ask him, but he won't come. We'll see about that. Ask him. Ravik. A moment later Weber was at the telephone. Ravik. Where are you? In Paris. Arrived today. Do you still have to operate? Yes. In twenty minutes. An urgent appendectomy. Could we meet afterwards? I can come over. Wonderful. When? At once. All right. Then I'll wait for you. Here is some good liquor, Weber said. Here are newspapers and medical journals. 
make yourself comfortable. A drink, and a gown and gloves. Weber looked at Travik. Simple case of appendicitis. Below your dignity. I can get through with it quickly with Morel's help. Called him already. I'm sure you're tired. Weber, do me a favor and let me perform the operation. I'm not tired and I'm all right. Weber laughed. You're certainly in a hurry to get back to work. All right, just as you like. I'll call off Morel then. In fact, I understand. Ravik washed and put on the gown and gloves. The operating room. He inhaled the smell of the ether deeply. Eugene he stood by the head of the table, administering the anesthetic. A second, very beautiful young nurse was putting the instruments in order. Good evening, Eugene e, Ravik said. She almost let the dropper fall. Good evening, Dr. Ravik, she replied. Weber smiled. It was the first time she had addressed Travik this way. Ravik bent over the patient. The strong operating lights blazed white and intense. They shut the world out. They shut off thought. They were objective and cold and merciless and good. Ravik took the knife which the beautiful nurse handed him. The steel felt cool through the thin gloves. It was good to feel it. It was good to get away from wavering uncertainty to clear preciseness. He made the incision. Narrow and red, the line of blood followed the knife. Suddenly everything was simple. For the first time since he had been back he felt himself again. The soundless humming of the light. At home, he thought. At last. 19. S.H.E. is here, Morosau said. Who? Morosau smoothed his uniform. Don't act as if you didn't know whom I mean. You mustn't annoy your father Boris in a public thoroughfare. Do you think I can't guess why you have been at the Scheherazade three times in two weeks? Once accompanied by a miracle of blue eyes and black hair, but twice alone? Man is weak, otherwise where would his charm be? Go to hell, Ravik said. Don't humiliate me, just when I need all my strength, you gossipy doorkeeper. Would you rather I hadn't told you? Of course. Morosau stepped aside and let two Americans in. Then go away and come back again some other evening, he said. Is she here alone? We don't even admit training princesses unattended. You ought to know that. Sigmund Freud would have liked your question. What do you know about Sigmund Freud? You are tight and I'll complain about you to your manager, Captain Shentz. Captain Shentz was lieutenant in the same regiment in which I was a lieutenant colonel, my boy. He still remembers that. Just dry. All right. Let me buy. Ravik. Morosa put his heavy hands on his shoulders. Don't be a fool. Go, telephone the miracle with the blue eyes and come back with her, if you feel you must. That's the simple advice of an experienced old man. Extremely cheap but none the less effective. No, Boris. Ravik looked at him. Tricks have no place here. I'll have none of them. Then go home, Morosau said. To the musty palm room? Or to my hole? Morosau left Ravik and strode ahead of a couple that wanted a taxi. Ravik waited until he returned. You're more sensible than I thought, Morosau said. Otherwise you'd be inside already. He pushed back his cap with the gold braid. Before he could go on, an intoxicated young man in a white tuxedo appeared in the door. Colonel. A racing car. Morosau called the next taxi in the row and helped the wavering man in. You don't laugh, the drunk said. But Colonel was a good joke, or wasn't it? Very good. Racing car was perhaps even better. I've thought it over. Morosau said when he came back. Go in. I'd do it, too. It will have to happen some time anyway, why not now? Finish it one way or another. When we're no longer childish we are getting old. I've thought it over, too. I'm going somewhere else. Morosau looked at Ravik in amusement. All right, he said finally. Then I'll see you again in half an hour. Maybe not. 
Then in an hour. Two hours later Avic was sitting in the cloche door. The place was still rather empty. Hawes sat at the long bar, like parrots on a perch, chattering. Near them several peddlers of fake cocaine stood around waiting for tourists. In the room upstairs, a few couples sat and ate onion soup. In a corner, on a sofa, two lesbians whispered together drinking sherry brandy. One of them in a tailored suit with a tie was wearing a monocle and the other was a red-haired boxer person, in a very low-cut sparkling evening gown. How idiotic, Ravik thought. Why didn't I go to the Shaherazada? What am I afraid of? And why do I run away? It has grown, I know. These three months have not destroyed it, they have made it stronger. There's no point in going on deluding myself. It was almost the only thing that stayed with me in all that creeping across frontiers, waiting in hidden rooms, in all that dripping loneliness of alien starless nights. Absence has strengthened it more than she herself could ever have, and now. A stifled scream woke him out of his brooding. A few women had come in meanwhile. One of them who looked like a very light negress, rather drunk, a flowered hat pushed to the back of her head, threw away a table knife and walked slowly down the stairs, shouting threats in the direction of the corner where the lesbians were. No one stopped her. A waiter came upstairs. Another woman stood there and blocked his way. Nothing has happened, she said. Nothing has happened. The waiter shrugged his shoulders and turned back. Ravik saw the red-haired woman in the corner getting up. At the same time, the woman who had kept the waiter off went quickly downstairs to the bar. The red-haired stood still, her hand at her full bosom. She carefully opened two fingers of her hand and looked down. Her gown was slashed a few inches and underneath one saw the open wound. One did not see any skin, only the open wound in the green iridescent evening gown. The red-haired woman stared at it as though she could not believe it. Ravik made an involuntary movement. Then he let himself sink back. One deportation was enough. He saw the woman in the tailored suit pulling the red-head back onto the sofa. At the same moment the second woman came back upstairs from the bar with a glass of brandy. The woman in the tailored suit knelt on the banquet, with one hand she kept the redhead's mouth closed as she quickly pulled her hand away from the wound. The other woman poured the brandy into it. A primitive form of disinfectant, Ravik thought. The redhead moaned, moved convulsively, but the other one held her in a grip of steel. Two other women hid the table from the remaining guests. The whole thing was done extremely fast and skillfully. Hardly anyone saw the occurrence. A minute later a number of lesbians and homosexuals crowded into the place as if summoned by magic. They surrounded the table in the corner, two lifted the redhead, held her up, the others, laughing and chattering, shielded the group, and they all left the place as if nothing had happened. Most of the guests were hardly aware of the disturbance. Good. Wasn't it? Someone asked Travik from behind. It was the waiter. Ravik nodded. What was it about? Jealousy. These perverts are an excitable lot. Where did all the others come from so quickly? That seemed sheer telepathy. They smell it, sir, the waiter said. Very likely one of them telephoned but it went fast. They smell it. And they stick to each other like death and the devil. They don't give each other away. No police, that's all they want. They settle it among themselves. The waiter picked up Ravik's glass from the table. Another? What was it? Calvados. All right. Another Calvados. He shuffled away. Ravik looked up and saw Joan sitting a few tables from him. She had come in while he was talking with the waiter. He hadn't seen her enter. She was sitting with two men. At the same moment she noticed him. She turned pale under her tan. She sat still a few seconds, without taking her eyes from him. Then, with a brusque movement, she pushed her table aside, got up, and came toward him. As she walked her face changed. It relaxed and became soft, only her eyes remained steady and transparent as crystals. 
to Ravik they appeared brighter than ever. They were of an almost furious intensity. You are back, she said breathlessly in a low voice. She stood close to him. For a moment she made a move as if she were about to put her arms around him. But she did not do it. Nor did she shake hands with him. You are back, she repeated. Ravik did not answer. How long have you been back? she asked in the same low tone as before. For two weeks. For two, and I didn't, you didn't even. No one knew where you were. Neither at your hotel nor the Scheherazade. The Scheherazade, but I was, she interrupted herself. Why did you never write? I could not. You are lying. All right. I didn't want to. I didn't know whether I would come back again. You are lying again. That's no reason. It is. I could come back or not come back. Don't you understand? No. But I do understand that you have been here for two weeks and you haven't done the least thing to. Joan, Ravik said calmly. You didn't get those brown shoulders in Paris. The waiter passed by, sniffing. He cast a look at Joan and Ravik. He was still full of the scene that had occurred earlier. As if by chance he removed the two knives and forks together with a plate from the red and white check tablecloth. Ravik noticed it. Everything is all right, he said. What is all right? Joan asked. Nothing. Something happened here a while ago. She stared at him. Are you waiting here for a woman? My God, no. Some people had a scene. One of them was bleeding. This time I did not interfere. Interfere? Suddenly she understood. Her expression changed. What are you doing here? They will arrest you again. Now I know all about it. Half a year's imprisonment next time. You must go away. I didn't know you were in Paris. I thought you would never come back again. Ravik did not answer. I thought you would never come back again, she repeated. Ravik looked at her. Joan. No. Not a thing is true. Nothing is true. Nothing. Joan, Ravik said warily. Go back to your table. Suddenly her eyes were moist. Go back to your table, he said. It's your fault. She burst out. Yours. Yours alone. Abruptly she turned around and went back. Ravik pushed his table to one side and sat down. He looked at the glass of Galvados and made a move as if to drink it. He didn't. He had been calm while speaking to Joan. Now, suddenly, he felt the excitement. Strange, he thought. The chest muscles vibrate under the skin. Why just those? He lifted the glass and observed his hand. It was steady. He emptied half the glass. While he was drinking he could feel Joan's look. He did not glance her way again. The waiter passed by. Cigarettes, Ravik said. Caporals. He lighted a cigarette and drained the remaining half of his glass. He could feel Joan's look again. What does she expect? He thought. That I will get drunk from misery right here in front of her? He called the waiter and paid. The moment he got up Joan began talking vivaciously to one of her companions. She did not look up as he passed her table. Her face was hard and entirely expressionless and her smile was forced. Ravik wandered through the streets and found himself unexpectedly in front of the Scheherazade again. Morosau's face lit up. Well done, soldier. I almost gave you up for lost. One is always pleased when a prophecy comes true. Don't be pleased too soon. Don't you be either. You've come too late. I know that. I have already run into her. What? In the cloche door. What the, Morosau said, taken aback. Mother life has always new tricks up her sleeve. When will you be through here, Boris? In a few minutes. Everyone has gone. I have to change. Come in meanwhile. Have a drink of vodka on the house. No. I'll wait here. Morosau looked at him. How are you feeling? I feel like vomiting. 
Did you expect anything else? Yes. One always expects something else. Go and change. Ravik leaned against the wall. Beside him the old flower woman packed up her roses. She did not offer him many. It was a foolish thought, but he would have liked her to ask him. Now it was as if she did not think he would need any. He looked along the rows of houses. A few windows were still lit up. Taxis passed slowly. What did he expect? He didn't exactly know. What he had not expected was that Joan would take the initiative. But why not? How much in the right anyone was already the minute he attacked? The waiters left. During the night they had been Caucasians and Circassians in red coats and high boots. Now they were tired civilians. They slunk home in everyday clothes which looked strange on them. The last was Morosau. Where to? He asked. I've been everywhere today. Then let's go to the hotel and play chess. What? Chess. A game with wooden figures which simultaneously diverts you and makes you concentrate. Good, Ravik said. Why not? He woke up and knew at once that Joan was in the room. It was still dark and he could not see her, but he knew she was there. The room was different, the window was different, the air was different, and even he was different. Stop this nonsense. He said. Turn on the light and come here. She did not move. He did not even hear her breathe. Joan, he said. We are not going to play hide and seek. I'm not playing hide and seek. Then come here. Did you know that I would come? No. Your door was open. My door is almost always open. She remained silent for a moment. I thought you wouldn't be here yet, she said then. I only wanted, I thought you would be sitting somewhere and drinking. I thought so, too. I was playing chess instead. What? Chess. With Morosau? Downstairs in the hold that looks like a dry aquarium. Chess. She came out of her corner. Chess. But that's. Someone who can play chess when. I wouldn't have thought it myself. But it worked. In fact it worked well. I was able to win a game. You're the coldest, most unfeeling. Joan, Ravik said. No scenes. I'm in favor of good scenes. But not today. I'm not making a scene. I am terribly unhappy. All right. Then we'd better skip all that. Scenes are justifiable when one is moderately unhappy. I knew a man who locked himself in his room and solved chess problems from the minute his wife died until she was buried. People thought him unfeeling, but I know that he loved his wife more than anything in the world. He simply couldn't act otherwise. Day and night he solved chess problems so he wouldn't think about it. Joan was now standing in the middle of the room. Is that why you did it? No. I told you that was another man. I was sleeping when you came. Yes, you were asleep. You can sleep. Ravik propped himself up. I knew another man, Joan, who had lost his wife, too. He went to bed and slept for two days. His wife's mother was beside herself because he did that. She didn't know that one can do many incongruous things and be disconsolate at the same time. It is strange what etiquette has been built up just for unhappiness. If you had found me blind drunk, everything would have been in good taste. The fact that I played chess and went to sleep is proof that I am crude and unfeeling. Simple, isn't it? A sound of crashing and shattering. Joan had seized a vase and thrown it to the floor. Fine, Ravik said. I couldn't stand that thing anyway. Just be careful you don't get splinters in your feet. She kicked the pieces aside. Ravik, she said. Why are you doing this? Yes, he replied. Why? To give myself courage, Joan. Don't you see that? She turned her face toward him quickly. It looks that way. But with you one never knows what's going on. She carefully stepped over the scattered pieces and sat down on his bed. He could see her face distinctly now in the early dawn. 
he was surprised that it was not tired. It was young and clear and intense. She wore a light coat which he had not seen before and a different dress from the one she had worn in the cloche door. I thought you'd never come back again, Ravik, she said. It took a long time. I couldn't have come any sooner. Why didn't you write to me? Would it have helped? She looked aside. It would have been better. It would have been better if I hadn't come back. But there is no longer any other country or any other city for me. Switzerland is too small, everywhere else are the fascists. But here, won't the police? The police have just as little chance of catching me as before. That was an unfortunate accident. We don't need to think about it anymore. Ravik reached for a pack of cigarettes. They lay on the table beside his bed. It was a comfortable table of medium size with books, cigarettes, and a few other things on it. Ravik hated the night tables and consoles with imitation marble tops that usually stand beside beds. Let me have a cigarette, too, Joan said. Do you want something to drink? he asked. Yes. Lie there. I'll get it. She fetched the bottle and filled two glasses. She gave him one, took the other, and emptied it. While she was drinking, her coat slipped from her shoulders. Now in the brightening dawn Ravik recognized the dress she wore. It was the one he had given her as a present for Antibes. Why had she put it on? It was the only dress he had ever given her. He had never thought about things like that. He had never wanted to think about things like that either. When I saw you, Ravik, suddenly, she said, I couldn't think at all. Not at all. And when you left, I thought I'd never see you again. I didn't think so immediately. First I waited for you to come back to the cloche door. I thought you must come back. Why didn't you? Why should I have come back? I'd have gone with you. Ravik knew that was not true. But he did not want to think about it now. Suddenly he did not want to think about anything. The Joan sat at his side, that was enough for the moment. He had not thought it would be enough. He didn't know why she had come or what she really wanted, but suddenly, in a strange and deep and disquieting way, it was enough that she was there. What is it? He thought. Has it already gone that far? Beyond all control? To the point where darkness begins, the uproar of the blood, the compulsion of the imagination and the menace? I thought you wanted to leave me, Joan said. You did want to. Tell the truth. Ravik was silent. She looked at him. I knew it. I knew it. She repeated with deep conviction. Give me another glass of Calvados. Is it Calvados? Yes. Didn't you notice? No. She poured it. She rested her arm against his chest while she held the bottle. He felt her touch go through his ribs. She took her glass and drank. Yes. It is Galvados. Then she looked at him again. It's good that I came. I knew it. It's good that I came. It was growing lighter outside. The shutters began a low creaking. The morning wind rose. Is it good that I've come? She asked. I don't know, Joan. She bent over him. You know. You must know. Her face was so close to his that her hair fell over his shoulders. He looked at it. It was a landscape that he knew and did not know. Very strange and very familiar, always the same and never the same. He saw that the skin on her forehead was peeling. He saw that the red of her lipstick was caked on her upper lip. He saw that she wasn't made up quite properly. He saw all that in the face which was now so close above his that in this moment it blotted out all the rest of the world for him, he saw it and he knew that it was only his fantasy which made it mysterious. He knew that there were more beautiful faces, better faces, purer faces, but he knew too that this face, like no other, had power over him. And he himself had given it this power. Yes, he said. It is good. One way or another. I couldn't have endured it, Ravik. What? For you to have stayed away. For good. Didn't you say you thought I would never come back? 
that's not the same. It would have been different if you had been living in another country. We would only have been separated. I could have come to you, sometime. Or I'd always have been able to believe that. But here, in the same city, don't you understand? I do. She straightened up and smoothed her hair. You can't leave me alone. You are responsible for me. Are you alone? You are responsible for me, she said and smiled. He hated her for a second, for her smile and for the way she said it. Don't talk nonsense, Joan. I'm not. You are. From that time on. Without you. All right. I am responsible for the occupation of Czechoslovakia too. And now stop it. It's getting light. Soon you must go. What? She stared at him. You don't want me to stay here? No. So, she said in a low voice, suddenly very angry. You don't love me anymore. Good heavens. Ravik said. That too. What idiots have you been with the last few months? They weren't idiots. What else could I have done? Sit in the Hotel de Milan and stare at the walls and go mad? Ravik half straightened up. No confessions. He said. I do not want any confessions. I merely wanted to raise the level of our conversation a bit. She looked at him. Her mouth and her eyes were flat. Why do you always criticize me? Other people don't criticize me. With you every little thing immediately becomes a problem. All right. Ravik took a big gulp hastily and let himself sink back. It is true. She said. One never knows what to make of you. You force me to say things I never intended to say. And then you attack me. Ravik breathed deeply. What was it that he had just before been thinking about? Darkness of love, power of imagination, how fast that could be changed. They did it themselves, incessantly, themselves. They were the most avid destroyers of dreams. But was it their fault? Was it really their fault? Beautiful forlorn driven creatures, a huge magnet somewhere deep in the earth and above it the multitudinous figures who thought they had their own wills and their own fates, was it their fault? Wasn't he himself one of them? Did he not cling suspiciously to a bit of tiresome caution and cheap sarcasm, at bottom already knowing what would inevitably happen? Joan was huddled at the foot of the bed. She looked like a beautiful angry scrubwoman and at the same time like something that had flown down from the moon and did not know where it was. The dawn had turned into the first red of morning and shone on them. The early day blew its pure breath from afar, across all the dirty backyards and the smoky roofs, into the window, and there was still the breath of woods and plains in it. Joan, Ravik said. Why have you come? Why do you ask? Yes, why do I ask? Why do you always ask? I am here. Isn't that enough? Yes, Joan. You are right. It is enough. She raised her head. At last. But first you have to take away all the joy. Joy, Ravik thought. She calls that joy. To be driven by multiple dark propellers, in a gust of breathless desire for repossession, joy. Outside there is a moment of joy, the dew at the window, the ten minutes of silence before the day stretches out its claws. But what the devil was all this about? Wasn't she right? Wasn't she right as the dew and the sparrows and the wind and the blood were right? Why did he ask? What did he want to know? She was here, she had flown here, unthinkingly, a night butterfly, a privet hawk moth, a peacock butterfly, quickly, and now he was lying, counting the eyes and small cuts in its wings and staring at the slightly faded blending of its colors. Why all this pretense? And why this hide and seek? She has come and I am thus stupidly superior only because she has come, he thought. If she had not come I should be lying here and brooding and heroically trying to deceive myself and wishing secretly that she would come. He flung the blankets aside, swung his feet over the edge of the bed, and stepped into his slippers. What are you going to do? Joan asked, surprised. 
Are you going to throw me out? No. I'm going to kiss you. I should have done it long before. I'm an idiot, Joan. I have been talking nonsense. It's wonderful that you have come. A radiance lit up her eyes. You needn't get up to kiss me, she said. The red of morning stood high behind the houses. The sky above was a faint blue. A few clouds floated there like sleeping flamingos. Look at that, Joan. What a day. Do you remember how it used to rain? Yes. It was always raining, darling. It was grey and it rained. It was still raining when I left. You were desperate about all that rain. And now? Yes, she said. And now? She was lying close beside him. Now we have everything, he said. Everything. Even a garden. The carnations on the window sill of the refugee Wiesenhof. And the birds down there in the chestnut tree. He saw that she was crying. Why don't you ask me, Ravik? She said. I've asked too much already. Didn't you say so yourself? That's different. There isn't anything to ask. About what happened in between? Nothing happened. She shook her head. My God, what do you think I am, Joan? He said. Look at that outside. The red and gold and blue. Ask it whether it rained yesterday. Whether there was a war in China or Spain. Whether a thousand men are dying or a thousand men are being born at this moment. It exists, it raises, that's all there is to it. And you want me to ask you. Your shoulders are bronze in this light, and I am to question you? Your eyes in this red glow are like the sea of the Greeks, violet and wine colored, and I am to inquire about something that is done with? You've come back and I am to be a fool and rummage about among the withered leaves of the past? What do you take me for, Joan? Her tears had ceased. I haven't heard that for a long time, she said. Then you have been among blockheads. Women should be adored or abandoned. Nothing in between. She slept clinging to him as if she didn't ever want to let him go. She slept deeply and he felt her regular light breath on his chest. He lay awake for a while. The noises of the morning began in the hotel. Water gurgled, doors were slammed, and below old Aaron Goldberg went through his morning routine of coughing at the open window. He felt Joan's shoulders on his arm, he felt her warm slumbering skin, and turning his head he could see her completely relaxed face given up to sleep, a face that was as pure as innocence itself. Adore or abandon, he thought big words. Who could do that? But who really wanted to? Twenty. He awoke. Joan was no longer lying beside him. He heard the water in the bathroom running and sat up. He was immediately fully awake. This was something he had learned again in the last few months. Whoever wakes instantly may sometimes still escape. He looked at his watch. It was ten o'clock in the morning. Joan's evening gown was lying on the floor together with her coat. Her brocade shoes stood by the window. One of them had fallen on its side. Joan, he called. What are you doing taking a shower in the middle of the night? She opened the door. I didn't want to wake you up. That makes no difference. I can always sleep. But why are you up at this hour? She had put on a bathing cap and was dripping with water. Her gleaming shoulders were a light brown. She looked like an Amazon with a close-fitting helmet. I'm not a night owl anymore, Ravik. I'm no longer at the Scheherazade. I know that. From whom? Morosau? She looked at him searchingly for a second. Morosau, she said. That old babbler. What else did he tell you? Nothing. Is there anything more to tell? Nothing that a night doorman could tell. They are like hat check girls. Professional gossipers. Leave Morosau alone. Night doormen and doctors are professional pessimists. They get their living from the shadow side of life. But they don't gossip. They are obliged to be discreet. The shadow side of life, Joan said. Who wants that? No one. 
but most people live in it. Besides Morosau helped you get your job at the Shahrazada. I can't be eternally and tearfully grateful to him for that. I was no disappointment. I was worth my money, otherwise they wouldn't have kept me. Besides he did it for you. Not for me. Ravik reached for a cigarette. What have you really got against him? Nothing. I don't like him. He has a way of looking at you. I wouldn't trust him. You shouldn't either. What? You shouldn't trust him. You know, all doormen in France are stool pigeons for the police. Anything else? Ravik asked calmly. Of course you don't believe me. Everyone in the Scheherazade knew it. Who knows whether. Joan. Ravik flung back the blanket and got up. Don't talk nonsense. What's wrong with you? Nothing. What should be wrong with me? I can't stand him, that's all. He has a bad influence. And you are constantly with him. I see, Ravik said. That's why. Suddenly she laughed. Yes, that's why. Ravik felt that this was not the only reason. There was something else besides. What do you want for breakfast? He asked. Are you angry? She asked in return. No. She came out of the bathroom and put her arms around his neck. He felt her wet skin through the thin fabric of his pajamas. He felt her body and he felt his blood. Are you angry because I am jealous of your friends? She asked. He shook his head. A helmet, an Amazon. An Iad, come up out of the ocean, the scent of water and youth still on her smooth skin. Let me go, he said. She did not answer. The line from the high cheekbones to the chin. The mouth. The two heavy eyelids. The breasts pressing against his bare skin under the open pajama jacket. Let me go or. Or what? She asked. A bee was buzzing outside the window. Ravik followed it with his eyes. Very likely it had been attracted by the carnations of the refugee Wiesenhof and now was looking for other flowers. It flew inside and alighted on an unwashed Galvado's glass which stood on the window sill. Did you miss me? Joan asked. Yes. Much? Yes. The bee flew up. It circled around the glass several times. Then it buzzed through the window back to the sun and the refugee Wiesenhof's carnations. Ravik was lying at Joan's side. Summer, he thought. Summer. Meadows in the morning, hair full of the scent of hay and skin like clover, the grateful blood silently flowing like a rivulet and desirelessly flooding the sandy places, a smooth surface in which a smiling face was reflected. For a bright moment nothing was dry and dead any longer. Birches and poplars, quiet and a soft murmur that came like an echo from far, lost heavens and beat in one's veins. I'd like to stay here. Joan said leaning against his shoulder. Stay here. Let us sleep. We haven't slept much. I can't. I must go. You can't go anywhere in your evening gown at this time. I brought another dress with me. Where? I had it under my coat. Shoes too. It must be among my things. I have everything with me. She did not say where she had to go. Nor why and Ravik did not ask. The bee reappeared. It was no longer buzzing around aimlessly. It flew straight toward the glass and sat on its rim. It seemed to know something about Calvados. Or about fruit sugar. Were you so sure you would stay here? Yes, Joan said without moving. Roland brought a tray with bottles and glasses. Nothing to drink, Ravik said. Don't you want some vodka? It is Sabrivka. Not today. You may give me some coffee. Strong coffee. All right. He put the microscope aside. Then he lit a cigarette and went to the window. The plane trees had put on their fresh full foliage. The last time he was here they had still been bare. Roland brought the coffee. You have more girls now than before, Ravik said. Twenty more. Is business so good? Now in June? Roland sat down with him. 
We don't understand either why business is so good. The people seem to have gone crazy. It starts even in the afternoon. But then in the evening. Maybe it's the weather. It isn't the weather. I know how it is in May and June. But this is some kind of madness. You wouldn't believe how well the bar is doing. Can you imagine Frenchmen ordering champagne? No. Foreigners, certainly. We carry it for them. But Frenchmen. Even Parisians. Champagne. And they pay for it too. Instead of Dubonnet or Pernod or beer or a fine. Can you believe it? Only when I see it. Roland poured the coffee for him. And the activity. She said. It deafens you. You'll see for yourself when you come down. Even at this time of day. No longer just the cautious experts waiting for your visits. A whole crowd are sitting there already. What has got into these people, Ravik? Ravik shrugged his shoulders. There is a story of an ocean liner sinking. But nothing is sinking with us. Business is wonderful. The door was opened. Ninette. 21 years old, slim as a boy in her short pink silk panties, entered. She had the face of a saint and was one of the best whores in the place. At the moment she carried a tray with bread, butter, and two pots of jam. Madame learned that the doctor was drinking coffee, she declared in a horse face. She sends you some jam to taste. Homemade. Suddenly Ninette grinned. The angelic countenance broke into a gamin's grimace. She shoved the tray onto the table and skipped out of the room. The UC, Roland sighed. They get fresh the minutes they know we need them. Quite right, Ravik said. When else should they be fresh? What does this jam mean? Madam's pride. She made it herself. On her estate on the Riviera. It is really good. Will you try it? I hate jam. Particularly when made by millionaires. Roland unscrewed the glass top, took out several spoonfuls of jam, smeared them on a sheet of thick paper, put a piece of butter and a few pieces of toast with it, wrapped it all up tightly and handed it to Ravik. Throw it away afterwards, she said. Do it as a favor to her. She checks on whether you have eaten or not. The last pride of an aging and disillusioned woman. Do it out of politeness. All right. Ravik got up and opened the door. He heard voices from downstairs, music, laughter, and shouting. Quite a pandemonium, he said. Are those all Frenchmen? Not those? They are mostly foreigners. Americans? No, that's the strange thing. They are mostly Germans. We have never had so many Germans here before. That's not strange. Most of them speak French very well. Not at all the way the Germans used to speak a few years ago. I thought so. Aren't there a good many Poilus here too? Recruits and colonial soldiers? They are always around. Ravik nodded. And the Germans spend a lot of money, don't they? Roland laughed. They do. They treat everyone who wants to drink with them especially soldiers, I imagine. And Germany has a currency embargo and has closed the frontiers. One can get out only by permission of the authorities. And one can't take more than ten marks with him. Odd, these merry Germans with plenty of money and speaking French so well, eh? Roland shrugged her shoulders. For all I care, as long as their money is good. It was after eight when he got home. Has anyone called me up? He asked the porter. No. Nor in the afternoon? No. Not the whole day. Has anyone been here inquiring for me? The porter shook his head. Nobody. Ravik went upstairs. On the first floor he heard the Goldberg couple quarreling. On the second floor a child was crying. It was the French citizen Lucien Silberman one year and two months old. He was an object of veneration and high hope to his parents, the coffee dealer Siegfried Silberman and his wife Nellie, née Levi, from Frankfurt on the Main. 
He was born in France and they hoped to get French passports two years earlier because of him. As a result Lucien had developed into a family tyrant with the intelligence of the one-year-old. A phonograph was playing on the third floor. It belonged to the refugee Walmir, formerly of the Oranienburg concentration camp, who played German folk songs on it. The corridor smelled of cabbage and dusk. Ravik went into his room to read. He had once bought several volumes of world history and now he took them out. It was not particularly cheerful to read them. The only thing one gained by it was a strangely depressing satisfaction that what was happening today was not new. Everything had happened before dozens of times. The lies, the breaches of faith, the murders, the St. Bartholomew massacres, the corruption through the lust for power, the unbroken chain of wars, the history of mankind was written in blood and tears, and among the thousands of blood-stained statues of the past, only a few wore the silver halo of kindness. The demagogues, the cheat, the parricides, the murderers, the egoists inebriated with power, the fanatic prophets who preached love with the sword, it was the same time and again, and time and again patient peoples allowed themselves to be driven against one another in a senseless slaughter for Kaisers, kings, religions, and madmen, there was no end to it. He put the books aside again. Voices came through the open window from below. He recognized them, they were Wiesenhoff's and Mrs. Goldberg's. Not now, Ruth Goldberg said. He'll be back soon. In an hour at the latest. An hour is an hour. He may possibly come sooner. Where did he go? To the American Embassy. He does it every night. Stands outside and looks at it. Nothing else. Then he comes back. Wiesenhoff said something that Ravik could not understand. Naturally, Ruth Goldberg replied in a quarrelsome tone. Who isn't crazy? That he is old I know too. Don't do that, she said after a while. I'm not interested. Not in the mood. Wiesenhoff made some reply. It's easy for you to talk, she said. He has the money. I haven't a centime. And you? Ravik got up. He looked at the telephone and hesitated. It was almost ten o'clock. He had not heard from Joan since she had left him that morning. He had not asked her if she would come in the evening. He had been sure she would. Now he wasn't sure any longer. For you it's simple. You only want to have your pleasure, nothing else, Mrs. Goldberg said. Ravik went to look for Morosau. His room was locked. He walked downstairs to the catacombs. In case anyone calls, I'll be downstairs, he said to the concierge. Morosa was there. He was playing chess with a red-headed man. A few women were still sitting in the corners. They were knitting or reading with sorrowful faces. Ravik watched the game for a while. The red-headed man was good at it. He played quickly and with complete indifference, and Morosa was losing. See what's happening to me, he said. Ravik shrugged his shoulders. The red-headed man looked up. This is Mr. Finkenstein, Morosa said. Just out of Germany. Ravik nodded. How is it the now? He asked without interest just in order to say something. The red-headed man moved his shoulders and did not say anything nor had Ravik expected him to. That had happened during the first years only. The hasty questions, the expectation, the feverish waiting for news of a collapse. Everyone knew by now that only war could bring it about. And everyone with any wit knew as well that a government which solves its unemployment problem by building an armament industry has only two possibilities, war or a domestic catastrophe. Therefore war. Check and mate. Finkenstein said without enthusiasm and got up. He looked at Travik. What can one do to get some sleep? I can't sleep here. I fall asleep and wake up again right away. Drink, Morosa said. Burgundy. Much burgundy or beer? I don't drink. I've walked through the streets for hours until I thought I was dead tired. It doesn't help. I can't sleep. I'll give you a few tablets, 
Ravik said. Come up with me. Come back, Ravik, Morosal called after him. Don't leave me here alone, brother. A few women glanced up. Then they continued to knit and to read as if their lives depended on it. Ravik went with Finkenstein to his room. When he opened the door the night air streamed through the window toward him like a dark cool wave. He breathed deeply and, turning on the light, he looked around the room quickly. No one was there. He gave Finkenstein several sleeping tablets. Thank you, Finkenstein said without moving a muscle of his face and left like a shadow. Suddenly Ravik knew that Joan would not come. He also knew that he had foreseen it that morning. He only had not wanted to believe it. He turned around as though someone had said something behind him. All of a sudden everything was quite clear and simple. She had gained what she wanted, and now she was taking her time. What else had he expected? That she would throw away everything because of him? That she would return as she had done before? What foolishness? Of course there was someone else, and not only someone else but also another life that she did not want to give up. He went downstairs. He felt rather miserable. Has anyone called? He asked. The night concierge, who had just arrived, shook his head. His mouth was full of garlic sausage. I expect a call. Meanwhile I'll be downstairs. He went back to Morosau. Dash. They played a game of chess. Morosau won and looked around contentedly. Meanwhile the women had silently disappeared. He rang the sacristan bell. Clarice. A carafe of rows. That Finkenstein plays like a sewing machine, he declared. It's nauseating. A mathematician. I hate perfection. It's not human. He looked at Travick. Why are you here on such an evening? I'm waiting for a call. Are you engaged again in killing someone in a scientific manner? I removed a man's stomach yesterday. Morosal filled their glasses. Here you are sitting and drinking, he said reproachfully, and over the your victim is lying in delirium. There's something inhuman in that too. At least you should have a stomach ache. Correct, Ravik replied. Therein lies the misery of the world, Boris. We never feel what we do to others. But why do you want to start your reform with the doctors? Politicians and generals would be better. Then we would have world peace. Morosau leaned back and studied Ravik. One should never know doctors personally, he declared. It takes away some of our confidence in them. I have been drunk with you, how could I have you operate on me? I might be sure that you were a better surgeon than someone else I didn't know, nevertheless I take the other. Confidence in the unknown, a deep-rooted human quality, old fellow. Doctors should live in hospitals and never be let out into the world of the uninitiated. Your predecessors, the witches and medicine men, knew that. When I'm operated on I wish to believe in superhuman power. I wouldn't operate on you either, Boris. Why not? No doctor likes to operate on his brother. I won't do you the favor anyhow. I'll die of apoplexy during my sleep. I work toward it cheerfully. Morosau stared at Ravik like a happy child. Then he got up. I've got to go. To open doors in that center of culture, Montmartre. Actually, what does man live for? To think about it. Any other question? Yes. Why does he die just when he has done that and has become a bit more sensible? Some people die without having become more sensible. Don't evade my question. And don't start talking about the transmigration of souls. I'll ask you something else first. Lions kill antelopes, spiders flies, foxes chickens, which is the only race in the world that wars on itself uninterruptedly, fighting and killing one another. Those are questions for children. The crown of creation, of course, the human being, who invented the words love, kindness, and mercy. Good. And who is the only being in nature that is capable of committing suicide and does it? Again the human being, who invented eternity, God, and resurrection. Excellent, 
Ravik said. You see of how many contradictions we consist. And you want to know why we die? Morosau looked up with surprise. Then he took a big gulp. You sophist, he declared. You dodger. Ravik looked at him. Joan, something thought inside him. If she would only come in now, through that dirty glass door over there. The mistake was, Boris, he said, that we began to think. If we had stuck to the bliss of rashness and feeding, all this would not have happened. Someone experiments with us, but he doesn't seem to have found the solution as yet. We won't complain. Experimental animals too should have professional pride. The slaughterers say so. Never the oxen. The scientists say so. Never the guinea pigs. The doctors say so. Never the white mice. Correct, if she would come in with her swaying stride which always gave her the appearance of walking against a gentle wind. Long live the law of sufficient reason. Come, Boris, let's drink a glass to beauty, the gracious eternity of the instant. Do you know what else the human being alone can do? Laugh and cry. And get drunk. On brandy, wine, philosophy and women and hope and despair. Do you know what he too alone knows? That he must die. As antitoxin he was given imagination. The stone is real. The plant too. The animal as well. They are fitted for their purpose. They don't know they have to die. Man knows it. Ascend, soul. Fly. Don't sob, you legal murderer. Haven't we just sung the song of songs of mankind? Moros uh, shook the grey palm so that its dust flew up. Brave symbol of a touching southern hope, dream plant of a French landlady, farewell. And you too, man without a home, creeping plant without ground, pickpocket of death, farewell. Be proud that you are a romantic. He grinned at Ravik. Ravik did not return the grin. He looked at the door. It was opening. The night concierge came in. He approached their table. The telephone, Ravik thought. Finally. After all. He did not get up. He waited. He felt his arms tightening. Your cigarettes, Mr. Morosau, the concierge said. The boy has just brought them. Thanks. Morosau put the box with the Russian cigarettes into his pocket. So long, Ravik. Will I see you later? Maybe. So long, Boris. Dash. The man without a stomach stared at Ravik. He felt sick but could not vomit. He no longer had anything to vomit with. He was like a man without legs whose feet ached. He was very restless. Ravik gave him an injection. This man had little chance of staying alive. His heart was not too good and one of his lungs was full of healed up caverns. During his thirty-five years of life he had not had much health for years a stomach ulcer, an arrested tuberculosis, and now a carcinoma. His hospital report showed that he had been married for four years, his wife had died in childbed, the child died three years later of tuberculosis. No relatives. Now he was lying here and staring at him and he did not want to die and was patient and brave and did not know that he would have to be fed through the colon and that he could no longer enjoy one of the few pleasures of his existence, pickles and boiled beef. There he lay, smelling and cut to pieces, and he possessed something that made his eyes move and that was called a soul. Be proud that you are a romantic. The Song of Songs of Mankind Ravik hung up the tablet with the fever chart and the pulse. The nurse rose and waited. Lying beside her on the chair she had a red sweat so which she had started to knit. The knitting needles were stuck in it and the yarn was lying on the floor. The thin thread of wool which hung down was like a thin thread of blood, as if the sweater were bleeding. That man is lying there, Ravik thought, and even with the injection he will go through a terrible night with pain, immobility shortness of breath, and nightmares, and I am waiting for a woman and I think it will be a difficult night for me if she doesn't come. I know how ridiculous it is in comparison with this dying man, in comparison with Boston Perrier in the next room, whose arm was crushed, in comparison with thousands of others, 
in comparison with all that is happening tonight in the world, and nevertheless it does not help. It doesn't help, it is of no avail, it does not change anything, it remains the same. What had Mrosau said? Why don't you have a stomach ache? Yes, why not? Call me in case anything happens, he said to the nurse. It was the same one who had received the record player from Kate Higstroem. The gentleman is very resigned, she said. What is he? Ravik asked, astonished. Very resigned. A good patient. Ravik looked around. There was nothing the nurse could expect as a present. Very resigned. What expressions nurses used at times. This poor devil was fighting with all the armies of his blood corpuscles and his nerve cells against death, he was not a bit resigned. He went back to the hotel. He met Goldberg in front of the door. An old man with a grey beard and a thick gold watch chain across his vest. Nice evening, Goldberg said. Yes. Ravik thought of the woman in Wiesenhoff's room. Don't you want to go for a walk? He asked. I have to the Concord and back. To the Concord. There stood the American embassy, white under the stars, silent and empty, a Noah's Ark in which there were stamps for visas, unattainable. Goldberg had stood before it, outside by the Krillin, and had stared at the entrance and the dark windows as if at a Rembrandt or the Kino or Diamond. Don't you want to walk around a bit more? We could go to the Ark and back. Ravik said and thought, if I save those two up there, then Joan will be in my room. Or she will come in meanwhile. Goldberg shook his head. I must go upstairs. I'm sure my wife is waiting for me. I've been away for more than two hours. Ravik looked at his watch. It was almost half past twelve. There was no need to save anybody. Mrs. Goldberg would have been back in her room some time ago. He watched Goldberg slowly climbing up the stairs. Then he went to the concierge. Has anyone called me up? No. His room was brightly lit. He remembered leaving it that way. The bed gleamed as if snow had surprisingly fallen. He took the slip he had put on the table before he had left and on which he had written that he would be back in half an hour, and tore it to pieces. He looked for something to drink. There was nothing. He went downstairs again. The concierge had no Calvados. He only had cognac. Ravik took with him a bottle of Hennessy and a bottle of Uva. He talked to the concierge for some time and the latter proved to him that Lulu too would have the best chance in the next race for two-year-olds at St. Cloud. The Spaniard Alvarez passed by. Ravik noticed that he still limped a bit. He bought a newspaper and went back to his room. How long such an evening could be? Who does not believe in miracles where love is concerned is lost, the lawyer Renson had said in Berlin in 1933. Two weeks later he was sent to a concentration camp because his beloved had denounced him. Ravik opened the bottle of Vuva and got a volume of Plato from the table. A few minutes later he put it aside and sat down by the window. He stared at the telephone. That damned, black instrument. He could not call up Joan. He did not know her new number. He did not even know where she was living. He had not asked her and she had told him nothing. Probably she had purposely not said anything. So she would still have an excuse. He drank a glass of the light wine. Foolish, he thought. I am waiting for a woman who was here this very morning. For three and a half months I didn't see her and I did not miss her as much as now when she has been away for a day. It would have been simpler if I had never seen her again. I was adjusted to it. Now. He rose. It wasn't that either. It was the uncertainty that fed on him. It was mistrust that had stolen into him increasingly hour by hour. He went to the door. He knew that it was not locked, but he made sure of it once more. He began to read the paper, but he read it as if through a veil. Disturbances in Poland. The inevitable clash. The claim to the corridor, the Treaty of England and France with Poland. The approaching war. He let the paper drop and turned off the light. 
He lay in the dark and waited. He could not sleep. He switched the light on again. The bottle of Hennessy stood on the table. He did not open it. He got up and again sat down by the window. The night was cool and high and starlit. A few cats screeched in the yards. A man in shorts stood on the balcony opposite and scratched himself. He yawned aloud and retired to his lighted room. Ravik looked at the bed. He knew he would not be able to sleep. There was no point in reading either. He hardly remembered what he had read before. To leave, that would be best. But where to go? It made no difference. He did not want to leave either. He wanted to know something. Damn it, he held a bottle of cognac in his hand and put it back. Then he looked in his pocket for a few sleeping tablets. The same kind he had given the red-headed Finkenstein. He was sleeping now. Ravik swallowed them. It was doubtful whether he himself would sleep. He took one more. If Joan came he would wake up. She did not come. Nor did she come next night. 21. Eugenie came into the room in which the man without a stomach was lying. Telephone, Mr. Avic. Who is it? I don't know. I didn't ask. The switchboard girl told me outside. Ravik did not at once recognize Joan's voice. It sounded blurred and very far away. Joan, he said, where are you? It sounded as if she were away from Paris. He almost expected her to mention some place on the Riviera. She had never called him at the hospital before. I am in my apartment, she said. Here in Paris? Of course. Where else? Are you sick? No. Why? Because you called me at the hospital. I call your hotel. You had left. That's why I called the hospital. Is something wrong? No. What should be wrong? I wanted to know how you are. Her voice was clearer now. Ravik got out a cigarette and a book of matches. He squeezed the upper part beneath his elbow, tore off a match, and lighted it. It's the hospital, Joan, he said. One always expects to hear of accidents and sickness here. I'm not sick. I'm in bed. But I'm not sick. Fine. Ravik pushed the matches back and forth on the white oilcloth of the table. He was waiting for what would come next. Joan too was waiting. He heard her breathe. She wanted him to start. That would make it easier for her. Joan, he said, I can't stay at the phone long now. I left someone with an open bandage and I must go back. She was silent for a moment. Why haven't I heard from you? She said then. You couldn't hear from me because I haven't your telephone number, nor do I know where you are living now. But I told you. No, Joan. But I did. I told you. She was on safe ground now. Certainly, I know. You must have forgotten. All right. I forgot. Tell me once more. I have a pencil. She gave him her address and telephone number. I'm sure I told you, Ravik, quite sure. All right, Joan. I must go back now. Will you have dinner with me tonight? She was silent for a moment. Why don't you come to see me? She said. All right. I can do that too. Tonight. At eight? Why don't you come now? Now I have to work. For how long? About an hour more. Come then. You have no time in the evening, he thought and asked, why not tonight? But Travik, she said, sometimes you don't know the simplest things. Because I would like you to come now. I don't want to wait until tonight. Otherwise why would I call up the hospital at this time of day? All right. I'll come as soon as I am through here. He reflectively folded up the slip of paper and went back. It was a building at the corner of the Rue Pascal. Joan lived on the top floor. She opened the door. Come, she said. It's good to have you here. Coming. She wore a simple black dressing gown that was cut like a man's. One of the traits that Travik liked in her was that she never wore fluffy tulle or silk dresses. 
Her face was paler than usual and slightly agitated. Come, she said. I've been waiting for you. You shall see how I live. She walked ahead of him. Ravik smiled. She was smart. She took care of all questions in advance. He looked at her beautiful straight shoulders. The light fell on her hair. For a breathless instant, he loved her very much. She led him into a large room. It was a studio now filled with the light of mid-afternoon. A high, wide window opened onto the gardens between the Avenue Raphael and the Avenue Proudhon. To the right one could look up to the Porte de la Muette. Behind it, gold and green, shimmered a part of the boys. The room was furnished in semi-modern taste. A large couch with a cover that was too blue, a few chairs which looked more comfortable than they were, tables which were too low, a rubber plant, an American Victrola, and one of Joan's suitcases in the corner. There was nothing disquieting, but in spite of that Travick did not think much of it. Either very good or completely bad, halfway things meant nothing to him. And he could not stand rubber plants. He noticed that Joan was watching him. She was not quite sure of how he would take it, but she had been sure enough to risk it. Nice, he said, large and nice. He lifted the Victrola top. It was a trunk-shaped apparatus with an automatic record changer. A great many records were lying on a table beside it. Joan took some of them and put them on. Do you know how it works? He knew. No, he said. She turned a knob. It's wonderful. It plays for hours. One doesn't have to get up to change the records or to turn anything. One can lie there and listen and watch it getting darker outside and dream. The Victrola was excellent. Ravik recognized the make and knew it had cost about 20,000 francs. It filled the room with soft airy music, with the sentimental songs of Paris. Jat and dry. Joan leaned forward and listened. Do you like it? She asked. Ravik nodded. He was not looking at the Victrola. He was looking at Joan. He was looking at her face, which was enchanted and absorbed in the music. How easy that was with her, and how he had loved her for this easiness which he did not possess. Finished, he thought, without pain, with the feeling of someone who leaves Italy to return to the foggy north. She straightened up, and smiled. Come, you have not yet seen the bedroom. Do I have to see it? She looked at him searchingly for a second. Don't you want to see it? Why not? Yes, why not? He said. Of course. She touched his face and kissed him, and he knew why. Come, she said and took his arm. The bedroom was furnished in the French manner. A large imitation antique bed in Louis XVI style, a kidney-shaped dressing table of the same sort, an imitation baroque mirror, a modern orbusen rug, stools, chairs, all in the style of a second-rate movie set. Among them a very fine painted Florentine chest of the 16th century which did not fit in at all and gave the impression of a princess among the nouveau riches. It had been carelessly pushed into a corner. A hat with violets and a pair of silver shoes lay on its precious cover. The bed was open and not made. Ravik could see where Joan had been lying. A number of perfume bottles were standing on the dresser. One of the closets was opened. There were a great many dresses hanging inside. More than she had had before. Joan had not let go of Ravik's arm. She leaned against him. Do you like it? Fine. It suits you very well. She nodded. He could feel her arm and her breast and without thinking he drew her closer. She let it happen and yielded. Her shoulder touched his shoulder. Her face was calm now, there was nothing left in it of the slight agitation it had showed at the beginning. It was sure and clear and it seemed to Ravik as if there were more than suppressed satisfaction in it, an almost invisible, very remote shadow of triumph. Strange that baseness is most becoming to them, he thought. She wants to turn me into a sort of second-rate gigolo and with naive shamelessness she even shows me the place her lover has furnished for her, and at the same time she looks just like the Nike of Samothrace. 
It's a pity you can't have something like this, she said. An apartment. One feels quite different. Different than when one is in those dreary hotel rooms. You are right. It was nice to have had a look at all this. I'll go now, Joan. Go? Already? But you've just come. He took her hands. I'll go, Joan. For good. You are living with somebody else. And I don't share women I love with other men. She tore her hands away from him. What? What are you saying? I, who told you this? What a story, she stared at him. I can imagine Morosau of course, that. Not Morosau? No one had to tell me anything. It speaks for itself. Her face was suddenly pale with rage. She had been so sure, and now it had come. I know. Because I have this apartment and don't work at the Scheherazade any longer. Naturally there must be someone keeping me. Naturally. It couldn't be otherwise. I didn't say that someone was keeping you. It's the same thing. I understand. First you get me into that miserable nightclub, then you leave me alone, and then when someone talks to me or cares about me, then it's immediately certain that someone is keeping me. That sort of doorman has nothing but his dirty imagination. That a person can be somebody in work and make something of herself doesn't penetrate his tip-taking soul. And you, you of all people, believe it. You should be ashamed of yourself. Ravik turned around, grabbed her by the arm, lifted her and threw her over the footboard onto the bed. There, he said, and now stop your nonsense. She was so surprised that she remained where she was. Aren't you going to beat me too? She asked then. No. I just wanted to stop that babbling. It wouldn't surprise me, she said in a low and constrained voice. It wouldn't surprise me. She lay there silently. Her face was empty and white, her mouth was pale, her eyes had a lifeless glitter like glass. Her breast was half exposed and one naked leg hung over the edge of the bed.